story twenty of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty a boarding-house romance i keep a boarding-house if any fair proportion of my readers were likely to be members of my own profession i should expect the above announcement to call forth more sympathetic handkerchiefs than have waved in unison for many a day but i don't expect anything of the sort i know my business too well to suppose for a moment that any boarding-house proprietor no matter how full her rooms or how good pay her boarders are ever finds time to read a story even if they did they'd be so lost in wonder at one of themselves finding time to write a story that they'd forget the whole plot and point of the thing i can't help it though i must tell about poor dear mrs perry even if i run the risk of cook's overdoing the beef so that mr bluff who is english and the best of pay can't get the rare cut he loves so well mrs perry's story has run in my head so long that it has made me forget to take change from the grocer at least once to my knowledge and even made me lose a good boarder by showing a room before the bed was made up they say that poets get things out of their heads by writing them down and i don't know why boarding-house keepers can't do the same thing it's about three months since mrs perry came here to board i'm very sure about the time and it was the day i was to pay my quarter's rent and to-morrow will be quarter day again thank the lord i've got the money ready i didn't have the money ready then though and the landlord left his temper behind him instead of a receipt and i was just having a little cry in my apron and asking the lord why it was that a poor lone woman who was working her finger ends off should have such a hard time when the doorbell rang that's the landlord again i know his ways the mean wretch said i to myself hastily rubbing my eyes dry and making up before the mirror in the hat tree as fierce a face as i could then i snatched open the door and tried to make believe my heart wasn't in my mouth but the landlord wasn't there and i've always been a little sorry for i was looking so savage that a wee little woman who was at the door trembled all over and started to go down the steps don't go ma'am i said very quickly with the best smile i could put on and i think i've been long enough in the business to give the right kind of a smile to a person that looks like a new boarder don't go i thought it was i thought it was uh, somebody else that rang come in do she looked as if i was doing her a great honour and i thought that looked like poor pay but i was too glad at not having the landlord just then to care if i did lose one week's board besides she didn't look as if she could eat much i see you advertise a small bedroom to let said she looking appealing like as if she was going to beat me down on the strength of being poor how much is it a week eight dollars said i rather shortly seven dollars was all i expected to get but i put on one so as to be beaten down without losing anything i can get eight from a single gentleman the only objection being that he wants to keep a dog in the back yard oh i'll pay it said she quickly taking out her pocket-book i'll take it for six weeks anyhow i never felt so ashamed of myself in my life i made up my mind to read a penitential passage of scripture as soon as i closed the bargain with her but remembering the book says to be reconciled to your brother before laying your gift on the altar i says quick as i could for fear that if i thought over it again i couldn't be honest you shall have it for seven my dear madam if you're going to stay so long and i'll do your washing without extra charge this last i said to punish myself for suspecting an innocent little lady oh thank you thank you very much said she and then she began to cry i knew that wasn't for effect for we were already agreed on terms and she had her pocket book open showing more money than i ever have at a time unless it's rent day she tried to stop crying by burying her face in her hands and it made her look so much smaller and so pitiful that i picked her right up as if she was a baby and kissed her then she cried harder and i a woman over forty too couldn't find anything better to do than to cry with her i knew her whole story within five minutes knew it perfectly well before i'd fairly shown her the room and got it aired 
they were from the west and had been married about a year she hadn't a relative in the world but his folks had friends in philadelphia so he'd got a place as clerk in a big clothing factory at twelve hundred dollars a year they'd been keeping house just as cosy as could be in four rooms and were as happy as anybody in the world when one night he didn't come home she was almost frantic about him all night long and first thing in the morning she was at the factory she waited until all the clerks got there but george his name was george perry didn't come the proprietor was a good-hearted man and went with her to the police office and they telegraphed all over the city but there didn't seem to be any such man found dead or drunk or arrested for anything she hadn't heard a word from him since her husband's family's friends were rich the stuck-up brutes but they seemed to be annoyed by her coming so often to ask if there wasn't any other way of looking for him so she like the modest frightened little thing she was stayed away from them then somebody told her that new york was the place everybody went to so she sold all her furniture and pawned almost all her clothes and came to new york with about fifty dollars in her pocket what i'll do when that's gone i don't know said she commencing to cry again unless i find george i won't live on you though ma'am she said lifting her face up quickly out of her handkerchief i won't indeed i'll go to the poorhouse first but and then she cried worse than before and i cried too and took her in my arms and called her a poor little thing and told her she shouldn't go to any poorhouse but should stay with me and be my daughter i don't know how i came to say it for goodness knows i find it hard enough to keep out of the poorhouse myself but i did say it and i meant it too her things were all in a little valise and she soon had the room to rights and when i went up again in a few minutes to carry her a cup of tea she pointed to her husband's picture which she had hung on the wall and asked me if i didn't think he was very handsome i said yes but i'm glad she looked at the tea instead of me for i believe she'd seen by my face that i didn't like her george the fact is men look very differently to their wives or sweethearts than they do to older people and to boarding-house keepers there was nothing vicious about george perry's face but if he'd been a boarder of mine i'd have insisted on my board promptly not for fear of his trying to cheat me but because if he saw anything else he wanted he'd spend his money without thinking of what he owed i felt so certain that he'd got into some mischief or trouble and was afraid or ashamed to come back to his wife that i risked the price of three ribs of prime roasting beef in the following personal advertisement george p your wife don't know anything about it and is dying to see you answer through personals but no answer came and his wife grew more and more poorly and i couldn't help seeing what was the matter with her then her money ran out and she talked of going away but i wouldn't hear of it i just took her to my own room which was the back parlor and told her she wasn't to think again of going away that she was to be my daughter and i would be her mother until she found george again i was afraid for her sake that it meant we were to be with each other forever for there was no sign of george she wrote to his family in the west but they hadn't heard anything from him or about him and they took pains not to invite her there or even to say anything about giving her a helping hand there was only one thing left to do and that was to pray and pray i did more constantly and earnestly than i ever did before although the good lord knows there have been times about quarter day when i haven't kept much peace before the throne finally one day mrs perry was taken unusually bad and the doctor had to be sent for in a hurry we were in her room the doctor and mrs perry and i i was endeavouring to comfort and strengthen the poor thing when the servant knocked and said a lady and gentleman had come to look at rooms i didn't dare to lose boarders for i'd had three empty rooms for a month so i hurried into the parlour i was almost knocked down for a second for the gentleman was george perry and no mistake if the picture his wife had was to be trusted in a second more i was cooler and clear-headed than i ever was in my life before i felt more like an angel of the lord than a boarding-house keeper kate said i to the servant show the lady all the rooms 
kate stared for i'd never trusted her or any other girl with such important work and she knew it she went though followed by the lady who though she seemed a weak silly sort of thing i hated with all my might then i turned quickly and said don't you want a room for your wife too george perry he stared at me a moment and then turned pale and looked confused then he tried to rally himself and he said you seem to know me ma'am yes said i and i know mrs perry too and if ever a woman needed her husband she does now even if her husband is a rascal he tried to be angry but he couldn't he walked up and down the room once or twice his face twitching all the time and then he said a word or two at a time i wish i could poor girl oh for god forgive me what can i do i wish i was dead you wouldn't be any use to anybody then but the evil one george perry and you're not ready to see him just yet said i just then there came a low long groan from the back room and at the same time someone came into the parlor i was too excited to notice who it was and george perry when he heard the groan stopped short and exclaimed good god who's that your wife said i almost ready to scream i was so wrought up he hid his face in his hands and trembled all over there was half a minute's silence it seemed half an hour and then we heard a long thin wail from a voice that hadn't ever been heard on earth before what's that said perry in a hoarse whisper his eyes starting out of his head and hands thrown up your baby just born said i will you take rooms for your family now george perry i asked i shan't stand in the way said a voice behind me i turned around quickly just in time to see with her eyes full of tears the woman who had come with george go out the door and shut the hall door behind her thank god said george dropping on his knees amen said i hurrying out of the parlor and locking the door behind me i thought if he wanted to pray while on his knees he shouldn't be disturbed while if he should suddenly be tempted to follow his late companion i shouldn't be held at the judgment day for any share of the guilt i found the doctor bustling about getting ready to go and mrs perry looking very peaceful and happy with a little bundle hugged up close to her i guess the lord will bring him now said mrs perry if it's only to see his little boy like enough my dear said i thanking the lord for opening the question for my wits were all gone by this time and i hadn't any more idea of what to do than the man in the moon but said i he won't bring him till you're well and able to bear the excitement oh i could bear it any time now said she very calmly it would seem just as natural as would be to have him come in and kiss me and see his baby and bless it would it i asked with my heart all in a dance well trust the lord to do just what's right i hurried out and opened the parlor door there stood george perry changed so i hardly knew him he seemed years older his thick lips seemed to have suddenly grown thin and were pressed tightly together and there was such an appealing look from his eyes be very careful now i whispered you may see them she expects you and don't imagine anything has gone wrong i took him into the room and she looked up with a face like that i hope the angels have i didn't see anything more for my eyes filled up all of a sudden so i hurried upstairs to an empty room and spent half an hour crying and thanking the lord there was a pretty to-do at the dinner-table that day i'd intended to have souffle for dessert and i always make my own souffles but i forgot everything but the perrys and the boarders grumbled awfully i didn't care though i was too happy to feel abused i don't know how george perry explained his absence to his wife perhaps he hasn't done it at all but i know she seems to be the happiest woman alive and that he don't seem to care for anything in the world but his wife and baby as to the woman who came with him to look at a room i haven't seen her since but if she happens to read this story she may have the consolation of knowing that there's an old woman who remembers her one good deed and prays for her often and earnestly end of story twenty
story twenty one of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty one retiring from business what the colonel's business was nobody knew nor did any one care particularly he purchased for cash only and he never grumbled at the price of anything that he wanted who could ask for more than that curious people occasionally wondered how when it had been fully two years since the colonel with every one else abandoned duck creek to the chinese he managed to spend money freely and to lose considerable at cards and horse races in fact the keeper of that one of the two challenge hill saloons which the colonel did not patronize was once heard to absent-mindedly wonder whether the colonel hadn't a money mill somewhere where he turned out double eagles and slugs the coast name for fifty dollar gold pieces when so important a personage as a barkeeper indulged publicly in an idea the inhabitants of challenge hill like good californians everywhere considered themselves in duty bound to give it grave consideration so for a few days certain industrious professional gentlemen who won money of the colonel carefully weighed some of the brightest pieces and tested them with acids and tasted them and sawed them in two and retried them and melted them up and had the lumps assayed the result was a complete vindication of the colonel and a loss of considerable custom to the indiscreet barkeeper the colonel was as good-natured a man as had ever been known at challenge hill but being mortal the colonel had his occasional times of despondency and one of them occurred after a series of races in which he had staked his all on his own bay mare tipsy and had lost looking reproachfully at his beloved animal failed to heal the aching void of his pockets and drinking deeply swearing eloquently and glaring defiantly at all mankind were equally unproductive of coin the boys at the saloon sympathized most feelingly with the colonel they were unceasing in their invitations to drink and they even exhibited considerable christian forbearance when the colonel savagely dissented with every one who advanced any proposition no matter how incontrovertible but unappreciated sympathy grows decidedly tiresome to the giver and it is with a feeling of relief that the boys saw the colonel stride out of the saloon mount tipsy and gallop furiously away riding on horseback has always been considered an excellent sort of exercise and fast riding is generally admitted to be one of the most healthful and delightful means of exhilaration in the world but when a man is so absorbed in his exercise that he will not stop to speak to a friend and when his exhilaration is so complete that he turns his eyes from well-meaning thumbs pointing significantly into doorways through which a man has often passed while seeking bracing influences it is but natural that people should express some wonder the colonel was well known at toddy flat lone hand blazers murders bar and several other villages through which he passed and as no one had been seen to precede him betting men were soon offering odds that the colonel was running away from somebody strictly speaking they were wrong but they won all the money that had been staked against them for within half an hour's time there passed over the same road an anxious-looking individual who reined up in front of the principal saloon of each place and asked if the colonel had passed had the gallant colonel known that he was followed and by whom there would have been an extra election held at the latter place very shortly after for the colonel's pursuer was no other than the constable of challenge hill and for constables and all other officers of the law the colonel possessed hatred of unspeakable intensity on galloped the colonel following the stage road which threaded the old mining camps on duck creek but suddenly he turned abruptly out of the road and urged his horse through the young pines and bushes which grew thickly by the road while the constable galloped rapidly on to the next camp 
there seemed to be no path through the thicket into which the colonel had turned but tipsy walked between trees and bushes as if they were but the familiar objects of her own stable-yard suddenly a voice from the bushes shouted what's up business that's what replied the colonel it's time replied the voice and its owner a bearded six-footer emerged from the bushes and stroked tipsy's nose with the freedom of an old acquaintance we ain't had a nip since last night and there ain't a cracker or a handful of flour in the shanty the old gal go back on yer yes replied the colonel ruefully lost every blasted race twasn't her fault bless her she done her level best everybody to home you bet said the man and bein a prayin for yer to turn up with the rock and something with more colour than spring water come on the man led the way and tipsy and the colonel followed and the trio suddenly found themselves before a small log hut in front of which sat three solemn disconsolate-looking individuals who looked appealingly at the colonel mack'll tell you how twas fellers said the colonel meekly while i picket the mare the colonel was absent but a few moments but when he returned each of the four men was attired in pistols and knives while mac was distributing some dominoes made from a rather dirty flour bag tain't so late as all that is it inquired the colonel better be an hour ahead than miss it this ere night said one of the four i ain't been so thirsty since i come round the horn in fifty and we'll run short of water somebody'll get hurt if there's no bitters on the old concern they will or my name ain't perkins don't count your chickies before they're hatched perky said one of the party and he adjusted his domino under the rim of his hat supposing there should be too many for us stiddy cranks remonstrated the colonel nobody ever gets along if they allow themselves to be skeered fact chimed in the smallest and thinnest man of the party the bible says something mighty hot about that i disremember exactly how it goes but i've heerd parson buzzy down in maine preach a rippin old sermon from the text many a time the old man never thought what a comfort them sermons was a-goin to be to a road agent though that time we stopped slim mike's stage and he didn't have no more manners than to draw on me them sermons was a perfect blessin to me the thought of em cleared my head as quickly as a cocktail and i don't want to disturb log roller's pious yarn interrupted the colonel but as it's old black that's drivin to-day instead of slim mike and as old black allers makes his time hadn't we better vamoose the door of the shanty was hastily closed and the men filed through the thicket until near the road when they marched rapidly on parallel lines with it after about half an hour perkins who was leading halted and wiped his perspiring brow with his shirt sleeve far enough from home now said he tain't no use being a gentleman if you have to work too hard safe enough i reckon replied the colonel we'll do the usual i'll halt em log roller attend to the driver cranks takes the boot and mark and perk takes right and left and i know it's tough but considerin how everlastin eternally hard up we are i reckon we'll have to ask contributions from the ladies too if there's any aboard eh boy reckon so replied log roller with a chuckle that seemed to inspire even his black domino with a merry twinkle or two what's the use of women's rights if they don't ever have a chance of exercising them having their purses borrowed had showed them the whole doctrine in a brand new light they're treacherous critters women is remarked cranks some of em might put a knife into a feller while he was apologizing even you're afeard of em said perkins you can go back and clean up the shanty reminds me of what the bible says said log roller there's a lion on the trail i'll be chawed up says the lazy galoot or words to that effect come come boys interposed the colonel don't mix religion and business they don't mix no more than hello there's the crack of old black's whip pick your bushes quick i'll jump when i whistle each man secreted himself near the roadside the stage came swinging along handsomely the inside passengers were laughing heartily about something and old black was just given a delicate touch to the flank of the off leader when the colonel gave a shrill quick whistle and the five men sprang into the road the horses stopped as suddenly as if it was a matter of common occurrence old black dropped his reins crossed his legs and stared into the sky 
and the passengers all put out their heads with a rapidity equalled only by that with which they withdrew them as they saw the dominoes and revolvers of the road agents seems to be something the matter gentlemen said the colonel blandly as he opened the door won't you please get out don't trouble yourselves to draw cos my friend here's got his weapon cocked and his finger is rather nervous ain't got a handkerchief have you asked the colonel of the first passenger who descended from the stage have well now that's lucky just put your hands behind you please so that's it and the unfortunate man was securely bound in an instant the remaining passengers were treated with similar courtesy and then the colonel and his friends examined the pockets of the captives old black remained unmolested for whoever heard of a stage driver having money boys said the colonel calling his brother agents aside and comparing receipts tain't much of a haul but there's only one woman and she's old enough to be a feller's grandmother better let her alone huh like enough she'll pan out more'n all the rest of the stage put together growled cranks carefully testing the thickness of case of a gold watch just like the low live deceitfulness of some folks to hire an old woman to carry their money so it go safe maybe what she's got on ain't nothing to some folks that's got hosses that can win em money at races but the colonel abruptly ended the conversation and approached the stage the colonel was very chivalrous but crank's sarcastic reference to tipsy needed avenging and as he could not consistently with business arrangements put an end to crank's the old lady would have to suffer i beg your parding ma'am said the colonel raising his hat politely with one hand while he reopened the coach door with the other but we're a-takin up a collection for some very deservin object we was a-goin to make the gentlemen fork over the whole amount but as they ain't got enough we'll have to bother you the old lady trembled and felt for her pocket-book and raised her veil the colonel looked into her face slammed the stage door and sitting down on the hub of one of the wheels stared vacantly into space nothin queried perkins in a whisper and with a face full of genuine sympathy no yes said the colonel dreamily that is untie em and let the stage go ahead he continued springing to his feet i'll hurry back to the cabin and the colonel dashed into the bushes and left his followers so paralyzed with astonishment that old black afterward remarked that if there had been anybody to hold the hosses he would have cleaned out the whole crowd with his whip the passengers now relieved of their weapons were unbound and allowed to re-enter the stage and the door was slammed upon which old black picked up his reins as coolly as if he had merely laid them down at the station while horses were being changed then he cracked his whip and the stage rolled off while the colonel's party hastened back to their hut fondly inspecting as they went certain flasks they had obtained while transacting their business with the occupants of the stage great was the surprise of the road agents as they entered their hut for there stood the colonel in a clean white shirt and in a suit of clothing made up from the limited spare wardrobes of the other members of the gang but the suspicious cranks speedily subordinated his wonder to his prudence as he laying on the table a watch two pistols a pocket-book and a heavy purse he exclaimed come colonel business before pleasure let's divide and scatter if anybody should hear about it and find our trail and catch us with the traps in our possession they might divide yourselves said the colonel with abruptness and a great oath i don't want none of it colonel said perkins removing his own domino and looking anxiously into the leader's face be you sick here's some bully brandy i found in one of the passengers pockets i hain't nothin replied the colonel i'm a-goin and i'm a-retirin from this business forever ain't a-goin to turn evidence cried hanks grasping the pistol on the table i'm a-goin to make a lead mine o you if you don't take that back roared the colonel with a bound which caused cranks to drop his pistol and retire precipitately backward apologizing as he went i'm goin to tend to my own business and that's enough to keep any man busy somebody lend me fifty till i see him again perkins pressed the money into the colonel's hand and within two minutes the colonel was on tipsy's back and galloping on in the direction the stage had taken he overtook it he passed it and still he galloped on 
the people at mud gulch knew the colonel well and made it a rule never to be astonished at anything he did but they made an exception to the rule when the colonel canvassed the principal bar-rooms for men who wished to purchase a horse and when a gambler who was flush obtained tipsy in exchange for twenty slugs only a thousand dollars when the colonel had always said that there wasn't gold enough on top of the ground to buy her mud gulch experienced a decided sensation one or two enterprising persons speedily discovered that the colonel was not in a communicative mood so every one retired to his favorite saloon and bet according to his own opinion of the colonel's motives and actions but when the colonel after remaining in a barber shop for half an hour emerged with his face clean-shaven and his hair neatly trimmed and parted betting was so wild that a cool-headed sporting man speedily made a fortune by betting against every theory that was advanced then the colonel made a tour of the stores and fitted himself to a new suit of clothes carefully eschewing all the generous patterns and pronounced colors so dear to the average miner he bought a new hat put on a pair of boots and pruned his finger-nails and stranger than all he mildly but firmly declined all invitations to drink as the colonel stood in the door of the principal saloon where the stage always stopped the challenge hill constable was seen to approach the colonel and tap him on the shoulder upon which all men who had bet that the colonel was dodging somebody claimed the stakes but those who stood near the colonel heard the constable say colonel i take it all back and i own up fair and square when i seed you get out of challenge hill it come to me all of a sudden that you might be in the road agent business so i followed you duty you know but after i seed you sell tipsy i knowed i was on the wrong trail i wouldn't suspect you now if all the stages in the state was robbed and i'll give you satisfaction any way you want it it's all right said the colonel with a smile the constable afterward said that nobody had any idea of how curiously the colonel smiled when his beard was off give this fifty to jim perkins first time you see him i'm leaving the state suddenly the stage pulled up at the door with a crash and the male passengers hurried into the saloon in a state of utter indignation and impecuniosity the story of the robbery attracted everybody and during the excitement the colonel slipped quietly out and opened the door of the stage the old lady started and cried george and the colonel jumping into the stage and putting his arms tenderly about the trembling form of the old lady exclaimed mother end of story twenty one Story twenty two of Romance of California Life by John Haverton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story twenty two The Hard Hack Mistake. Excitement? The venerable Deacon Twinkum, the oldest inhabitant, said there had not been such an excitement at Hard Hack since the meeting house steeple blew down in a terrible equinoctial forty seven years before. And who could wonder? even a larger town than hardhack would have experienced unusual agitation at seeing one of its own boys who had a few years before gone away poor slender and twenty come back with broad shoulders a full beard and a pocketful of money dug out of the ugly hills of nevada but even the return of nathan brown in so unusual a condition for a hard hackian to be found in was not the fullness of hard hack's excitement for nathan had brought with him tom croon and harry faxton two friends he had made during his absence and both of them broad-shouldered full-bearded and auriferous as nathan himself no wonder the store at hard hack was all the while crowded with those who knew all about nathan or wanted to no wonder that seen em was the passing form of salutation for days the news spread like wildfire and industrious farmers deliberately took a day drove to town and stood patiently on the doorsteps of the store until they had seen one or more of the wonderful men 
the good deacon tweakum himself who had at a late prayer meeting stated that his feet already felt the splashing of jordan's waves temporarily withdrew his aged limbs from the rugged banks famed in song and caused them to bear him industriously up and down the ridge road past nathan's mother's house until he saw all three of the bearded croesuses seat themselves on the piazza to smoke then he departed his good face affording an excellent study for a simeon in the temple even the peaceful influences of the sabbath were unable to restore tranquillity to hardhack on sunday morning the meeting-house was fuller than it had been since the funeral service of the last pastor at each squeak of the door every head was quickly turned and when in the middle of the first hymn the three ex-miners filed decorously in the staring organist held one chord of wyndham so long that the breath of the congregation was entirely exhausted the very pulpit itself succumbed to the popular excitement and the rev abegnego choker after reading of the treasures of solomon's temple and of the glories of the new testament for the first and second lessons preached from isaiah forty six six they lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance but all this excitement was as nothing compared with the tumult which agitated the tender hearts of the maidens at hardhack young old handsome plain smart and stupid until now few of them had dared to hope for a change of name for while they possessed as many mental and personal charms as girls in general all the enterprising boys of hardhack had departed from their birthplace in search of the lucre which hardhack's barren hills and lean meadows failed to supply and the cause of their going was equally a preventive of the coming of others to fill their places but now oh hope here were three young men good-looking rich and if the other two were fit companions for the well-born and bred nathan all safe custodians for tender hearts few girls were there in hardhack who did not determine in their innermost hearts to strive as hard as yankee wit and maiden modesty would allow for one of those tempting prizes nor were they unaided rich and respectable sons-in-law were scarce enough the world over so it was no wonder that all the parents of marriageable daughters strove to make hardhack pleasant for the young men fathers read up on nevada and cultivated the three ex miners mothers ransacked cook-books and old trunks ladies companions were industriously searched for pleasing patterns crimping irons and curling tongs were extemporized and the demand for ribbons and trimmings became so great that the storekeeper hurried to the city for a fresh supply then began that season of mad hilarity and reckless dissipation which seemed almost a dream to the actors themselves and to which patriotic hardhackians have since referred to with feelings like those of the devout jew as he recalls the glorious deeds of his forefathers or of the modern roman as from the crumbling arches of the Colosseum, he conjures up the mighty shade of the caesarean period the fragrant bohea flowed as freely as champagne would have done in a less pious locality ethereal sponge-cakes and transparent currant jellies became too common to excite comment the surrounding country was heavily drawn upon for fatted calves chickens and turkeys and mince pies were so plenty that observing children wondered if the governor had not decreed a whole year of special thanksgiving bravely the three great catches accepted every invitation and though it was a very unusual addition to his regular duties the rev abegnego choker faithfully attended all the evening festivities to the end that they might be decorously closed with prayer as had from time to time immemorial been the custom of hardhack and the causes of all these efforts on the part of hardhack society enjoyed themselves intensely 
young men of respectable inclinations who have lived for several years in a society composed principally of scoundrels and modified only by the occasional presence of an honest miner or a respectable mule driver would have considered as elysium a place far less proper and agreeable than hardhack in fact the trio was so delighted that its eligibility soon became diminished in quantity faxton at one of the first parties made an unconditional surrender to a queenly damsel while nathan having found his old school-day sweetheart still unmarried whispered something in her ear probably the secret of some rare cosmetic which filled her cheeks with roses from that time forth but croon the handsomest and most brilliant of the three still remained and over him the fight was far more intense than in the opening of the campaign when weapons were either rusty or untried and the chances of success were seemingly more numerous but to designate any particular lady as surest of success seemed impossible even nathan and faxton when besought for an opinion by the two ladies who now claimed their innermost thoughts could only say that no one but croon knew and perhaps even he didn't croon was a very odd boy they said excellent company the best of good fellows the staunchest of friends and the very soul of honour but there were some things about him they never could understand in fact he was something like that sum of all impossibilities a schoolgirl's hero but harry said the prospective mrs faxton with rather an angry pout for a church member in full communion just see what splendid girls are dying for him i'm sure there are no nicer girls anywhere than in hardhack and he needn't be so stuck up my dear interrupted faxton i say it with fear and trembling but perhaps croon don't want to be in love at all an indignant flash of doubt went over the lady's face just notice him at a party continued faxton he seems to distribute his attentions with exact equality among all the ladies present as if he were trying to discourage the idea that he was a marrying man well said the lady still indignant i think you might ask him and settle the matter excuse me my dear replied faxton i have seen others manifest an interest in croon's affairs and the result was discouraging i'd rather not try the experiment a few mornings later mrs leekins who took the place of a newspaper at hardhack was seen hurrying from house to house on her own street and such housekeepers as saw her instantly discovered that errands must be made to houses directly in mrs leekins's route mrs leekins's story was soon told croon had suddenly gone to the city first purchasing the cottage which deacon twinkham had built several years before for a son who had never come back from sea croon had hired old mrs bruff to put the cottage to rights and to arrange the carpets and furnitures which he was to forward immediately but who was to be mistress of the cottage mrs leekins was unable to tell or even to guess the clerks at the store had been thoroughly pumped but while they admitted that one young lady had purchased an unusual quantity of inserting another had ordered a dress pattern of grey empress cloth which was that year the fashionable material and colour for travelling dresses old mrs bruff had received unusual consideration and unlimited tea but even the most systematic question failed to elicit from her anything satisfactory at any rate it was certain that croon was absent from hardhack and it was certain that he had decided on who was to be the lady of the cottage so the season of festivity was brought to an abrupt close and the digestions of hardhack were snatched from ruin from kitchen windows were now wafted odours of boiled corned beef and stewed apples instead of the fragrance of delicate preserves and delicious turkey young ladies when they met in the street greeted each other with a shade less of cordiality than usual and fathers and mothers in israel cast into each other's eyes searching and suspicious glances 
one afternoon when the pious matrons of hardhack were gathering at the pastor's residence to take part in the regular weekly mother's prayer meeting the mail coach rolled into town and mrs leakins who was sitting by the window as she always did exclaimed he's come back there he is on the seat with the driver every one hurried to the window and saw that mrs leakins had spoken truly for there sat croon with a pleasant smile on his face while on top of the stage were several large trunks marked c must have got a handsome fit out suggested mrs leakins the stage stopped at the door of croon's new cottage and croon got out the pastor entered the parlor to open the meeting and was selecting a hymn when mrs leakins startled the meeting by ejaculating lands alive the meeting was demoralized the sisters hastened to the window and the good pastor laying down his hymn book followed in time to see croon helping out a well-dressed and apparently young and handsome lady hard-hat girl's not good enough for him it seems sneered mrs leakins a resigned and sympathetic sigh broke from the motherly lips present then mrs leakins cried gracious sakes married a widder with children it certainly seemed that she told the truth for croon lifted out two children the youngest of whom seemed not more than three years old the gazers abruptly left the windows and the general tone of the meeting was that of melancholy resignation why didn't he ever say he was a married man asked the prospective mrs faxton of her lover that evening partly because he is too much of a gentleman to talk of his own affairs replied faxton but principally because there had been as he told me this afternoon an unfortunate quarrel between them which drove him to the mines a few days ago he heard from her for the first time in three years and they've patched up matters and are very happy well said the lady with considerable decision hardhack will never forgive him hardhack did however for croon and his two friends drew about them a few of their old comrades who took unto themselves wives from the people about them and made of hardhack one of the pleasantest villages in the state End of story twenty two Story twenty three of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story twenty three The Carmi Chums. The Carmi Chums was the name they went by all along the river. Most other roustabouts had each a name of his own, and so had the Carmi Chums for that matter, but the men themselves were never mentioned individually, always collectively no steamboat captain who wanted only a single man ever attempted to hire half of the carmi chums at a time as easy would it have been to have hired half of the siamese twins no steamboat mate who knew them ever attempted to tell off the chums into different watches and any mate who not knowing them committed this blunder and adhered to it after explanation was made was sure to be two men short immediately after leaving the steamer's next landing there seemed no possible way of separating them they never fell out with each other in the natural course of events they never fought when drunk as other friendly roustabouts sometimes did for the carmi chums never got drunk there never sprang up any coolness between them because of love for the same lady for they did not seem to care at all for female society unless they happened to meet some old lady whom one might love as a mother rather than as a sweetheart even professional busybodies from whose presence roustabouts are no freer than church members were unable to provoke the carmi chums even to suspicion and those of them who attempted it too persistently were likely to have a difficulty with the slighter of the chums this man who was called black because of the color of his hair was apparently forty years of age and of very ordinary appearance except when an occasional furtive frightened look came into his face and attracted attention 
his companion called red because his hair was of the hue of the carrots and because it was occasionally necessary to distinguish him from his friend seemed of about the same age and degree of ordinaries as black but was rather stouter more cheery and to use the favourite roustabout simile held his head closer to the current he seemed when black was absent-minded as he generally was while off duty to be the leading spirit of the couple and to be tenderly alive to all his partner's needs but observing roustabouts noticed that when freight was being moved or wood taken on board black was always where he could keep an eye on his chum and where he could demand instant reparation from any wretch who trod upon red's toes or who with a shoulder load of wood grazed red's head or touched red with a box or barrel next to neighborly wonder as to the existence of the friendship between the chums roustabouts with whom the couple sailed concerned themselves most with the cause of the bond between them their searches after first causes were no more successful however than those of the naturalists who were endeavouring to ascertain who laid the cosmic egg they gave out that they came from carmi so once or twice when captains with whom the chums were engaged determined to seek a cargo up the wabash upon which river carmi was located inquisitive roustabouts became light-hearted but alas for the vanity of human hopes when the boat reached carmi the chums could not be found nor could any inhabitant of carmi identify them by the descriptions which were given by inquiring friends at length they became known in their collective capacity as one of the institutions of the river captains knew them as well as they knew natchez or piankshaw bend and showing them to distinguished passengers as regularly as they showed general zack taylor's plantation or the scene of the grand gulf cave where a square mile of louisiana dropped into the river one night captains rather cultivated them in fact although it was a difficult bit of business for roustabouts who wouldn't say thank you for a glass of french brandy or a genuine old-fashioned plantation cigar seemed destitute of ordinary handles of which a steamboat captain could take hold lady passengers took considerable notice of them and were more successful than any one else at drawing them into conversation the linguistic accomplishments of the chums were not numerous but it did one good to see black lose his scared furtive look when a lady addressed him and to see the affectionate deference with which he appealed to red until that worthy was drawn into the conversation when black succeeded in this latter named operation he would by insensible stages draw himself away and give himself up to enthusiastic admiration of his partner or apparently of his conversational ability the spring of eighteen sixty nine found the chums in the crew of the bennett the peerless floating palace of the mississippi as she was called by those newspapers whose reporters had the freedom of the bennett's bar and the same season saw the bennett staggering down the mississippi with so heavy a load of sacked corn that the gunwales amidships were fairly under water the river was very low so the bennett kept carefully in the channel but the channel of the great muddy ditch which drains half the union is as fickle as disappointed lovers declare women to be and it has no more respect for greater steamer loads of corn than goliath had for david a little ohio river boat bound upward had reported the sudden disappearance of a woodyard a little way above milliken's bend where the channel hugged the shore and with the woodyard there had disappeared an enormous sycamore tree which had for years served as a tying post for steamers as live sycamores are about as disinclined to float as bars of lead are the captain and the pilot of the bennett were somewhat concerned for the sake of the corn to know the exact location of the tree half a mile from the spot it became evident even to the passengers clustered forward on the cabin deck that the sycamore had remained quite near to its old home for a long rough ripple was seen directly across the line of the channel 
then arose the question as to how much water was on top of the tree and whether any bar had had time to accumulate the steamer was stopped the engines were reversed and worked by hand to keep the bennett from drifting downstream a boat was lowered and manned the chums forming part of her crew and second officer went down to take soundings while the passengers to whom even so small a cause for excitement was a godsend crowded the rail and stared the boat shot rapidly downstream headed for the shore end of the ripple she seemed almost into the boiling mud in front of her when the passengers on the steamer heard the mate in the boat shout back all the motion of the oars changed in an instant but a little too late for a heavy root of the fallen giant just covered by the water caught the little craft and caused it to careen so violently that one man was thrown into the water as she righted another man went in confound it growled the captain who was leaning out of the pilot-house window i hope they can swim still tain't as bad as it would be if we had any more cargo to take aboard it's the chums remarked the pilot who had brought a glass to bear upon the boat thunder exclaimed the captain striking a bell below there lower away another boat lively then turning to the passengers he exclaimed nobody on the river'd forgive me if i lost the chums twould be as bad as barnum losing the giraffe the occupants of the first boat were evidently of the captain's own mind for they were eagerly peering over her side and into the water suddenly the pilot dropped his glass extemporized a trumpet with both hands and shouted forward forward one of em's up then he put his mouth to the speaking tube and screamed to the engineer let her drop down a little billy the sounding party headed toward a black speck apparently a hundred yards below them and the great steamer slowly drifted downstream the speck moved toward shore and the boat rapidly shortening distance seemed to scrape the bank with her port oars safe enough now i guess exclaimed judge turner of one of the southern illinois circuits the judge had been interrupted in telling a story when the accident occurred and was in a hurry to resume as i was saying said he he hardly looked like a professional horse thief he was little and quiet and had always worked away steadily at his trade i believed him when he said twas his first offence and that he did it to raise money to bury his child and i was going to give him an easy sentence and ask the governor to pardon him the laws have to be executed you know but there's no law against mercy being practised afterward well the sheriff was bringing him from jail to hear the verdict and the sentence when the short man with red hair knocked the sheriff down and off galloped that precious couple for the wabash i saw the entire the deuce interrupted the pilot again dropping his glass the judge glared angrily the passengers saw across the shortened distance one of the chums holding by a root to the bank and trying to support the other whose shirt hung in rags and who seemed exhausted which one's hurt asked the captain give me the glass but the pilot had left the house and taken the glass with him the judge continued i saw the whole transaction through the window i was so close that i saw the sheriff's assailant's very eyes i'd know that fellow's face if i saw it in africa why they're both hurt exclaimed the captain they've thrown a coat over one and they're crowding round the other what the oh they're coming back without em need whiskey to bring em to i suppose why didn't i send whiskey down by the other boat there's an awful amount of time being wasted here what's the matter mr bell shouted the captain as the boat approached the steamer both dead replied the officer both now ladies and gentlemen exclaimed the captain turning toward the passengers who were crowded forward just below him i want to know if that isn't a streak of the meanest kind of luck both the chums gone why i wouldn't be able to hold up my head in new orleans how came it that just those two fellers were knocked out red tumbled out and black jumped in after him replied the officer red must have been caught in an eddy and tangled in the old tree's roots clothes torn almost off head caved in black must have burst a blood vessel his face looked like a copper pan when he reached shore and he just groaned and dropped the captain was sorry so sorry that he sent a waiter for brandy 
but the captain was human business was business the rain was falling and a big log was across the boat's bow so he shouted hurry up and bury him then you ought to have let the second boat's crew gone on with that and you have gone back to your soundings they was the chums to be sure but now they're only dead roustabouts blow there pass out a couple of shovels perhaps some ladies would go down with the boat captain and a preacher too if there's one aboard remarked the mate with an earnest but very mysterious expression why what in thunder does the fellow mean soliloquized the captain audibly women and a preacher for dead roustabouts what do you mean mr bell red's a woman briefly responded the mate the passengers all started the captain brought his hands together with a tremendous clap and exclaimed murder will out but who'd have thought i was to be the man to find out the secret of the carmy chums guess i'll be the biggest man on the new orleans levee after all yes certainly of course some ladies'll go and a preacher too if there's such a man aboard hold up though we'll all go take your soundings quick and we'll drop the steamer just below the point and tie up i wonder if there's a preacher aboard no one responded for the moment then the judge spoke before i went into the law i was the regularly settled pastor of a presbyterian church said he i'm decidedly rusty now but a little time will enable me to prepare myself properly excuse me ladies and gentlemen the sounding boat pulled away and the judge retired to his stateroom the ladies with very pale faces gathered in a group and whispered earnestly with each other then ensued visits to each other's staterooms and the final regathering of the ladies with two or three bundles the soundings were taken and as the steamer dropped downstream men were seen cutting a path down the rather steep clay bank the captain put his hands to his mouth and shouted dig only one grave make it wide enough for two and all the passengers nodded assent and satisfaction time had been short since the news reached the steamer but the bennett's carpenter who was himself a married man had made a plain coffin by the time the boat tied up and another by the time the grave was dug the first one was put upon a long hand barrow over which the captain had previously spread a tablecloth and followed by the ladies was deposited by the side of the body of red half an hour later the men placed black in the other coffin removed both to the side of the grave and signalled the boat now ladies and gentlemen said the captain the judge appeared with a very solemn face his coat buttoned tight to his throat and the party started colonel may of missouri who read voltaire and didn't believe in anything maliciously took the judge's arm and remarked you didn't finish your story judge the judge frowned reprovingly but really persisted the colonel i don't want curiosity to divert my mind from the solemn services about to take place do tell me if they ever caught the rascals they never did replied the judge the sheriff hunted and advertised but he could never hear a word of either of them but i'd know either of them at sight Shh, here we are at the grave the passengers officers and crew gathered about the grave the judge removed his hat and as the captain uncovered the faces of the dead commenced i am the resurrection and the life why there's the horse thief now colonel i beg your pardon ladies and gentlemen he that believeth in just then the judge's eye fell upon the dead woman's face and he screamed and there's the sheriff's assailant end of story twenty three Story twenty four of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story twenty four Little Guzzy. Bowerton was a very quiet place. It had no factories, mills, or mines, or other special inducements to offer people looking for new localities, and as it was not on a railroad line, nor even on an important post road, it gained but few new inhabitants even of travellers bowerton saw very few an occasional enterprising peddler or venturesome thief found his way to the town and took away such cash as came in their way while pursuing their respective callings 
but peddlers were not considered exactly trustworthy as newsbearers while housebreakers when detained long enough to be questioned were not in that communicative frame of mind which is essential to one who would interest the general public when therefore the mail coach one day brought to bowerton an old lady and a young one who appeared to be mother and daughter excitement ran high the proprietor of the bowerton house who was his own clerk hostler and table waiter was for a day or two the most popular man in town even the three pastors of the trio of churches of bowerton did not consider it beneath their dignity to join the little groups which were continually to be seen about the person of the landlord and listening to the meagre intelligence he was able to give the old lady was quite feeble he said and the daughter was very affectionate and very handsome he didn't know where they were going but they registered themselves from boston name was wyatt young lady's name was helen he hoped they wouldn't leave for a long time travellers weren't any too plenty in bowerton and landlords found it hard work to scratch along talked about locating at bowerton if they could find a suitable cottage wished em well but hoped they'd take their time and not be in a hurry to leave the bowerton house where if he did say it as shouldn't they found good rooms and good board at the lowest living price the wyatts finally found a suitable cottage and soon afterward they began to receive heavy packages and boxes from the nearest railway station then it was that the responsible gossips of bowerton were working nearly to death but each one was sustained by a fine professional pride which enabled them to pass creditably through the most exciting period for years they had skilfully pried into each other's private affairs but then they had some starting space some clue now alas there was not in all bowerton a single person who had emigrated from boston where the wyatts had lived worse still there was not a single bowertonian who had a boston correspondent to be sure one of the bowerton pastors had occasional letters from a missionary board whose headquarters were at the hub but not even the most touching appeals from members of his flock could induce him to write the board concerning the newcomers but bowerton was not to be balked in its striving after accurate intelligence from squire brown who leased mrs wyatt a cottage it learned that mrs wyatt had made payment by check on an excellent boston bank the poor but respectable female who washed the floors of the cottage informed the public that the whole first floor was to be carpeted with brussels the postmaster's clerk ascertained and stated that mrs wyatt received two religious newspapers per week whereas no one else in bowerton took more than one the grocer said that mrs wyatt was by jingo the sort of person he liked to trade with wouldn't have anything that wasn't the very best the man who helped to do the unpacking was willing to take oath that among the books were a full set of barns notes and two sets of commentaries while mrs battle who lived in the house next to the cottage and who was suddenly on hearing the crashing of crockery next door moved to neighbourly kindness to the extent of carrying in a nice hot pie to the newcomers declared that as she hoped to be saved there wasn't a bit of crockery in that house which wasn't pure china bowerton asked no more brussels carpets religious tendencies a bank account the ability to live on the best that the market afforded and to eat it from china and china only why either one of these qualifications was a voucher of respectability and any two of them constituted a patent of aristocracy of the bowerton standard bowerton opened its doors and heartily welcomed mrs and miss wyatt it is grievous to relate but the coming of the estimable people was the cause of considerable trouble in bowerton bowerton like all other places contained lovers and some of the young men were not so blinded by the charms of their own particular lady friends as to be oblivious to the beauty of miss wyatt she was extremely modest and retiring but she was also unusually handsome and graceful and she had an expression which the young men of bowerton could not understand but which they greatly admired 
it was useless for plain girls to say that they couldn't see anything remarkable about miss wyatt it was equally unavailing for good-looking girls to caution their gallants against too much of friendly regard even for a person of whose antecedents they really knew scarcely anything even casting chilling looks at miss wyatt when they met her failed to make that unoffending young lady any less attractive to the young men of bowerton and critical analysis of miss wyatt's style of dressing only provoked manly comparisons which were as exasperating as they were unartistic finally jack whiffer who was of a first family and was a store clerk besides proposed to miss wyatt and was declined then the young ladies of bowerton thought that perhaps helen wyatt had some sense after all then young baggs son of a deceased congressman wished to make miss wyatt mistress of the baggs mansion and sharer of the baggs money but his offer was rejected upon learning this fact the maidens of bowerton pronounced helen a noble-spirited girl to refuse to take bags away from the dear abused woman who had been engaged to him for a long time several other young men had been seen approaching the wyatt cottage in the full glory of broadcloth and hair oil and were noticeably depressed in spirits for days afterward and the native ladies of marriageable age were correspondingly elated when they heard of it when at last the one unmarried minister of bowerton who had been the desire of many hearts manfully admitted that he had proposed and been rejected and that miss wyatt had informed him that she was already engaged all the bowerton girls declared that helen wyatt was a darling old thing and that it was perfectly shameful that she couldn't be let alone after thus proving that their own hearts were in the right place all the bowerton girls asked each other who the lucky man could be of course he couldn't be a bowerton man for miss wyatt was seldom seen in company with any gentleman he must be a boston man he was probably very literary boston men always were besides if he was at all fit for her he must certainly be very handsome suddenly miss wyatt became the rage among the bowerton girls blushingly and gushingly they told her of their own loves and they showed her their lovers or pictures of those gentlemen miss wyatt listened smiled and sympathized but when they sat silently expectant of similar confidences they were disappointed and when they endeavoured to learn even the slightest particular of helen wyatt's love she changed the subject of conversation so quickly and decidedly that they had not the courage to renew the attempt but while most bowertonians despaired of learning much more about the wyatts and especially about helen's lover there was one who had resolved not only to know the favoured man but to do him some frightful injury and that was little guzzy though guzzy's frame was small his soul was immense and helen's failure to comprehend guzzy's greatness when he laid it all at her feet had made guzzy extremely bilious and gloomy many a night when guzzy's soul and body should have been taking their rest they roamed in company up and down the quiet street on which the wyatt's cottage was located and guzzy's eyes instead of being fixed on sweet pictures in dreamland gazed vigilantly in the direction of mrs wyatt's gate he did not meditate inflicting personal violence on the hated wretch who had snatched away helen from his hopes no personal violence could produce suffering but feeble compared with that under which the victim would writhe as guzzy poured forth the torrent of scornful invective which he had compiled from the memories of his bilious brain and the pages of his webster unabridged at length there came a time when most men would have despaired love is warm but what warmth is proof against the chilling blasts and pelting rains of the equinoctial storm but then it was that the fervour of little guzzy's soul showed itself for wrapped in the folds of a waterproof overcoat he paced his accustomed beat with the calmness of a faithful policeman and he had his reward as one night he stood unseen against the black background of a high wall opposite the residence of mrs wyatt he heard the gate her gate 
creak on its hinges it could be no ordinary visitor for it was after nine o'clock it must be he ha ah, the lights were out he would be disappointed the villain now was the time while his heart would be bleeding with sorrow to wither him with reproaches to be sure he seemed a large man while guzzy was very small but guzzy believed his own thin legs to be faithful in an emergency the unknown man knocked softly at the front door then he seemed to tap at several of the windows suddenly he raised one of the windows and guzzy who had not until then suspected that he had been watching a housebreaker sped away like the wind and alarmed the solitary constable of bowerton that functionary requested guzzy to notify squire jones justice of the peace that there was business ahead and then hastened away himself guzzy laboured industriously for some moments for squire jones was very old and very cautious and very stupid but he was at last fully aroused and then guzzy had an opportunity to reflect on the greatness which would be his when bowerton knew of his meritorious action and helen wyatt what would be her shame and contrition when she learned that the man whose love she had rejected had become the preserver of her peace of mind and her portable personal property he could not exult over her for that would be unchivalrous but would not her own conscience reproach her bitterly perhaps she would burst into tears in the court-room and thank him effusively and publicly guzzy's soul swelled at the thought and he rapidly composed a reply appropriate to such an occasion suddenly guzzy heard footsteps approaching and voices in earnest altercation guzzy hastened into the squire's office and struck an attitude befitting the importance of a principal witness an instant later the constable entered followed by two smart-looking men who had between them a third man securely handcuffed the prisoner was a very handsome intelligent-looking young man except for a pair of restless over-bright eyes there's a difference of opinion about who the prisoner belongs to said the constable addressing the squire and we agreed to leave the matter to you when i reached the house these gentlemen already had him in hand and they claim he's an escaped convict and that they've tracked him from the prison right straight to bowerton the prisoner gave the officers a very wicked look while these officials produced their warrants and handed them to the justice for inspection guzzy seemed to himself to grow big with accumulating importance the officers seemed to be duly authorized said the squire after a long and minute examination of their papers but they should identify the prisoner as the escaped convict for whom they are searching here's a description said one of the officers in an advertisement escaped from the penitentiary on the blank instant william bay alias bay billy alias handsome age twenty eight height five feet ten complexion dark hair black eyes dark brown mole on left cheek general appearance handsome manly and intelligent a skilful and dangerous burglar sentenced in eighteen sixty six to five years imprisonment two years yet to serve that continued the officer describes him to a dot and if there's any further doubt look here as he spoke he unclasped a cloak which the prisoner wore and disclosed the striped uniform of the prison there seems no reasonable doubt in this case and the prisoner will have to go back to prison said the justice but i must detain him while i ascertain whether he has stolen anything from mrs wyatt's residence in case he has done so we can prosecute at the expiration of his term the prisoner seemed almost convulsed with rage though of a sort which one of the officers whispered to the other he did not exactly understand guzzy eyed him resentfully and glared at the officers with considerable disfavour guzzy was a law-abiding man but to have an expected triumph belittled and postponed because of foreign interference was enough to blind almost any man's judicial eyesight well said one of the officers put him in the lock-up and investigate in the morning we won't want to start until then after the tramp he's given us 
oh bay billy you're a smart one no mistake about that why in thunder don't you use your smartness in the right way there's more money in business than in cracking cribs besides the moral advantage added the squire who was deacon as well and who now that he had concluded his official duties was not adverse to laying down the higher law just so exclaimed the officer and for his family's sake too why would you believe it judge they say billy has one of the finest wives in the commonwealth handsome well-educated religious rich and of good family of course she didn't know what his profession was when she married him again the prisoner seemed convulsed with that strange rage which the officer did not understand but the officers were tired and they were too familiar with the disapprobation of prisoners to be seriously affected by it so after an appointment by the squire and a final glare of indignation from little guzzy they started under the constable's guidance to the lock-up suddenly the door was thrown open and there appeared with uncovered head streaming hair weeping yet eager eyes and mud-splashed garments helen wyatt every one started the officers stared the squire looked a degree or two less stupid and hastened to button his dressing-gown the restless eyes of the convict fell on helen's beautiful face and were restless no longer while little guzzy assumed a dignified pose which did not seem at all consistent with his confused and shamefaced countenance we may as well finish this case to-night if miss wyatt is prepared to testify said the squire at length have you lost anything miss wyatt no said helen but i have found my dearest treasure my own husband and putting her arms around the convict's neck she kissed him and then dropping her head upon his shoulder she sobbed violently the squire was startled into complete wakefulness and as the moral aspect of the scene presented itself to him he groaned unequally yoked with an unbeliever the officers looked as if they were depraved yet remorseful convicts themselves while little guzzy's diminutive dimensions seemed to contract perceptibly at length the convict quieted his wife and persuaded her to return to her home with a promise from the officers that she should see him in the morning then the officers escorted the prisoner to the jail and guzzy sneaked quietly out while the squire retired to his slumbers with the firm conviction that if solomon had been a justice of the peace at bowerton his denial of the newness of anything under the sun would never have been made now the jail at bowerton like everything else in the town was decidedly antiquated and consisted simply of a thickly walled room in a building which contained several offices and living apartments it was as extensive a jail as bowerton needed and was fully strong enough to hold the few drunken and quarrelsome people who were occasionally lodged in it but bay alias bay billy alias handsome was no ordinary and vulgar jail-bird the officers told him and that he and they might sleep securely they considered it advisable to carefully iron his hands a couple of hours rolled away and left bay still sitting moody and silent on the single bedstead in the bowerton jail suddenly the train of his thoughts was interrupted by a low from one little high-grated window of the jail the prisoner looked up quickly and saw the shadow of a man's head outside the grating hello whispered bay hurrying under the window are you alone inquired the shadow yes replied the prisoner all right then whispered the voice there are secrets which no vulgar ear should hear my name is guzzy i have been in love with your wife i hadn't any idea she was married but i've brought you my apology i'll forgive you whispered the criminal but taint that kind of apology whispered guzzy it's a steel one a tool one of those things that gunsmiths shorten gun barrels with if they can saw a rifle barrel in two and five minutes you ought to get out of here inside of an hour not quite whispered bay my hands and feet are ironed then i'll do the job myself whispered guzzy as he applied the tool to one of the bars for it will be daylight within two hours 
the unaccustomed labor for guzzy was a bookkeeper made his arms ache severely but still he sawed away he wondered what his employer would say should he be found out but still he sawed visions of the uplifted hands and horror-struck countenances of his brother church members came before his eyes and the effect of his example upon his sunday school class should he be discovered tormented his soul but neither of these influences affected his saw bar after bar disappeared and when guzzy finally stopped to rest bay saw a small square of black sky unobstructed by any bars whatever now whispered guzzy i'll drop in a small box you can stand on so you can put your hands out and let me file off your irons i brought a file or two thinking they might come handy five minutes later the convict his hands unbound crawled through the window and was helped to the ground by guzzy seizing the file from the little bookkeeper bay commenced freeing his feet suddenly he stopped and whispered you'd better go now i can take care of myself but if those cursed officers should take a notion to look around it will be hard with you run god bless you run but little guzzy straightened himself and folded his arms the convict rasped away rapidly and finally dropped the file and the fragments of the last fetter then he seized little guzzy's hand my friend said he criminal though i am i am man enough to appreciate your manliness and honour i think i am smart enough to keep myself free now i am out of jail but if ever you want a friend tell helen she will know where i am and i will serve you no matter what the risk and pain thank you said guzzy but the only favour i'll ever ask of you might as well be named now and you ought to be able to do it without risk or pain either it's only this be an honest man for helen's sake bay dropped his head there are men who would die daily for the sake of making her happy but you've put it out of their power seeing you've married her continued guzzy i'm nothing to her and can't be but for her sake to-night i've broken open the gunsmith's shop broken a jail and here he stooped and picked up a bundle robbed my own employer's store of a suit of clothes for you so you mayn't be caught again in those prison stripes if i've made myself a criminal for her sake can't her husband be an honest man for the same reason the convict wrung the hand of his preserver he seemed to be trying to speak but to have some great obstruction in his throat suddenly a bright light shone on the two men and a voice was heard exclaiming in low but very ferocious tones do it you scoundrel or i'll put a bullet through your head both men looked up to the window of the cell and saw a bull's-eye lantern the muzzle of a pistol and the face of the bowerton constable the constable's right eye the sights of his pistol and the breast of the convict were on the same visual line without altering his position or that of his weapon the constable whispered i've had you covered for the last ten minutes i only held in to find out who was helping you but i heard too much for my credit as a faithful officer now what are you going to do turn over a new leaf said the convict bursting into tears then get out whispered the officer and be lively too it's almost daybreak i'll tell you what to do said little guzzy when the constable hurriedly whispered wait until i get out of hearing the excitement which possessed bowerton the next morning when the events of the previous night were made public was beyond the descriptive powers of the best linguists in the village helen wyatt a burglar's wife at first the bowertonian scarcely knew whether it would be proper to recognize her at all and before they were able to arrive at a conclusion the intelligence of the convict's escape the breaking open of the gunsmith's shop the finding of the front door of cashing's store ajar and the discovery by cashing that at least one suit of valuable clothing had been taken came upon the astonished villagers and rendered them incapable of reason and of every other mental attribute except wonder that the prisoner had an accomplice seemed certain and some suspicious souls suggested that the prisoner's wife might have been the person but as one of the officers declared he had watched her house all night for fear of some such attempt that theory was abandoned 
under the guidance of the constable who zealously assisted them in every possible manner the officers searched every house in bowerton that might seem likely to afford a hiding-place and then departed on what they considered the prisoners most likely route for some days helen wyatt gave the bowertonians no occasion to modify their conduct toward her for she kept herself constantly out of sight when however she did appear in the street again she met only the kindest looks and salutations for the venerable squire jones had talked incessantly in praise of her courage and affection and the squire's fellow-townsmen knew that when their principal magistrate was affected to tenderness and mercy it was from causes which would have simply overwhelmed any ordinary mortal it was months before bowerton gossip descended again to its normal level for a few weeks after the escape of bay little guzzy who had never been supposed to have unusual credit and whose family certainly hadn't any money left his employer and started an opposition store next to small scandal finance was the favourite burden of conversation at bowerton so the source of guzzy's sudden prosperity was so industriously sought and surmised that the gossips were soon at needles points about it then it was suddenly noised abroad that mrs bagg senior who knew everybody had given guzzy a letter of introduction to the governor of the state bowerton was simply confounded what could he want the governor had very few appointments at his disposal and none of them were fit for guzzy except those for which guzzy was not fit even the local politicians became excited and both sides consulted guzzy finally when guzzy started for the state capital and helen wyatt as people still called her accompanied him the people of bowerton put on the countenances of hopeless resignation and of a mute expectation which nothing could astonish it might be an elopement it might be that they were going as missionaries but no one expressed a positive opinion and every one expressed a perfect willingness to believe anything that was supported by even a shadow of proof their mute agony was suddenly ended for within forty-eight hours guzzy and his travelling companion returned the latter seemed unusually happy for the wife of a convict while the former went straight to squire jones and the constables half an hour later all bowerton knew that william bay alias bay billy alias handsome had received a full and free pardon from the governor the next day bowerton saw a tall handsome stranger with downcast eyes walk rapidly through the principal street and disappear behind mrs wyatt's gate a day later and bowerton was electrified by the intelligence that the ex-burglar had been installed as a clerk in guzzy's store people said that it was a shame that nobody knew how soon bay might take to his old tricks again nevertheless they crowded to guzzy's store to look at him until shrewd people began to wonder whether guzzy hadn't really taken bay as a sort of advertisement to draw trade a few months later however they changed their opinions for the constable after the expiration of his term of office and while under the influence of a glass too much related the whole history of the night of bay's first arrival at bowerton the bowertonians were law-abiding people but somehow guzzy's customers increased from that very day and his prosperity did not decline even after guzzy bay was the sign over the door of the store which had been built and stocked with mrs wyatt's money end of story twenty four story twenty five of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty five a romance of happy rest happy rest is a village whose name has never appeared in gazetteer or census report this remark should not cause any depreciation of the faithfulness of public and private statisticians for happy rest belonged to a class of settlements which sprang up about as suddenly as did jonah's gourd and after a short existence disappeared so quickly that the last inhabitant generally found himself alone before he knew that anything unusual was going on 
when the soil of happy rest supported nothing more artificial than a broken wagon wheel left behind by some emigrants going overland to california a deserter from a fort near by discovered that the soil was auriferous his statement to that effect made in a bar-room in the first town he reached thereafter led to his being invited to drink which operation resulted in certain supplementary statements and drinks within three hours every man within five miles of that bar-room knew that the most paying dirt on the continent had been discovered not far away and three hours later a large body of gold hunters guided by the deserter were en route for the auriferous locality while a storekeeper and a liquor dealer with their respective stocks in trade followed closely after the ground was found it proved to be tolerably rich tents went up underground residences were burrowed and the grateful miners ordered the barkeeper to give unlimited credit to the locality's discoverer the barkeeper obeyed the order and the ex-warrior speedily met his death in a short but glorious contest with john barleycorn there was no available lumber from which to construct a coffin and the storekeeper had no large boxes but as the liquor seller had already emptied two barrels these were taken neatly joined in the centre and made to contain the remains of the founder of the hamlet the method of his death and origin of his coffin led a spiritous miner to suggest that he rested happily and from this remark the name of the town was elaborated of course no ladies accompanied the expedition men who went west for gold did not take their families with them as a rule and the settlers of the new mining towns were all of the masculine gender when a town had attained to the dignity of a hotel members of the gentler sex occasionally appeared but with the exception of an occasional washerwoman their influence was decidedly the reverse of that usually attributed to woman's society for the privileges of their society men fought with pistols and knives and bought of them a disgrace and sorrow for gold but at first happy rest was unblessed and uncursed by the presence of any one who did not wear pantaloons on the fifth day of its existence however when the arrival of an express agent indicated that capital had formally acknowledged the existence of happy rest there was an unusual commotion in the never quiet village an important rumour had spread among the tents and gopher holes and one after another the citizens visited the saloon took the barkeeper mysteriously aside and with faces denoting the greatest concern whispered earnestly to him the barkeeper felt his importance as the sole custodian of all the village news but he replied with affability to all questions well yes there had a lady come come by the same stage as the express agent what kind well he really couldn't say some might think one way and some another he thought she was a real lady though she wouldn't allow anything to be sent her from the bar and she hadn't brought no baggage thought so knowed she was a lady in fact would bet drinks for the crowd on it cause why well cause nobody heard her cuss or seed her laugh he'd bet three to two she was a lady might bet two to one if he got his dander up on the subject then on t'other hand she'd axed for major axel and the major as everybody knowed was well he wasn't exactly a saint besides as the major hadn't come to happy rest nohow it looked as if he was dodging her for something where was she stoppin up to old psalm singers old psalm bed turned himself out of house and home and bought her a new tea-kettle to boot if anybody knowed anybody that wanted to take three to two send them along a few men called to bet and bets were exchanged all over the camp but most of the excitement centred about the storekeepers argonauts pioneers heroes or whatever else the early gold seekers were they were likewise mortal men so they competed vigorously for the few blacking brushes boxes of blacking looking-glasses pocket-combs and neckties which the store contained 
they bought toilet soap and borrowed razors and when they had improved their personal appearance to the fullest possible extent they stood aimlessly about like unemployed workmen in the market-place each one however took up a position which should rake the only entrance to old psalm-singer's tent suddenly two or three scores of men struck various attitudes as if to be photographed and exclaimed in unison there she is from the tent of old psalm-singer there had emerged the only member of the gentler sex who had reached happy rest for only a moment she stood still and looked about her as if uncertain which way to go but before she had taken a step old psalm singer raised his voice and said i thought it last night when i only seed her in the moonlight but i know it now she's a lady and no mistake if i was a bettin man i'd bet all my dust on it and my farm to hum besides a number of men immediately announced that they would bet in the speaker's place to any amount and in almost any odds for though old psalm by reason of non-participation in any of the drinks fights or games with which the camp refreshed itself was considered a mere non-entity it was generally admitted that men of his style could tell a lady or a preacher at sight the gentle unknown finally started toward the largest group of men seeing which several smaller groups massed themselves on the larger with alacrity as she neared them the men could see that she was plainly dressed but that every article of attire was not only neat but tasteful and that she had enough grace of form and carriage to display everything to advantage a few steps nearer and she displayed a set of sad but refined features marred only by an irresolute purposeless mouth then an ex-reporter from new york turned suddenly to a graceless young scamp who had once been a regular ornament to broadway and exclaimed louise matray isn't it tis by thunder replied the young man i knew i'd seen her somewhere wonder what she's doing here the reporter shrugged his shoulders some wild goose speculation i suppose smart and gritty if i had her stick i shouldn't be here but she always slips up can't keep all her wires well in hand was an advertising agent when i left the east picked up a good many ads too and made folks treat her respectfully when they'd have kicked a man out of doors if he'd come to the same errand say she's been asking for axel remarked the young man that's so queried the reporter wrinkling his brow and hurrying through his mental notebook oh yes there was some talk about them at one time some said they were married she said so but she never took his name she had a handsome son that looked like her and the major but she didn't know how to manage him went to the dogs or worse before he was eighteen axel here asked the young man no replied the reporter and twouldn't do her any good if he was the major's stylish and good-looking and plays a brilliant game but he hasn't any more heart than is absolutely necessary to his circulation besides his the reporter was interrupted by a heavy hand falling on his shoulder and found on turning that the hand belonged to the general the general was not a military man but his title had been conferred in recognition of the fact that he was a born leader wherever he went the general assumed the reins of government and his administration had always been popular as well as judicious but at this particular moment the general seemed to feel unequal to what was evidently his duty and he like a skilful general sought a properly qualified assistant and the reporter seemed to him to be just the man he wanted spider tracks said the general with an air in which authority and supplication were equally prominent you've told an awful sight of lies in your time don't deny it now nobody that ever reads the papers will believe you now's your chance to put your gift of gab to a respectable use the lady's bothered and wants to say something or ask something and she'll understand your lingo better than mine fire away now lively the ex shorthand writer seemed complimented by the general's address and stepping forward and raising the remains of what had once been a hat said can i serve you in any way madam 
the lady glanced at him quickly and searchingly and then seeming assured of the reporter's honesty replied i am looking for an old acquaintance of mine one major axel he is not in camp ma'am said spider tracks he was at rum valley a few days ago when our party was organized to come here i was there yesterday said the lady looking greatly disappointed and was told he started for here a day or two before some mistake ma'am i assure you replied spider tracks i should have known of his arrival if he had come i'm an old newspaper man ma'am and can't get out of the habit of getting the news the lady turned away but seemed irresolute the reporter followed her if you will return to rum valley ma'am i'll find the major for you if he is hereabouts said he you will be more comfortable there and i will be more likely than you to find him the lady hesitated for a moment longer then she drew from her pocket a diary wrote a line or two on one of its leaves tore it out and handed it to the reporter i will accept your offer and be very grateful for it for i do not bear this mountain travelling very well if you find him give him this scrawl and tell him where i am that will be sufficient trust me to find him ma'am replied spider tracks and as the stage is just starting and there won't be another for a week allow me to see you into it any baggage only a small handbag in the tent said she they hurried off together spider tracks found the bag and five minutes later was bowing and waving his old hat to the cloud of dust which the departing stage left behind it but when even the dust itself had disappeared he drew from his pocket the paper the fair passenger had given him tain't sealed said he reasoning with himself so there can't be any secrets in it let's see hello ernest is somewhere in this country i wish to see you about him and about nothing else whew what a splendid material for a column if there was only a live paper in this infernal country looking for that young scamp eh? there is something to her and i'll help her if i can wonder if i'd recognize him if i saw him again i ought to if he looks as much like his parents as he used to do twould do my soul good to make the poor woman smile once but it's an outrageous shame there's no good daily paper here to work the whole thing up in with the chase and fighting and murder that may come of it twould make the leading sensation for a week the agonized reporter clasped his hands behind him and walked slowly back to where he had left the crowd most of the citizens had on seeing the lady depart taken a drink as a partial antidote to dejection and strolled away to their respective claims regardless of the occasional mud which threatened the polish on their boots but two or three gentlemen of irascible tempers and judicial minds lingered to decide whether spider tracks had not by the act of seeing the lady to the stage made himself an accessory to her departure and consequently a fit subject for challenge by every disappointed man in camp the reporter was in the midst of a very able and voluble defence when the attention of his hearers seemed distracted by something on the trail by which the original settlers had entered the village spider tracks himself looked shaded his eyes indulged in certain disconnected fragments of profanity and finally exclaimed axel himself by the white coat of horace greeley wonder who he's got with him they seem to be having a difficulty about something the gentleman who had arraigned spider tracks allowed him to be acquitted by default far better to them was a fight near by than the most interesting lady far off they stuck their hands into their pockets and stared intently finally one of them in a tone of disgusted resignation remarked axel ought to be ashamed of hisself he's dragged along a little feller not half the size he is blamed if he ain't got his match though the little feller's just doin some glorious chawin and diggin the excitement finally overcame the inertia of the party and each man started deliberately to meet the major and his captive spider tracks faithful to his profession kept well in advance of the others suddenly he exclaimed to himself good lord don't they know each other 
the major didn't wear that beard when he was in new york but the boy he's just the same scamp in spite of his dirt and rags if she were to see them now but pshaw twould all fall flat no live paper to take hold of the matter and work it up there curse your treacherous heart roared the major as he gave his prisoner a push which threw him into the reporter's arms now we're in a civilized community and you'll have a chance of learning the opinion of gentlemen on such irregularities tried to kill me gentlemen upon my honor did it after i had shared my eatables and pocket pistol with him too did it to get my dust got me at a disadvantage for a moment and made a formal demand for the dust and backed his request with a pistol my own pistol gentlemen i've only just reached here i don't yet know who's here but i imagine there's public spirit enough to discourage treachery will some one see to him while i take something spider tracks drew his revolver mildly touched the young man on the shoulder and remarked come on the ex-knight of the pencil bowed his prisoner into an abandoned gopher hole i e an artificial cave cocked his revolver and then stretched himself on the ground and devoted himself to staring at the unfortunate youth to a student of human nature ernest mattray was curious fascinating and repulsive short slight handsome delicate nervous unscrupulous selfish effeminate dishonest and cruel he was an excellent specimen of what city life could make of a boy with no father and an irresolute mother the reporter who had many a time studied faces in the tombs felt almost as if at his old vocation again as he gazed into the restless eyes and sullen features of the prisoner meanwhile happy rest was becoming excited there had been some little fighting done since the settlement of the place but as there had been no previous attempt at highway robbery and murder made in the vicinity the prisoner was an object of considerable interest in fact the major told so spirited a story that most of the inhabitants strolled up one after another to look at the innovator while that individual himself with the modesty which seems inseparable from true greatness retired to the most secluded of the three apartments into which the cave was divided and declined all the attentions which were thrust upon him the afternoon had faded almost into evening when a decrepit figure in a black dress and bonnet approached the cave and gave spider tracks a new element for the thrilling report he had composed and mentally rearranged during his few hours of duty as jailer beats the dickens muttered the reporter to himself how these sisters of charity always know when a tough case has been caught natural enough in new york but where did she come from who told her cross beads and all hello oh louise mattray you're a deep one but it's a pity your black robe isn't quite long enough to hide the very tasty dress you wore this morning queer dodge too wonder what it means wonder if she's caught sight of the major and don't want to be recognized the figure approached may i see the prisoner she asked no one has a better right mrs mattray said the guardian of the cave with a triumphant smile while the poor woman started and trembled don't be frightened no one is going to hurt you heard all about it i suppose know who just missed being the victim yes said the unhappy woman entering the cave when she emerged it was growing quite dark she passed the reporter with head and veil down and whispered thank you don't mention it said the reporter quickly going to stay until you see how things go with him she shook her head and passed on the sky grew darker the reporter almost wished it might grow so dark that the prisoner could escape unperceived or so quickly that a random shot could not find him there were strange noises in camp the storekeeper who never travelled except by daylight was apparently harnessing his mules to the wagon he was moving the wagon itself to the extreme left of the camp where there was nothing to haul but wood and even that was still standing in the shape of fine old trees there seemed to be an unusual clearness in the air for spider tracks distinctly heard the buzz of some earnest conversation there seemed a strange shadows floating in the air a strange sense of something moving toward him 
something almost shapeless yet tangible something that approached him that gave him a sense of insecurity and then of alarm suddenly the indefinable something uttered a yell and resolved itself into a party of miners led by the gallant and aggrieved major himself who shouted lynch the scoundrel boys that's the only thing to do the excited reporter sprang to his feet in an agony of genuine humanity and suppressed itemizing and screamed major wait a minute you'll be sorry if you don't but the gallant major had been at the bar for two or three hours preparing himself for this valorous deed and the courage he had there imbibed knew not how to brook delay not until the crowd had reached the mouth of the cave and found it dark and had heard one unduly prudent miner suggest that it might be well to have a light so as to dodge being sliced in the dark bring a light quick then shouted the major i'll drag him out when it comes he knows my grip curse him a bunch of dried grass was hastily lighted and thrown into the cave and the major rapidly followed it while as many miners as could crowd in after him hastened to do so they found the major with white face and trembling limbs standing in front of the lady for whose sake they had done so much elaborate dressing in the morning and who they had afterwards wrathfully seen departing in the stage the major rallied turned round and said there's some mistake here gentlemen won't you have the kindness to leave us alone slowly uh, very slowly the crowd withdrew it seemed to them that in the nature of things the lady ought to have it out with the major with pistols or knives for disturbing her and that they who were in all the sadness of disappointment at failure of a well-planned independent execution ought to see the end of the whole affair but a beseeching look from the lady herself finally cleared the cave and the major exclaimed louise what does this mean it means said the lady with most perfect composure that thanks to a worthless father and a bad bringing up by an incapable mother ernest has found his way into this country i came to find him and i found him in this hole to which his affectionate father had brought him to-day it is about as well i imagine that i helped him to escape seeing to what further kind attentions you had reserved him please don't be so icy louise begged the major he attempted to rob and kill me the young rascal besides i had not the faintest idea of who he was perhaps said the lady still very calm you will tell me from whom he inherited the virtues which prompted his peculiar actions towards you his mother has always earned her livelihood honourably louise said the major with a humility which would have astonished his acquaintance won't you have the kindness to reserve your sarcasm until i am better able to bear it you probably think i have no heart i acknowledge i have thought as much myself but something is making me feel very weak and tender just now the lady looked critically at him for a moment and then burst into tears oh god she sobbed what else is there in store for this poor miserable injured life of mine restitution whispered the major softly if you will let me make it or try to make it the weeping woman looked up inquiringly and said only the words and she my first wife answered the major dead really dead louise as i hope to be saved she died several years ago and i longed to do you justice then but the memory of our parting was too much for my cowardly soul if you will take me as i am louise i will as long as i live remember the past and try to atone for it she put her hand in his and they left the gopher hole together as they disappeared in the outer darkness there emerged from one of the compartments of the cave an individual whose features were indistinguishable in the darkness but who was heard to emphatically exclaim if i had the dust i'd start a live daily here just to tell the whole story though the way he got out didn't do me any particular credit for days the residents of happy rest used all available mental stimulants to aid them in solving the mystery of the major and the wonderful lady 
but as the mental stimulants aforesaid were all spiritous the results were more deplorable than satisfactory but when a few days later the couple took the stage for rum valley the enterprising spider tracks took an outside passage and at the end of the route had his persistency rewarded by seeing in the bang-up house a sister of charity tenderly embrace the major's fair charge start at the sight of the major and then after some whispering by the happy mother sullenly extend a hand which the major grasped heartily and over which there dropped something which though a drop of water was not a raindrop then did spider tracks return to the home of his adoption and lavish the stores of his memory and for days his name was famous and his liquor was paid for by admiring auditors End of story 25story twenty six of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty six two powerful arguments got him you bet the questioner looked pleased yet not as if his pleasure engendered any mental excitement the man who answered spoke in an ordinary careless tone and with unmoved countenance as if he were merely signifying the employment of an additional workman or the purchase of a desirable rooster yet the subject of the brief conversation repeated above was no other than bill bowney the most industrious and successful of the horse thieves and road agents that honoured the southern portion of california with their presence nor did bowney restrict himself to the duty of redistributing the property of other people perhaps he belonged to that class of political economists which consider superfluous population an evil perhaps he was a religious enthusiast and ardently longed that all mankind should speedily see the pearly gates of the new jerusalem be his motives what they might it is certain that when an unarmed man met bowney entered into a discussion with him and lived verbally to report the same he was looked upon with considerably more interest than a newly made congressman or a ten thousand acre farmer was able to inspire the two men whose conversation we have recorded studied the ears of their own horses for several minutes after which the first speaker asked how did you do it well replied the other man thar warn't anything particular about it me and him wasn't acquainted so he didn't suspect me but i knowed his face he was pinted out to me once durin the gold rush to kern river and i never forgot him i was on a road i never travelled before goin to see an old greaser ownin a mighty pretty piece of ground i wanted when all of a sudden i come on a cabin and thar stood a bill in front of it a-smokin i axed him for a light and when he came up to give it to me i grabbed him by the shirt collar and dug the spur into the mare twas kind of a mean trick imposin on hospitality that a way but twas bounty you know he hollered and i let him walk in front but i kept him covered with a revolver till i met some fellers that tied him good and tight twas an excitin worth a durn that is except when his wife i s'pose twas hollered then i almost wished i'd let him go sheriff got him inquired the first speaker well no returned the captor a sheriff and judge mean well i s'pose but they're slow mighty slow besides he's got friends and they might be too much for the sheriff some night we took him to the broad oak and we thought we'd ax the neighbors over thar to-night to talk it over be thar you bet replied the first speaker and i'll bring my friends nothing like having plenty of witnesses in important legal cases just so responded the other well here's till then and the two men separated the broad oak was one of those magnificent trees which are found occasionally through southern california singly or dispersed in handsome natural parks the specimen which had so impressed people as to gain a special name for itself was not only noted for its size but because it had occasionally been selected as the handiest place in which judge lynch could hold his court without fear of molestation by rival tribunals bill bowney under favourable circumstances appeared to be a very homely lazy sneaking sort of an individual 
but bill bowney covered with dust his eyes bloodshot his clothes torn and his hands and feet tightly bound had not a single attractive feature about him he stared earnestly up into the noble tree under whose shadow he lay but his glances were not of admiration they seemed rather to be resting on two or three fragments of rope which remained on one of the lower limbs and to express sentiments of the most utter loathing and disgust the afternoon wore away and the moon shone brilliantly down from the cloudless sky the tramp of a horse was heard at a distance but rapidly growing more distinct and soon bowney's captor galloped up to the tree then another horse was heard then others and soon ten or a dozen men were gathered together each man after dismounting walked up to where the captive lay and gave him a searching look and then they joined those who had already preceded them and who were quietly chatting about wheat cattle trees uh, anything but the prisoner suddenly one of the party separated himself from the others and exclaimed gentlemen there don't seem to be anybody else a-comin we might as well tend to business i move that major burkus takes the chair if there's no objections no objections were made and major burkus a slight peaceable gentlemanly-looking man stepped out of the crowd and said you all know the object of this meeting gentlemen the first thing in order is to prove the identity of the prisoner needn't trouble yourself about that growled the prisoner i'm bill bowney and you're too cowardly to untie me though there be a dozen of you the prisoner admits he is bill bowney continued the major but of course no gentleman will take offence at his remarks has any one any charge to make against him charges cried an excitable farmer didn't i catch him untying my horse and riding off on him from budley's didn't i tell him to drop that animal and didn't he pretty near drop me instead charges here's the charge concluded the farmer pointing significantly to a scar on his own temple pity i didn't draw a better bead growled the prisoner the hoss only fetched two ounces prisoner admits stealing mr bark's horse and firing on mr bark any further evidence rather growled an angular gentleman i was going up the valley by the stage and all of a sudden the driver stopped where there wa'n't no station there was fellers had hold of the leaders and there was pistols pinted at the driver and folks in general then our money and watches was took and the fellow that took mine had a cross-cut scar on the back of his hand right hand maybe somebody look at bills the prisoner was carried into the moonlight and the back of his right hand was examined by the major the prisoner was again placed under the tree oh, the cuts there as described said the major anything else thar's this much said another i busted up flat you all know on account of the dry season last year and i hadn't nothing left but my hoss bill bowney knowed it as well as anybody else yet he came and stole that hoss it pawed like thunder and woke me up for twas night and light as tis now and i seed bowney a ridin him off twas a sneakin mean cowardly trick the prisoner hung his head he would plead guilty to theft and attempt to kill and defy his captors to do their worst but when meanness and cowardice were proved against him he seemed ashamed of himself prisoner virtually admits the charge said the major looking critically at bowney gentlemen said caney late of texas what's the use of wasting time this way everybody knows that bowney's been at the bottom of all the deviltry that's been done in the county this three year highway robbery a hangin offence in texas and every other well-regulated state so's hoss stealin and so shootin a man in the back and yit bowney's done every one of em over and over again everybody knows what we come here for else what's the reason every man's got a nice little coil of rope in his saddle fur the longer the business is put off the harder it'll be to do i move we string em up instanter second the motion exclaimed some one i move we give him a chance to save himself said a quiet farmer from new england when he's in the road agent business he has a crowd to help him now twould do us more good to clean them out than him alone so let's give him a chance to leave the state if he'll tell who this confederates are somebody'll have to take care of him of course till we can catch them and make sure of it 
twon't cost the somebody much then said the prisoner firmly and i'll give a cool thousand for a shot at any low-lived coyote that acts me to do such an ungentlemanly thing spoke like a man said caney of texas i hope you'll die easy for that bill the original motion prevails said the major all in favor will say aye a decided aye broke from the party whoever has the tallest horse will please lead him up and unsaddle him said the major after a slight pause the witnesses will take the prisoner in charge a horse was brought under the limb with the fragments of rope upon it and the witnesses one of them bearing a piece of rope approached the prisoner the silence was terrible and the feelings of all present were greatly relieved when bill bowney placed on the horse and seeing the rope hauled taut and fastened to a bough by a man in the tree broke into a frenzy of cursing and displayed the defiant courage peculiar to an animal at bay has the prisoner anything to say asked the major as bowney stopped for breath better own up and save yourself and reform and help rid the world of those other scoundrels pleaded the new englander don't you do it bill don't you do it cried caney of texas stick to your friends and die like a man that's me said the prisoner directing a special volley of curses at the new englander it's been said here that i was sneakin and cowardly there's one way of givin that feller the lie hurry up and do it when i raise my hand said the major lead the horse away and may the lord have mercy on your soul bowney amen fervently exclaimed the new englander again there was a moment of terrible silence and when a gentle wind swept over the wild oats and through the tree there seemed to sound on the air a sigh and a shudder suddenly all the horses started and pricked up their ears somebody comin whispered one of the party sheriff's got wind of the arrangements maybe comes from the wrong direction replied caney of texas quickly it's somebody on foot and tired and light-footed there's two or three dunno know what kind of beings they can be thunder and lightnin caney's concluding remark was inspired by the sudden appearance of a woman who rushed into the shadow of the tree stopped looked wildly about for a moment and then threw herself against the prisoner's feet and uttered a low pitiful cry there was a low murmur from the crowd and the major cried take him down give him fifteen minutes with his wife and see if she don't untie him the man in the tree loosened the rope bowney was lifted off and placed on the ground again and the woman threw herself on the ground beside him caressed his ugly face and wailed pitifully the judge and jury fidgeted about restlessly still the horses stood on the alert and soon three came through the oats three children all crying as they saw the men they became dumb and stood mute and frightened staring at their parents they were not pretty they were not even interesting mother and children were alike unwashed uncombed shoeless and clothed in dirty faded calico the children were all girls the oldest not more than ten years old and the youngest scarcely five none of them pleaded for the prisoner but still the woman wailed and moaned and the children stood staring in dumb piteousness the major stood quietly gazing at the face of his watch there was not in southern california a more honest man than major burkus yet the minute hand of his watch had not indicated more than one half of fifteen minutes when he exclaimed time's up the men approached the prisoner the woman threw her arms around him and cried my husband oh god madam said the major your husband's life is in his own hands he can save himself by giving the names of his confederates and leaving the state i'll tell you who they are cried the woman god curse you if you do whispered bony from between his teeth better let him be madam argued caney of texas he'd better die like a man than go back on his friends might tell us which of em was a man enough to fetch you and the young uns here we'll try to be easy on him when we catch em none of em sobbed the woman we walked and i took turns toting the young uns my husband oh god my husband beg your pardon ma'am said bowney's captor but nobody can't believe that it's nigh unto twenty mile i'd ha done it if i had been fifty cried the woman angrily when he was in trouble oh god oh god don't you believe it 
then look here she picked up the smallest child as she spoke and in the dim light the men saw that its little feet were torn and bleeding twas their blood or his'n replied the woman rapidly and i didn't know how to choose between em god of mercy on me i'm not crazy caney of texas took the child from its mother and carried it to where the moonlight was unobstructed he looked carefully at its feet and then shouted bring the prisoner out here two men carried bowney to where caney was standing and the whole party with the woman and remaining children followed bill said caney i ain't askin yer to go back on your friends but them is look at em and caney held the child's feet before the father's eyes while the woman threw her arms around his neck and the two older children crept up to the prisoner and laid their faces against his legs they're a-talkin to yer bill resumed caney of texas and they're the convincinest talkers i ever seed the desperado turned his eyes away but caney moved the child so its bleeding feet were still before its father's eyes the remaining men all retired beneath the shadow of the tree for the tender little feet were talking to them too and they were ashamed of the results suddenly bowney uttered a deep groan tain't no use a tryin said he in a resigned tone everybody be down on me and after all i've done too but yer can have their names curse ye the woman went into hysterics the children cried caney of texas ejaculated bully and then kissed the poor little bruised feet the new englander fervently exclaimed thank god i'll answer for him till we get him said caney after the major had written down the names bowney gave him and continued caney somebody get the rest of these young uns and their mother to my cabin powerful quick good lord don't i just wish there was boys i'd adopt the whole family the court informally adjourned sine die but had so many meetings afterward at the same place to dispose of bowney's accomplices that his freedom was considered fairly purchased and he and his family were located a good way from the scenes of his most noted exploits End of story twenty six story twenty seven of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty seven mr putchett's love just after two o'clock on a july afternoon mr putchett mounted several stats of the sub-treasury in wall street and gazed inquiringly up and down the street to the sentimental observer mr putchett's action in taking the position we have indicated may have seemed to signify that mr putchett was of an aspiring disposition and that in ascending the steps he exemplified his desire to get above the curbstone whose name was used as a qualifying adjective whenever mr putchett was mentioned as a broker those persons however who enjoyed the honour of mr putchett's acquaintance immediately understood that the operator in question was in funds that day and that he had taken the position from which he could most easily announce his moneyed condition to all who might desire assistance from him it was rather late in the day for business and certain persons who had until that hour been unsuccessful in obtaining the accommodations desired were not at all particular whether their demands were satisfied in a handsome office or under the only roof that can be enjoyed free of rent there came to mr putchett oddly clothed members of his own profession and offered for sale securities whose numbers mr putchett compared with those on a list of bonds stolen men who deposited with him small articles of personal property principally jewellery as collaterals on small loans at short time and usurious rates men who stood before him on the sidewalk caught his eye summoned him by a slight motion of the head and disappeared around the corner whither mr putchett followed them only to promptly transact business and hurry back to his business stand in fact mr putchett was very busy as in his case business invariably indicated profit it was not wonderful that his rather unattractive face lightened and expressed its owner's satisfaction at the amount of business he was doing 
suddenly however there attacked mr putchett the fate which in its peculiarity of visiting people in their happiest hours has been bemoaned by poets of genuine and doubtful inspiration from the days of the sweet singer of israel unto those of that sweet singer of aaron whose recital of experience with young gazelles illustrates the remorselessness of the fate alluded to plainly speaking mr putchett went suddenly under a cloud for during one of his dashes around the corner after a man who had signalled him and at the same time commenced to remove a ring from his finger a small dirty boy handed mr putchett a soiled card on which was pencilled bailey is after you about that diamond despite the fact that mr putchett had not been shaved for some days and had apparently neglected the duty of facial ablution for quite as long a time he turned pale and looked quickly behind him and across the street then muttering just my luck and a few other words more desponding than polite in nature he hurried to the post office where he penciled and dispatched a few postal cards signed in initials only announcing an unexpected and temporary absence then still looking carefully and often at the faces in sight he entered a newspaper office and consulted a railway directory he seemed in doubt as he rapidly turned the leaves and when he reached the timetable of a certain road running near and parallel to the seaside the change in his countenance indicated that he had learned the whereabouts of a city of refuge an hour later mr putchett having to bid no family good-bye to care for no securities save those stowed away in his capacious pockets and freed from the annoyance of baggage by reason of the fact that he had on his back the only outer garments that he owned was rapidly leaving new york on a train which he had carefully assured himself did not carry the dreaded bailey once fairly started mr putchett in some measure recovered his spirits he introduced himself to a brakeman by means of a cigar and questioned him until he satisfied himself that the place to which he had purchased a ticket was indeed unknown to the world being far from the city several miles from the railroad and on a beach where boats could not safely land he also learned that it was not a fashionable summer resort and that a few farmhouses whose occupants took summer boarders and an unsuccessful hotel were the only buildings in the place arrived at his destination mr putchett registered at the hotel and paid the week's board which the landlord after a critical survey of his new patron demanded in advance then the exiled operator tilted a chair in the bar-room lit an execrable cigar and instead of expressing sentiments of gratitude appropriate to the occasion gave way to profane condemnations of the bad fortune which had compelled him to abandon his business he hungrily examined the faces of the few fishermen of the neighbouring bay who came in to drink and smoke but no one of them seemed likely to need money certainly no one of them seemed to have acceptable collaterals about his person or clothing on the contrary these men while each one threw mr putchett a stare of greater or less magnitude let the financier alone so completely that he was conscious of a severe wound in his self-esteem it was a strange experience and at first it angered him so that he strode up to the bar ordered a glass of best brandy and defiantly drank alone but neither the strength of the liquor nor the intensity of his anger prevented him from soon feeling decidedly lonely at the cheap hotel at which he lodged when in new york there was no one who loved him or even feared him but there were a few men of his own kind who had for purposes of mutual recreation tabooed business transactions with each other and among these he found a grim sort of enjoyment of companionship at least here however he was so utterly alone as to be almost frightened and the murmuring and moaning of the surf on the beach near the hotel added to his loneliness a sense of terror almost overcome by dismal forebodings mr putchett hurried out of the hotel and toward the beach once upon the sands he felt better 
the few people who were there were strangers of course but they were women and children and if the expression of those who noticed him was wondering it was inoffensive at times even pitying and mr putchett was in a humour to gratefully accept even pity soon the sun fell and the people straggled toward their respective boarding-houses and mr putchett to fight off loneliness as long as possible rose from the bench on which he had been sitting and followed the party up the beach he had supposed himself the last person that left the beach but in a moment or two he heard a childish voice shouting mister mister i guess you've lost something mr putchett turned quickly and saw a little girl six or seven years of age running toward him in one hand she held a small pail and wooden shovel and in the other something bright which was too large for her little hand to cover she reached the broker's side turned up a bright healthy face opened her hand and displayed a watch and said it was right there on the bench where you were sitting i couldn't think what it was it shone so mr putchett at first looked suspiciously at the child for he had at one period of his life laboured industriously in the business of dropping bogus pocket-books and watches and obtaining rewards from persons claiming to be their owners examining the watch which the child handed him however he recognised it as one upon which he had lent twenty dollars earlier in the day first prudently replacing the watch in the pocket of his pantaloons so as to avoid any complication while settling with the finder he handed the child a quarter oh no thank you said she hastily mamma gives me money whenever i need it the experienced operator immediately placed the fractional currency where it might not tempt the child to change her mind then he studied her face with considerable curiosity and asked do you live here oh no she replied we're only spending the summer here we live in new york mr putchett opened his eyes whistled and remarked it's very funny why i don't think so said the child very innocently lots of people that board here come from new york don't you want to see my well i dug the deepest well of anybody to-day just come and see it's only a few steps from here mechanically as one straggling with a problem above his comprehension the financier followed the child and gazed into a hole perhaps a foot and a half deep on the beach that's my well said she and the one next is frank's nelly's is way up there i guess hers would have been the biggest but a wave came up and spoiled it mr putchett looked from the well into the face of its little digger and was suddenly conscious of an insane desire to drink some of the water he took the child's pail dipped some water and was carrying it to his lips when the child spoiled what was probably the first sentimental feeling of mr putchett's life by hastily exclaiming you mustn't drink that it's salty the sentimentalist sorrowfully put the bitter draught away and the child rattled on if you're down here to-morrow i'll show you where we find scallop shells maybe you can find some with pink and yellow spots on them i've got some if you don't find any i'll give you one thank you said her companion just then some one shouted alice and the child exclaiming mamma's calling me good-bye hurried away while the broker walked slowly toward the hotel with an expression of countenance which would have hidden him from his oldest acquaintance mr putchett spent the evening on the piazza instead of in the bar-room and he neither smoked nor drank before retiring he contracted with the colored cook to shave him in the morning and to black his boots and he visited the single store of the neighborhood and purchased a shirt some collars and a cravat while in the morning he was duly shaved dressed and brushed he critically surveyed himself in the glass and seemed quite dissatisfied he moved from the glass spread a newspaper on the table and put into it the contents of his capacious pockets a second examination before the glass seemed more satisfactory in result thus indicating that to the eye of mr putchett his well-stuffed pockets had been unsightly in effect the paper and its contents he gave the landlord to deposit in the hotel safe 
then he ate a hurried scanty breakfast and again sought the bench on the beach no one was in sight for it was scarcely breakfast time at the boarding-houses so he looked for little alice's well and mourned to find that the tide had not even left any sign of its location then he seated himself on the bench again contemplating his boots looked up the road stared out to sea and then looked up the road again tried to decipher some of the names carved on the bench walked backward and forward looking up the road at each turn he made and in every way indicated the unpleasant effect of hope deferred finally however after two hours of fruitless search mr putchett's eyes were rewarded by the sight of little alice approaching the beach with a bathing party he at first hurried forward to meet her but he was restrained by a sentiment found alike in curbstone brokers and in charming young ladies a feeling that it is not well to give oneself away without first being sufficiently solicited to do so he noticed with a mingled pleasure and uneasiness that little alice did not at first recognize him so greatly had his toilette altered his general appearance even after he made himself known he was compelled to submit to further delay for the party had come to the beach to bathe and little alice must bathe too she emerged from a bathing-house in a garb very odd to the eyes of mr putchett but one which did not at all change that gentleman's opinion of the wearer she ran into the water was thrown down by the surf she was swallowed by some big waves and dived through others and all the while the veteran operator watched her with a solicitude which despite his anxiety for her safety gave him a sensation as delightful as it was strange the bath ended alice rejoined mr putchett and conducted him to the spot where the wonderful shells with pink and yellow spots were found the new shell-seeker was disgusted when the child shouted come along to several other children and was correspondingly delighted when they said in substance that shells were not so attractive as once they were mr putchett's researches in conchology were not particularly successful for while he manfully moved about in the uncomfortable and ungraceful position peculiar to shell-seekers he looked rather at the healthy honest eager little face near him than at the beach itself suddenly however mr putchett's opinion of shells underwent a radical change for the child straightening herself and taking something from her pocket exclaimed oh dear somebody's picked up all the pretty ones i thought maybe there mightn't be any here so i brought you one just see what pretty pink and yellow spots there are on it mr putchett looked and there came into his face the first flush of colour that had been there except in anger for years he had occasionally received presents from business acquaintances but he had correctly looked on them as having been forwarded as investments so they awakened feelings of suspicion rather than of pleasure but at little alice's shell he looked long and earnestly and when he put it into his pocket he looked for two or three moments far away and yet at nothing in particular do you have a nice boarding-house asked alice as they sauntered along the beach stopping occasionally to pick up pebbles and to dig wells oh not very said mr putchett the sanded bar-room and his own rather dismal chamber coming to his mind you ought to board where we do said alice enthusiastically we have heaps of fun have you got a barn mr putchett confessed that he did not know oh we've got a splendid one exclaimed the child there's stalls and a granary and a carriage house and two lofts in it we put out hay to the horses and they eat it right out of our hands aren't afraid a bit then we get into the granary and bury ourselves all up in the oats so only our heads stick out the lofts are just lovely one's full of hay and the other's full of wheat and we chew the wheat and make gum of it the haystalks are real nice and sweet to chew too they only cut the hay last week and we all rode in on the wagon one two three four seven of us then we've got two croquet sets and the boys make us whistles and squawks
squalks interrogated the broker yes they're split quills and you blow on them they don't make very pretty music but it's ever so funny we've got two big swings and a hammock too is the house very full asked mr putchett not so very replied the child if you come there to board i'll make frank teach you how to make whistles that afternoon mr putchett took the train for new york from which city he returned the next morning with quite a well-filled trunk it was afterwards stated by a person who had closely observed the capitalist's movements during his trip that he had gone into a first-class clothier's and demanded suits of the best material and latest cut regardless of cost and that he had pursued the same singular course at a gent's furnishing store and a fashionable jeweller's certain it is that on the morning of mr putchett's return a gentleman very well dressed though seemingly ill at ease in his clothing called at mrs brown's boarding-house and engaged a room and that the younger ladies pronounced him very stylish and the older ones thought him very odd but as he never intruded spoke only when spoken to and devoted himself earnestly and entirely to the task of amusing the children the boarders all admitted that he was very good-hearted among alice's numerous confidences during her second stroll with mr putchett was information as to the date of her seventh birthday now very near at hand when the day arrived her adorer rose unusually early and spent an impatient hour or two awaiting alice's appearance as she bade him good morning he threw about her neck a chain to which was attached an exquisite little watch then while the delighted child was astonishing her parents and the other boarders mr putchett betook himself to the barn in a state of abject sheepishness he did not appear again until summoned by the breakfast bell and even then he sat with a very red face and with eyes directed at his plate only the child's mother remonstrated against so much money being squandered on a child and attempted to return the watch but he seemed so distressed at the idea that the lady dropped the subject for a fortnight mr putchett remained at the boarding-house and grew daily in the estimation of every one from being thought queer and strange he gradually gained the reputation of being the best-hearted most guileless most considerate man alive he was the faithful squire of all the ladies both young and old and was adored by all the children his conversational powers except on matters of business were not great but his very ignorance on all general topics and the humility born of that ignorance gave to his manners a deference which was more gratifying to most ladies than brilliant loquacity would have been he even helped little alice to study a sunday school lesson and the experience was so entirely new to him that he became more deeply interested than the little learner herself he went to church on sunday and was probably the most attentive listener the rather prosy old pastor had of course he bathed everybody did a stout rope was stretched from a post on the shore to a buoy in deep water where it was anchored and back and forth on this rope capered every day twenty or thirty hideously dressed but very happy people among whom might always be seen mr putchett with a child on his shoulder one day the waves seemed to viciously break near the shore and the bathers all followed the rope out to where there were swells instead of breakers mr putchett was there of course with little alice he seemed perfectly enamoured of the water and delighted in venturing as far to the sea as the rope would allow and there ride on the swells and go through all other ridiculously happy antics peculiar to ocean lovers who cannot swim suddenly mr putchett's hand seemed to receive a shock and he felt himself sinking lower than usual while above the noise of the surf and the confusion of voices he heard someone roar the rope has broken scramble ashore the startled man pulled frantically at the piece of rope in his hand but found to his horror that it offered no assistance it was evident that the break was between him and the shore 
he kicked and paddled rapidly but seemed to make no headway and while alice realizing the danger commenced to cry piteously mr putchett plainly saw on the shore the child's mother in an apparent frenzy of excitement and terror the few men present most boarding-house keepers and also ex-sailors and fishermen hastened with a piece of the broken rope to drag down a fishing-boat which lay on the sand beyond reach of the tide meanwhile a boy found a fishing-line to the end of which a stone was fastened and thrown toward the imperiled couple mr putchett snatched at the line and caught it and in an instant half a dozen women pulled upon it only to have it break almost inside mr putchett's hands again it was thrown and again the frightened broker caught it this time he wound it about alice's arm put the end into her hand kissed her forehead and said good-bye little angel god bless you and threw up his hand as a signal that the line should be drawn in in less than a minute little alice was in her mother's arms but when the line was ready to be thrown again mr putchett was not visible by this time the boat was at the water's edge and four men two of whom were familiar with rowing sat at the oars while two of the old fishermen stood by to launch the boat at the proper instant suddenly they shot it into the water but the clumsy dip of an oar turned it broadside to the wave and in an instant it was thrown waterlogged upon the beach several precious moments were spent in righting the boat and bailing out the water after which the boat was safely launched the fishermen sprang to the oars and in a moment or two were abreast the buoy mr putchett was not to be seen even had he reached the buoy it could not have supported him for it was but a small stick of wood one of the boarders he who had swamped the boat dived several times and finally there came to the surface a confused mass of humanity which separated into the forms of the diver and the broker a few strokes of the oars beached the boat and old captain redding who had spent his winters at a government life-saving station picked up mr putchett carried him up the dry sand laid him face downward raised his head a little and shouted somebody stand between him and the sun so's to shade his head slap his hands one man to each hand scrape up some of that hot dry sand and pile it on his feet and legs everybody else stand off and give him air the captain's orders were promptly obeyed and there the women and children some of them weeping and all of them pale and silent stood in a group in front of the bathing-house and looked up somebody run to the hotel for brandy shouted the captain here's brandy said a strange voice and i've got a hundred dollars for you if you bring him to life every one looked at the speaker and seemed rather to dislike what they saw he was a smart-looking man but his face seemed very cold and forbidding he stood apart with arms folded and seemed regardless of the looks fastened upon him finally mrs blough one of the most successful and irrepressible gossips in the neighbourhood approached him and asked him if he was a relative of mr putchett's no ma'am replied the man with unmoved countenance i'm an officer with a warrant for his arrest on suspicion of receiving stolen goods i've searched his traps at the hotel and boarding-house this morning but can't find what i'm looking for it's been traced to him though has he shown any of you ladies a large diamond no said mrs blough quite tartly and none of us would have believed it of him either i suppose not said the officer his face softening a little i've seen plenty of such cases before though besides it isn't my first call on putchett not by several mrs blough walked indignantly away but true to her nature she quickly repeated her news to her neighbours he's coming too shouted the captain turning mr putchett on his back and attempting to provoke respiration the officer was by his side in a moment mr putchett's eyes had closed naturally the captain said and his lips had moved suddenly the stranger laid a hand on the collar of the insensible man and disclosed a cord about his neck captain said the officer in a voice very low but hurried and trembling with excitement putchett's had a very narrow escape and i hate to trouble him but i must do my duty 
there's been a five thousand dollar diamond traced to him he advanced money on it knowing it was stolen i've searched his property and can't find it but i'll bet a thousand it's on that string around his neck that's putchet all over now you let me take it and i'll let him alone nobody else need know what's happened he seems to have behaved himself here judging by the good opinion folks have of him and he deserves to have a chance which he won't get if i take him to jail the women had comprehended from the look of the stranger and the captain that something unusual was going on and they had crowded nearer and nearer until they heard the officer's last words you're a dreadful hateful man exclaimed little alice the officer winced hush daughter said alice's mother and then she said let him take it captain it's too awful to think of a man's going right to prison from the gates of death the officer did not wait for further permission but hastily opened the bathing dress of the still insensible figure suddenly the officer started back with an oath and the people saw fastened to a string and lying over mr putchett's heart a small scallop shell variegated with pink and yellow spots it's one i gave him when i first came here because he couldn't find any sobbed little alice the officer seeming suddenly to imagine that the gem might be secreted in the hollow of the shell snatched at it and turned it over mr putchett's arm suddenly moved his hand grasped the shell and carried it toward his lips his eyes opened for a moment and fell upon the officer at the sight of whom mr putchett shivered and closed his eyes again that chills a bad sign muttered the captain mr putchett's eyes opened once more and sought little alice his face broke into a faint smile and she stooped and kissed him the smile on his face grew brighter for an instant then he closed his eyes and quietly carried the case up to a court of final appeals before which the officer showed no desire to give evidence mr putchett was buried the next day and most of the people in the neighborhood were invited to the funeral the story went rapidly about the neighborhood and in consequence there were present at the funeral a number of uninvited persons among these were the cook barkeeper and hostler of the hotel who stood uncomfortably a little way from the house until the procession started when they followed at a respectable distance in the rear when the grave was reached those who dug it who were also of those who carried the beer were surprised to find the bottom of the coffin box strewn and hidden with wild flowers and scraps of evergreen the service of the church of england was read and as the words ashes to ashes dust to dust were repeated a bouquet of wild flowers was tossed over the heads of the mourners and into the grave mrs blough though deeply affected by the services looked quickly back to see who was the giver and saw the officer who had not been seen before that day with such an embarrassed countenance as to leave no room for doubt he left before daylight next morning to catch a very early train but persons passing the old graveyard that day beheld on putchett's grave a handsome bush of white roses which bush old mrs gale living near the hotel declared was a darling pot plant which had been purchased of her on the previous evening by an ill-favoured man who declared he must have it no matter how much he paid for it End of story 27story twenty eight of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty eight the meanest man at blugsey's to miners whose gold fever had not reached a ridiculous degree of heat blugsey's was certainly a very satisfactory location the dirt was rich the river ran dry there was plenty of standing room on the banks which were devoid of rocks the storekeeper dealt strictly on the square and the saloon contained a pleasing variety of consolatory fluids which were dispensed by stumpy flukes ex-sailor and as hearty a fellow as any one would wish to see 
all thieves and claim jumpers had been shot as fast as discovered and the men who remained had taken each other's measures with such accuracy that genuine fights were about as infrequent as prayer meetings the miners dug and washed ate drank swore and gambled with that delightful freedom which exists only in localities where society is established on a firm and well-settled basis such being the condition of affairs at blugsey's it seemed rather strange one morning hours after breakfast to see sprinkled in every direction a great number of idle picks shovels and pans in fact the only mining implements in use that morning were those handled by a single miner who was digging and carrying and washing dirt with an industry which seemed to indicate that he was working as a substitute for each and every man in the camp he was anything but a type of gold hunters in general he was short and thin and slight and stooping and greatly round-shouldered his eyes were of a painfully uncertain grey and one of them displayed a cast which was his only striking feature his nose had started as a very retiring nose but had changed its mind halfway down his lips were thin and seemed to yearn for a close acquaintance with his large ears his face was sallow and thin and thickly seamed and his chin appeared to be only one of nature's hasty afterthoughts long thin grey hair hung about his face and imparted the only relief to the monotonous dinginess of his features and clothing such being the appearance of the man it was scarcely natural to expect that miners in general would regard him as a special ornament to the profession in fact he had been dubbed old scrabble grab on the second day of his occupancy of claim number thirty two and such of his neighbours as possessed the gift of tongues had after more intimate acquaintance with him expressed themselves doubtful of the ability of language to properly embody scrabble grab's character in a single name the principal trouble was that they were unable to make anything at all of his character there was nothing about him which they could understand so they first suspected him and then hated him violently after the usual manner of society toward the incomprehensible and on the particular morning which saw scrabble grab the only worker at blugsey's the remaining miners were assembled in solemn conclave at stumpy fluke's saloon to determine what was to be done with the detested man the scene was certainly an impressive one for such quiet had not been known in the saloon since the few moments which intervened between the time weeks before when broadhorn jerry gave the lie to captain greed and the captain whose pistol happened to be unloaded was ready to proceed to business the average miner when sober possesses a degree of composure and gravity which would be admirable even in a judge of ripe experience and miners assembled as a deliberative body can display a dignity which would drive a venerable senator or a british m p to the uttermost extreme of envy on the occasion mentioned above the miners ranged themselves near the unoccupied walls and leaned at various graceful and awkward angles boston ben who was by natural right the ruler of the camp took the chair that is he leaned against the centre of the bar on the other side of the bar leaned stumpy flukes displaying that degree of conscious importance which was only becoming to a man who by virtue of his position was sole and perpetual secretary and recorder to all stated meetings at blugsey's boston ben glanced around the room and then collectively announced the presence of a quorum the formal organization of the meeting and its readiness for deliberation by quietly remarking blaze away immediately one of the leaners regained the perpendicular departed a pace from the wall rolled his tobacco neatly into one cheek and remarked we stood it long enough the bottom's clean out of the pan mr chairman scrabble grabs declined bitters from half the fellows in camp and though his grey old topknots kept him from taking satisfaction in the usual manner they don't feel no better about it than they did the speaker subsided into his section of wall composed himself into his own special angles and looked like a man who had fully discharged a conscientious duty 
from the opposite wall there appeared another speaker who indignantly remarked going back on bitters ain't a toothful to what he's done there's young curly that went last week that boy played his hand in a style that would take the conceit clean out of an angel but all to onct curly took to lookin flaxed and the judge here overheard scrabble grab askin curly what he thought his mother say if she knew he was makin his money that way the boy took on wuss and wuss and now he's vamoosed don't believe me if you don't want ter fellers here's the judge hisself the judge briskly advanced his spectacles which had gained him his title and said true as gospel and when i asked him if he wasn't ashamed of himself for taking away the boy's comfort he said no and that i'd be a more decent man if i give up kids myself he's alive yet said the first speaker in a tone half of inquiry and half of reproof i know it said the judge hastening to explain i'd lent my pepper-box to mose when he went to frisco and the old man's too little for a man of my size to hit the judge looked anxiously about until he felt assured his explanation had been generally accepted and then he continued what's he good for anyhow he can't sing a song except something about jesus and tasteless hours that nobody's ever heard before and don't want to again he don't drink he don't play cards he don't even discuss when he tumbles into the river every man's got his pints and if he hain't got no good uns he's sure to have bad uns if he'd only show em out there might be something honest about it but when a feller just eats and sleeps and works and never shows any of the tastes of a gentleman there's something wrong i don't wish him any harm said a tall good-natured fellow who succeeded the judge but the feller's looks is again the reputation of the place in a camp like this here one of our society's first class no greasers nor pigtails nor loafers it ain't the thing to have anybody round that looks like a corkscrew that's been fed on green apples and watered with vinegar it's discouraging to gentlemen that might have a notion of staking a claim for the sake of enjoying our social advantages then none of yer have got the worst of it yet remarked another the old cuss is too fond of his dust billy banks seen him a buyin pork up to the store and he handled his pouch as if twas eggs instead of gold dust poured it out as careful as yer please and even scraped up a little bit he spilt now when i was a little rat and went to sunday school they used to keep a waggin at me about evil communication a corruptin a good manners that's what he'll do first thing you know other fellows will begin to be stingy and think gold dust was made to save instead of to buy drinks and play cards for that's what it'll come to beggin everybody's pardon interposed a deserter from the army but these here proceedings is irregular tain't the square thing to take evidence till the prisoner's in court boston ben immediately detailed a special officer to summon old scrabble grab declared a recess of five minutes and invited the boys to drink with him those who took sugar in theirs had the cup dashed from their lips just as they were draining the delicious dregs for the officer and culprit appeared and the chairman rapped the assembly to order boston ben had been an interested attendant at certain law courts in the states so in the calm consciousness of his acquaintance with legal procedure he rapidly arraigned scrabble grab scrabble grab you're complained of for going back on bitters coaxin curly to give up cards thus spoilin his fun and knockin appreciatin observers out o their amusement of insultin the judge of not cussin when you stumble into the river of not havin any good pints and not showin your bad ones of bein a setback on the tone of the place lookin like a green apple fed vinegar watered corkscrew or words to that effect and finally in savin your money what have you got to say against sentence bein passed on you the old man flushed as the chairman proceeded and when the indictment reached its end he replied in a tone which indicated anything but respect for the court i've got just this to say that i paid my way here i've asked no odds of any man since i've been here and that anybody that takes pains to meddle in my affairs is an impudent scoundrel saying which the old man turned to go while the court was paralyzed into silence but tom dosser a new arrival and a famous shot now stepped in front of the old man 
i ask your parding said tom in the blandest of tones but of course you didn't mean me when you mentioned impudent scoundrels yes i did i meant you and everybody like yer replied the old man tom's hand moved toward his pistol the chairman expeditiously got out of range stumpy flukes promptly retired to the extreme end of the bar and groaned audibly the old man was in the wrong but then wasn't it too mean when blood was so hard to get out that these difficulties always took place just after he'd got the floor clean i don't generally shoot till the other feller draws explained tom dosser while each man in the room wept with emotion as they realized they had lived to see tom's skill displayed before their very eyes i don't generally shoot till the other feller draws but you better be spry i usually make a little allowance for age but tom's further explanations were indefinitely delayed by an abnormal contraction of his trachea the same being induced by the old man's right hand while his left seized the unhappy thomas by his waist belt and a second later the dead shot of blugsey's was tossed into the middle of the floor somewhat as the sheaf of oats is tossed by a practised hand anybody else inquired the old man i'll back vermont bone and muscle again the whole passel of ye even if i be a deacon the angel of the lord encampeth round about them that fear him the angel needn't hurry hisself said tom dosser picking himself up one joint at a time if that's the crowd you're travelling with and they've got a grip anything like yourn i don't want nothing to do with em boston ben looked excited and roared this court's adjourned sine die then he rushed up to the newly announced deacon caught him firmly by the right hand slapped him heartily between the shoulders and inquired rather indignantly say old angel come why don't you ever let folks know your style instead of trottin round like a melancholy clam with his shells shut up tight that's what this crowd wants to know now you've opened down to bedrock we'll get english sam from sonora and get up the tallest kind of a wrestling match not unless english sam meddles with my business you won't replied the deacon quickly i've got enough to do fightin spiritual foes oh said boston ben we'll manage it so the church folks needn't think twas a set-up job we'll put sam up to botherin yer and yer can tackle him to at sight then excuse me boston interrupted tom dosser but you don't hit the mark i'm from vermont myself and deacons there don't fight for the fun of it whatever they may do in the village you hail from then turning to the old man tom asked what part of the old state be you from deacon and what fetched you out from nigh rutland replied the deacon i had a nice little place thar and was doing well but the young one's eyes is bad none of the doctors thereabout could do anything for em took her to boston nobody thar would do anything said some of the european doctors were the only ones that could do the job safely cost money going to europe and paying doctors i couldn't make it to hum in twenty years so i come here only child inquired tom dosser while the boys crowded about the two vermonters and got up a low buzz of sympathetic conversation the old man heard it all and to his lonesome and homesick soul it was so sweet and comforting that it melted his natural reserve and made him anxious to unbosom himself to some one so he answered tom only child of my only daughter father dead inquired tom dosser better be replied the deacon bitterly he left her soon after they were married mean skunk said tom sympathetically i want to judge as i'd be judged replied the deacon but i feel as if i couldn't call that man bad enough names hesby was as good a gal as ever lived but she went to visit some of our folks at burlington and first thing i know she'd writ me she'd met this chap and they'd been married and wanted us to forgive her but he was so good and she loved him so dearly good for the gal said tom and a murmur of approbation ran through the crowd of course we forgave her we'd have done it if she'd married satan himself continued the deacon but we begged her to bring her husband up home and let us look at him whatever was good enough for her to love was good enough for us and we meant to try to love hesby's husband done your credit deacon too declared tom and again the crowd uttered a confirmatory murmur if some folks deacons too was as good but go ahead deacon 
next thing we heard from her he had gone to the place he was raised in but a friend of his who went with him came back and let out he'd got tight and been arrested she rid him right off begging him to come home and go with her up to our place where he could be out of temptation and where she'd love him dearer than ever pure gold by thunder ejaculated tom while a low you bet was heard all over the room tom's eyes were in such a condition that he thought the deacons were misty and the deacon noticed the same peculiarities about tom she never got a word from him continued the deacon but one of her own came back addressed in his writin the infernal scoundrel growled tom while from the rest of the boys escaped epithets which caused the deacon indignant as he was to shiver with horror she was nearly crazy and started to find him but nobody knowed where he was the postmaster said he'd come to the office every day for a fortnight asking for a letter so it must have got hers if all women had such stuff in em sighed tom there'd be one fool less in california excuse me deacon she never give up hopin he'd come back said the deacon in accents that seemed to indicate labored breath and it sometimes seems as if such faith be rewarded by the lord some time or other she teaches pet that's her child to talk about her papa and to kiss his picture and when she and pet goes to sleep his picture's on the pillar between em and the idee that any feller could be mean enough to go back on such a woman deacon i'd track him right through the world and just tell him what you told us if that didn't fetch him i'd consider it a christian duty and privilege to put a hole through him i couldn't do that replied the deacon even if i was a man of blood for hesby loves him and he's pet's dad besides his picter looks like a decent young chap ain't got no hair on his face and looks more like an innocent boy than anything else hesby thinks pet looks like him and i couldn't touch nobody lookin like pet maybe you'd like to see her picter continued the deacon drawing from his pocket an ambrotype which he opened and handed tom looks sweet as a posy said tom regarding it tenderly them little lips of hern look just like a rose when it don't know whether to open a little further or not the deacon looked pleased and extracted another picture and remarked as he handed it to tom that's pet's mother tom took it looked at it and screamed my wife he threw himself on the floor and cried as only a big-hearted man can cry the deacon gazed wildly about and gasped what's his name tell me quick tom dosser answered a dozen or more that's him bless the lord cried the deacon and finding a seat dropped into it and buried his face in his hands for several moments there was a magnificent attempt at silence but it utterly failed the boys saw that the deacon and tom were working a very large claim and to the best of their ability they assisted stumpy flukes under the friendly shelter of the bar was able to fully express his feelings through his eyelids but the remainder of the party by taking turns at staring out the windows and contemplating the bottles behind the bar managed to delude themselves into the belief that their eyes were invisible finally a tom arose deacon boys he said i never got that letter i was afeard she'd hear about my scrape so i wrote her all about it as soon as i got sober and begged her to forgive me and i waited and hoped and prayed for an answer till i growed desperate and came out here she never heerd from you thomas sighed the deacon deacon said tom do you s'pose i'd have carried this for years here he drew out a small miniature of his wife if i hadn't loved her yes and this too continued tom producing a thin package wrapped in oilskin there's the only two letters i ever got from her and just cos her hand writ em i've had em just where i took em from for four years i got em at albany for i got on that cussed tear and they was both so sweet and wifely that i've never dared to read em since for fear that thinkin on what i'd lost would make me even worse than i am but i ain't afeard now said tom eagerly tearing off the oilskin and disclosing two envelopes he opened one took out the letter opened it with trembling hands stared blankly at it and handed it to the deacon thar's my letter now i got em in the wrong envelope 
thomas said the deacon the best thing you can do is to deliver that letter yourself and don't let any grass grow under your feet if you can help it i'm going by the first horse i can steal said tom and tell her i'll be along as soon as i pan out enough continued the deacon and tell her said boston ben that the governor won't be much behind you tell her that when the crowd found out how game the old man was and what was on his mind that the court was so ashamed of hisself that he passed around the hat for pet's benefit and here boston ben thoughtfully weighed the hat in his hands and that the apology's heavy enough to do europe a dozen times i know it for i've had to travel myself occasionally here he deposited the venerable tile with its precious contents on the floor in front of the deacon the old man looked at it and his eyes filled afresh as he exclaimed god bless you i wish i could do something for you in return don't mention it said boston ben unless you uh, you couldn't make up your mind to match with english sam could you come boys interrupted stumpy flukes it's my treat name your medicine fill high all charged now then bottom up to the meanest man at blugsey's that did mean you deacon exclaimed tom but i claim it myself now so i won't drink it the remainder of the crowd clashed glasses while tom and his father-in-law bowed profoundly then the whole crowd went out to steal horses for the two men had them on the trail within an hour as they rode off stumpy flukes remarked there's a splendid shot ruined for life yes said boston ben with a deep sigh struggling out of his manly bosom and a bully wrestler too the church has got a good deal to answer for for spilin that man's chances End of story twenty eight story twenty nine of romance of california life by john haberton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 29. Deacon Barker's Conversion Of the several pillars of the church at Pawkin Center, Deacon Barker was by all odds the strongest. His orthodoxy was the admiration of the entire congregation, and the terror of all the ministers within easy driving distance of the deacon's native village he it was who had argued the late pastor of the pawkin center church into that state of disquietude which had carried him through a few days of delirious fever into the church triumphant and it was also deacon barker whose questions at the examination of seekers for the ex-pastor's shoes had cast such consternation into divinity schools far and near that soon it was very hard to find a candidate for ministerial honors at pawkin centre nor was his faith made manifest by words alone be the weather what it might the deacon was always in his pew both morning and evening in time to join in the first hymn and on every thursday night at a quarter past seven in winter and a quarter before eight in summer the good deacon's cane and shoes could be heard coming solemnly down the aisle bringing to the prayer meeting the champion of orthodoxy nor did the holy air of the prayer meeting even one single evening fail to vibrate to the voice of the deacon as he made in scriptural language humble confessions and tearful pleadings before the throne or still strictly scriptural in expression he warned and exhorted the impenitent the contribution box always received his sixpence as long as specie payment lasted and the smallest fractional currency note thereafter and to each of the regular annual offerings to the missionary cause the bible cause the kindred christian enterprises the deacon regularly contributed his dollar and his prayers the deacon could quote scripture in a manner which put biblical professors to the blush and every principle of his creed so bristled with text confirmatory sustentive and aggressive that doubters were rebuked and freethinkers were speedily reduced to speechless humility or rage but the unregenerate and even some who professed righteousness declared that more fondly than to any other scriptural passage did the good deacon cling to the injunction make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness 
meekly insisting that he was only a steward of the lord he put out his lord's money that he might receive it again with usury and so successful had he been that almost all mortgages held on property near pawkin centre were in the hands of the good deacon and few were the foreclosure sales in which he was not the seller the new pastor at pawkin centre like good pastors everywhere had tortured himself into many a headache over the perplexing question how are we to reach the impenitent in our midst the said impenitent were with but few exceptions industrious honest respectable law-abiding people and the worthy pastor as fully impregnated with yankee thrift as with piety shuddered to think of the waste of souls that was constantly threatening at length like many another pastor he called a meeting of the brethren to prayerfully consider this momentous question the deacon came of course and so did all the other pillars and many of them presented their views brother grave thought the final doom of the impenitent should be more forcibly presented deacon struggs had an abiding conviction that it was the man of sin holding dominion in their hearts that kept these people away from the means of grace deacon ponder mildly suggested that the object might perhaps be attained if those within the fold maintained a more godly walk and conversation but he was promptly though covertly rebuked by the good deacon barker who reminded the brethren that it is the spirit that quickeneth brother flight who hadn't any money thought the church ought to build a working man's chapel but this idea was promptly and vigorously combated by all men of property in the congregation by this time the usual closing hour had arrived and after a benediction the faithful dispersed each with about the ideas he brought to the meeting early next morning the good deacon barker with his mind half full of the state of the unconverted and half of his unfinished cowshed took his stick and hobbled about the village in search of a carpenter to finish the incomplete structure there was moggs but moggs had been busy all the season and it would be just like him to want full price for a day's work stubb was idle but stubb was slow auger auger used liquor and the deacon had long ago firmly resolved that not a cent of his money if he could help it should ever go for the accursed stuff but there was hay he hadn't seen him at work for a long time perhaps he would be anxious enough to work to do it cheaply the deacon knocked at hay's door and hay himself shouted come in how are you george said the deacon looking hastily about the room and delightfully determining from the patient face of sad-eyed mrs hay and the scanty furnishings of the yet uncleared breakfast-table that he had been providentially guided to the right spot how's times with ye not very good deacon replied hay nothing much doin in town money's awful scarce groaned the deacon dreadful responded george devoutly thanking the lord that he owed the deacon nothing got much to do this winter asked the deacon not by a da day's job not a single day sorrowfully replied hay the deacon's pious ear had been shocked by the young man's imperfectly concealed profanity and for an instant he thought of administering a rebuke but the charms of prospective cheap labor lured the good man from the path of rectitude i'm fixin my cow shed might perhaps give you a job on it s'pose you'd do it cheap seein how dull everything is the sad eyes of mrs hay grew bright in an instant her husband's heart jumped up but he knew to whom he was talking so he said as calmly as possible three dollars is regular pay the deacon immediately straightened up as if to go too much said he i'd better hire a common laborer at a dollar and a half and a boss of myself it's only a cow shed you know guess though you won't want the nails druv no less particular will you deacon inquired hay but i tell you what i'll do i'll throw off fifty cents a day two dollars ought to be enough george resumed the deacon carpenterin's pooty work and takes a sight a headpiece sometimes but there's no intellect required to work on a cow shed two dollars and come along 
the carpenter thought bitterly of what a little way the usual three dollars went and of how much would have to be done with what he could get out of the cowshed but the idea of losing even that was too horrible to be endured so he hastily replied two and a quarter and i'm your man well said the deacon it's a powerful price to pay for work on a cowshed but i suppose i must stand it hurry up thar's the mill whistle blowin seven hay snatched his tools kissed a couple of thankful tears out of his wife's eyes and was soon busy on the cowshed with the deacon looking on george said the deacon suddenly causing the carpenter to stop his hammer in mid-air think it over again and say two dollars hay gave the good deacon a withering glance and for a few moments the force of suppressed profanity caused his hammer to bang with unusual vigour while the owner of the cowshed rubbed his hands in ecstasy at the industry of his employee the air was bracing the winter's sun shone brilliantly the deacon's breakfast was digesting fairly and his mind had not yet freed itself from the influences of the sabbath besides he had secured a good workman at a low price and all these influences combined to put the deacon in a pleasant frame of mind he rambled through his mind for a text which would piously express his condition and text brought back sunday and sunday reminded him of the meeting of the night before and here was one of those very men before him a good man in many respects though he was higher priced than he should be how was the cause of the master to be prospered if his servants made no effort then there came to the deacon's mind the passage he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins what particular sins of his own needed hiding the deacon did not find it convenient to remember just then but he meekly admitted to himself and the lord that he had them in a general way then with that directness and grace which were characteristic of him the deacon solemnly said george what is to be the sinner's doom i dunno replied george his wrath still warm pears to me you've left that business till pretty late in life deacon don't trifle with sacred subjects george said the deacon still very solemn and with a suspicion of annoyance in his voice the wicked shall be cast into hell with they can't carry their cowsheds with em neither interrupted george consolingly come george said the good deacon in an appealing tone remember the apostle says suffer the word of exhortation excuse me deacon but one sufferin at a time i ain't through sufferin at bein beaten down yet how about the deacon's not bein given to filthy lucre the good deacon was pained and he was almost out of patience with the apostle for writing things which came so handy to the lips of the unregenerate he commenced an industrious search for a text which should completely annihilate the impious carpenter when that individual interrupted him with out with it deacon you had a meetin last night to see what was to be done with the impenitent i was there that is i sot on a stool just outside the door and i heerd all twas said you didn't agree on nothin maybe you fixed it up since anyhow you sot me down for one o the impenitent and you're goin for me well go on nailin interrupted the economical deacon a little testily the noise don't disturb me i can hear ye well what way am i so much wickeder than you to be you and other folks at the meetin house asked hay george i never saw you in god's house in my life replied the deacon well s'pose you haven't is god so small he can't be nowheres except in your little meetin house how about his seein folks in their closets george said the deacon if you're a prayin man why don't you join yourself to the lord's people why cause the lord's people as you call em don't want me s'pose i was to come to the meetin house in these clothes the only ones i've got do you suppose any of the lord's people's open a pew door for to me and s'pose my wife and children dressed no better than i be but as good i can afford was with me how do you s'pose i'd feel pride goeth before a fall and a haughty spirit before groaned the deacon when the carpenter again interrupted i feel as if the people o god was a gang of insultin hypocrites and as if i didn't ever want to see em again if that kind of pride's sinful the devil's a saint if there's anything wrong about a man's feelin so about himself and them god give him 
God's to blame for it himself, but seein' it's the same feelin' that makes folks keep themselves straight in all other matters, I'll keep on thinkin' it's right. But the privileges of the gospel, George, remonstrated the deacon. Don't you suppose I know what they're worth? continued the carpenter. Haven't I hung around in front of the meetin' house summer nights when the windows was open, just to listen to the singin' and what else I could hear? Hasn't my wife been with me there many a time, and haven't both of us prayed and groaned and cried in our hearts, not only cause we couldn't join in it all ourselves, but cause we couldn't send the children either without their learnin' to hate religion, for they fairly knowed what twas. Haven't I sneaked in to the vestibule winter nights and sought just where I did last night and heard what I'd uh, liked my wife and children to hear and prayed for the time to come when the self-appointed elect shouldn't offend the little ones? And after sitting there last night and coming home and telling my wife how folks was concerned about us and our rejoicing together in the hope that some day our children could have the chances we're shut out of now, who could come along this morning but one of those same holy people and jewed me down on pay that the lord knows is hard enough to live on the deacon had a heart and he knew the nature of self-respect as well as men generally his mind ran entirely outside of text for a few minutes and then with a sigh for the probable expense he remarked reckon flight's notion was right after all there ought to be a workin' man's chapel ort replied hay who'd you suppose go to it nobody you can rent us second-class houses and sell us second-hand clothing and the cheapest cuts of meat but when it comes to cheap religion nobody knows its value better than we do we don't want to go into your parlors on carpets and furniture we don't know how to use and we don't expect to be asked into society where our talk and manners might make some better educated people laugh but when it comes to religion god knows nobody needs and deserves the very best article more'n we do the deacon was a reasonable man and being old was beginning to try to look fairly at matters upon which he expected soon to be very thoroughly examined the indignant protest of the carpenter had he feared a great deal of reason and yet god's people deserved to hold their position if as usual the argument ended where it began so he asked rather triumphantly what is to be done then reform god's people themselves replied the carpenter to the horror of the pious old man when the right hand of fellowship is reached out to the front instead of stuck behind the back when a poor man comes along there'll be plenty that'll be glad to take it reform your own people deacon for you pick out of your eyes the motes we'll be glad enough to get rid of you can get a fine lot of heavy lumber out of your own soldiers of the cross no more than any other soldiers should stand still and be peppered when unable to reply at least so thought the deacon and he prudently withdrew reform god's people themselves the deacon was too old a boy to tell tales out of school but he knew well enough there was room for reform of course there was weren't we all poor sinners when we would do good wasn't evil ever present with us what business had other sinners to complain when they weren't at least any better besides suppose he were to try to reform the ways of brother graves and deacon struggs and others he had in his mind would they rest until they had attempted to reform him and who was to know just what quantity and quality of reform was necessary be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines the matter was too great for his comprehension so he obeyed the injunction commit thy way unto the lord but the lord relegated the entire matter to the deacon hay did a full day's work the deacon made a neat little sum by recovering on an old judgment he had bought for a mere song and the deacon's red cow made an addition to the family in the calf pen yet the deacon was far from comfortable the idea that certain people must stay away from god's house until god's people were reformed seemed to the deacon's really human heart something terrible if they would be so proud and yet people who would stand outside the meetin house and listen and pray and weep because their children were as badly off as they could scarcely be very proud 
he knew there couldn't be many such else this out-of-door congregation would be noticed there certainly wasn't a full congregation of modest mechanics in the vestibule of which hay spoke and yet who could tell how many more were anxious and troubled on the subject of their eternal welfare what a pity it was that those working men who wished to repair to the sanctuary could not have steady work and full pay if he had only known all this early in the morning he did not know but he might have hired him at three dollars though really was a man to blame for doing his best in the labor market you cannot serve god and mammon gracious he could almost declare he heard the excited carpenter's voice delivering that text what had brought that text into his head just now he had never thought of it before the deacon rolled and tossed on his bed and the subject of his conversation with the carpenter tormented him so he could not sleep of one thing he was certain and that was that the reform of the church at pawkin centre was not to be relied on in an extremity and was not such hungering and thirsting after righteousness an extreme case had he ever really known many such if hay only had means the problem would afford its own solution the good deacon solemnly declared to himself that if hay could give good security he the deacon would try to lend him the money but even this to the deacon extraordinary concession was unproductive of sleep he that giveth to the poor lendeth to the lord there he could hear that indignant carpenter again what an unsatisfactory passage that was to be sure if it would only read the other way it didn't seem a bit business-like the way it stood and yet as the deacon questioned himself there in the dark he was forced to admit that he had a very small balance even of loans to his credit in the hands of the lord he had never lent to the lord except in his usual business manner as small a loan as would be accepted on as extensive collaterals as he could exact oh why did people ever forsake the simple raiment of their forefathers and robe themselves in garments grievous in price and stumbling blocks in the path of their fellow-men but sleep failed even to follow this pious reflection suppose only suppose of course that he were to give uh, lend that is lend hay money enough to dress his family fit for church think what a terrible lot of money it would take a common neat suit for a man would cost at least thirty dollars an overcoat nearly twice as much a suit cloak and other necessities for his wife would amount to as much more and the children oh the thing couldn't be done for less than two hundred and fifty dollars of course it was entirely out of the question he had only wondered what it would cost that was all still no sleep he wished he hadn't spoken with hay about his soul next time he would mind his own business he wished he hadn't employed hay he wished the meeting for consideration of the needs of the impenitent had never taken place no man can come to me except the father which sent me draw him he wished he had remembered that passage and quoted it at the meeting it was no light matter to interfere with the almighty's plans blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy ha ah, could that carpenter be in the room disarranging his train of thought with such such tantalizing text they had kept him awake and at his time of life a restless night was a serious matter suppose very early the next morning the village doctor returning from a patient's bedside met the deacon with a face which suggested to him the doctor was pious and imaginative abraham on mount moriah the village butcher more practical hailed the good man and informed him he was in time for a fine steak but the deacon shook his head in agony and passed on he neared the carpenter's house stopped tottered and looked over his shoulder as if intending to run at length he made his way behind the house where hay was chopping firewood the carpenter saw him and turned pale he feared the deacon had found cheaper labor and had come to give him warning george said the deacon i've been doing a heap of thinking about what we talked of yesterday i've come to say that if you like i'll lend you three hundred dollars for as long as you've a mind to without note security or interest 
you to spend as much of it as you need to dress you and your whole family in sunday clothes and to put the balance in the savings bank at interest to go on doing the same with when necessary and all of you go to church when you feel so disposed and if nobody else's pew door opens you're always welcome to mine and may the lord the deacon finished the sentence to himself have mercy on my soul then he said aloud that's all the carpenter at the beginning of the deacon's speech had dropped his axe to the imminent danger of one of his feet as the deacon continued the carpenter dropped his head to one side raised one eyebrow inquiringly and awaited the conditions but when the deacon said that's all george hay seized the deacon's hard old hand gave it a grasp which brought agonized tears to the eyes of its venerable owner and exclaimed deacon god's people are reformin the deacon staggered a little he had not thought of it in that light before deacon that money'll do more good than all the prayers you ever done excuse me i must tell mary and the carpenter dashed into the house had mrs hay respected the dramatic proprieties she would have made the deacon a neat speech but the truth is she regarded him from behind the window blind and wiped her eyes with the corner of her apron seeing which the deacon abruptly started for home making less use of his cane than he had done in any day for years it is uh, grievous to relate but truth is mighty that within a fortnight the good deacon repented of his generous action at least fifty times he would die in the poorhouse if he were so extravagant again three hundred dollars was more than the cowshed lumber shingles nails labor and all would cost suppose hay should take the money and go west suppose he should take to drinking and spend it all for liquor one suspicion after another tortured the poor man until he grew thin and nervous but on the second sunday having satisfied himself that hay was in town sober the day before that he had been to the city and brought back bundles and that he the deacon had seldom been in the street without meeting one of hay's children with a paper of hooks and eyes or a spool of thread the deacon stationed himself in one of his own front windows and brought his spectacles to bear on hay's door a little distance off the first bell had rung apparently hours before yet no one appeared could it be that he had basely sneaked to the city at night and pawned everything no the door opened there they came it couldn't be yes it was well he never imagined hay and his wife were so fine a looking couple they came nearer and the deacon forgetting his cane hobbled hurriedly to church entered his pew and left the door wide open he waited long it seemed to him but they did not come he looked around impatiently and there oh joy and wonder the president of the pawkin savings institution had invited the whole family into his pew just then the congregation rose to sing the hymn commencing from all that dwell below the skies let the creator's praise arise and the deacon in his excitement distanced the choir and the organ and the congregation and almost brought the entire musical service to a standstill the deacon had intended to watch closely for hay's conversion but something wonderful prevented it was reported everywhere that the deacon himself had been converted and all who now saw the deacon fully believed the report he was even heard to say that as there seemed to be some doubt as to whether faith or works was the saving virtue he intended thereafter to practise both he no longer mentions the poor house as his prospective dwelling but is heard to say that in his father's house there are many mansions and that he is laying up his treasure in heaven as fast as possible and hopes he may get it all on the way there before his heart is called for at the post office the tin shop and the rum shop the deacon's conversion is constantly discussed and men of all degrees now express a belief in the almighty power of the spirit from on high other moneyed men have been smitten and changed and the pastor of the pawkin centre church daily thanks the lord for such a revival as he never heard of before End of story twenty nine
Story thirty of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story thirty Joe Gatter's Life Insurance. Good, he was the model boy of Bungfield. While his idle schoolmates were flying kites and playing marbles, the prudent Joseph was trading Sunday school tickets for strawberries and eggs, which he converted into currency of the Republic as he grew up and his old schoolmates purchased cravats and hair oil at squire tacky's store it was the industrious joseph who stood behind the counter wrapped up their purchases and took their money when the same boys stood on the street corners and cast sheep's eyes at the girls the business-like joseph stood in the store door and contemplated these same boys with eyes such as a hungry cat casts upon a brood of young birds who he expects to eat when they grow older joe never wasted any time at parties he never wore fine clothing he never drank nor smoked in short joe was so industrious that by the time he reached his majority he had a thousand dollars in the bank and not a solitary virtue in his heart for joe's money good squire tacky had an earnest longing and soon had it to his own credit while the sign over the store door read tacky gatter then the squire wanted joe's soul too and so earnest was he that joe soon found it necessary to remonstrate with his partner twon't do squire said he religion's all very well in its place but when a man loses the sale of a dozen eggs profit seven cents because his partner is talking religion with him so hard that a customer gets tired of waiting and goes somewhere else then religion's out of place the human soul's of more consequence than many eggs joseph argued the squire that's just it replied joe money don't hit the value of the soul anyway and there's no use trying to mix em and while we're talkin don't you think we might be mixin some of the settings of the molasses barrel with the brown sugar twill make it way better the squire sighed but he could not help admitting that joe was as good a partner as a man could want in one of joe's leisure moments it struck him that if he were to die nobody would lose a cent by the operation the idea was too exasperating and soon the local agents of noted insurance companies ceased to enjoy that tranquillity which is characteristic of business men in the country within a fortnight two of the agents were arraigned before their respective churches for profane brawling while joe had squeezed certain agents into dividing commissions to the lowest unit of divisibility and had several policies in the safe at the store the squire his partner was agent for the pantagonian mutual and endured his full share of the general agony joe had caused but when he had handed joe a policy and receipt and taken the money and counted it twice and seen to it carefully that all the bills were good the good squire took his revenge joseph said he you ain't through with insurance yet you need to insure your soul against risk in the next world and there's only one agent that does it the junior partner stretched himself on the counter and groaned he knew the squire was right he had heard that same story from every minister he had ever heard joe was so agitated that he charged at twelve and a half cents some calico he had sold at fifteen only one agent but the shrewd joseph rejoiced to think that those who represented the great agent differed greatly in the conditions of the insurance and that some made more favourable terms than others and that if he could get the ministers thoroughly interested in him he would have a good opportunity for comparing rates the good men all wanted joe for he was a rising young man and could if the spirit moved him make handsome subscriptions to good purposes so in their zeal they soon regarded each other with jealous eyes and reduced their respective creeds to gossamer thinness they agreed about grace being free and joe accepted that much promptly as he did anything which could be had without price but joe was a practical man and though he found fault with none of the doctrines talked at him he yet hesitated to attach himself to any particular congregation 
he finally ascertained that the rev barzillai driftwood's church had no debt and that its contributions to missions and other religious purposes were very small so joe allowed himself to be gathered into the fine assortment of crooked sticks which the rev barzillai driftwood was reserving unto the day of burning great was the rejoicing of the congregation at joe's saving act and sincere was the sorrow of the other churches who knew their own creeds were less shaky but in the saloon and on the street joe's religious act was discussed exclusively on its merits and the results were such as only special spiritual labor would remove for no special change was noticeable in joe on sunday he abjured the world but on monday he made things uncomfortable for the widow mcnilty whose husband had died in the debt of tacky gatter a customer bought some gingham on joe's assurance that the colors were fast but the first wash day failed to confirm joe's statement the proprietor of the stage line between bungfield and Clepus valley traded horses with joe and was afterward heard mentioning his new property in language far more scriptural than proper still joe was a church member and that was a patent of respectability and as he gained years and building lots and horses and uh, commenced discounting notes his respectability grew and waxed great in the minds of the practical people of bungfield even good women real mothers in israel could not help thinking as they sorrowed over the sand in the bottoms of their coffee cups and grew wrathful at runny flour bought for a one superfine of tacky gadder that joe would make a valuable husband so thought some of the ladies of bungfield and as young ladies who can endure the idea of such a man for perpetual partner can also signify their opinions joe began to comprehend that he was in active demand he regarded the matter as he would a sudden demand for any commodity of trade and by skilfully manipulating the market he was soon enabled to choose from a full supply thenceforward joe was as happy as a man of his nature could be all his investments were paying well the store was prosperous he was successful in all his trading enterprises he had purchased at fearful shaves scores of perfectly good notes he realized on loans interest which would cause a usury law to shrivel and crack his insurance policies brought him fair dividends and his wife kept house with economy and thrift but the church the church seemed an unmitigated drag joe attended all the church meetings determined to get the worth of the money he was compelled to contribute to the current expenses he had himself appointed treasurer so he could get the use of the church money but the interest even at the rates joe generally obtained did not balance the amount of his contribution joe worried over the matter until he became very peevish yet he came no nearer a business-like adjustment of receipts and expenditures one day when his venerable partner presented him a certificate of dividend from the pantagonian mutual joe remarked never got any dividends on that other insurance you put me up to taking partner that gainst fire risks in the next world you know twill be tough if there's any mistakes church does take a side of money joseph said the squire in a sorrowful tone i've always been afeard they didn't look enough into your evidences when they took you into that church how can a man expect to escape on the day of wrath if he's all the time grumbling at the cost of his salvation mistake if you don't know in your heart the truth of what you profess there's mighty little hope for you church or no church no in my heart cried joe that's a pretty kind of security is that what i've been paying church dues for better have known it in my heart in the first place and saved the money what's the use of believing all these naughty points if they don't make a sure thing for a man if your belief don't make you any better or happier joseph rejoined the squire you'd better look again and see if you've got a good hold of it those that's got a clear title don't find their investment as slow in making returns while those that find fault are generally the ones that made a mistake poor joe he thought he had settled this whole matter but now if his partner was right he was worse off than if he hadn't begun 
he believed in justification by faith now wasn't his faith strong first class he might say to be sure of being safe hadn't he believed everything that all the ministers had insisted upon as essential and what was faith if it wasn't believing he would ask his partner the old man had got him into this scrape now he must see him through squire said he isn't faith the same thing as believing well said the squire adjusting his glasses and taking from the desk the little testament upon which he administered oaths that depends on how you believe here's a verse on the subject thou believest in god thou doest well the devils also believe and tremble ugh joe shivered he wasn't an aristocrat but would one fancy such companionship as the squire referred to here said the squire turning the leaves is another passage barren on the subject o generation of vipers who hath warned you to escape from the wrath to come bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance vipers joe uncomfortably wondered who else the squire was going to introduce into the brotherhood of the faith now see what it says in another place continued the squire not every one that saith unto me lord lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my father which is in heaven yes said joe grateful for hearing of no more horrible believers but what is his will but believing on him don't the bible say that they that believe shall be saved joseph said the squire when you believed in my store you put in your time and money there when you believed in hostraden you devoted yourself to practice in it when you believed life insurance was a good thing you took out policies and paid for them though you have complained of the patagonian dividends now if you do believe in god what have you done to prove it i paid over a hundred dollars a year church dues said joe wrathfully not counting subscriptions to a bell and a new organ that wasn't for god joseph said the squire twas all for you god never will thank you for running an asylum for paupers fit to work you'll find in the twenty-fifth chapter of matthew a description of those that's going into the kingdom of heaven they're the people that give food and clothing to the needy and that visit the sick and prisoners while those that don't do these things don't go in to put it mildly he don't say a word about belief there joseph for he knows that giving away property don't happen till a man's belief is pretty strong joe felt troubled could it really be that his eternal insurance was going to cost more money joe thought enviously of colonel bung president of the bungfield railroad company the colonel didn't believe in anything so he saved all his money and joe wished he had some of the colonel's courage joe's meditations were interrupted by the entrance of sam ottry a poor fellow who owed joe some money joe had lent sam a hundred dollars discounted ten per cent for ninety days and secured by a chattel mortgage on sam's horse and wagon but sam had been sick during most of the ninety days and when he went to joe to beg a few days of grace that exemplary business man insisted upon immediate payment it was easy to see by sam's hopeless eye and strained features that he had not come to pay he was staring ruin in the face and felt as uncomfortable as if the amount were millions instead of a horse and wagon his only means of support as for joe he had got that hundred dollars and horse and wagon mixed up in the oddest way with what he and his partner had been talking about it was utterly unbusinesslike he knew it he tried to make business business and religion religion but try as he might he could not succeed joe thought briskly he determined to try an experiment sam said he got the money no sam replied luck's agin me i've got to stand it i s'pose sam said joe i'll give you all the time you need at legal interest sam was not such a young man as sentimental people would select to try good deeds upon but he was human and loved his wife and children and the sudden relief he felt caused him to look at joe in a manner which made joe find a couple of entire strangers in his own eyes he hurried into the little office and when his partner looked up inquiringly joe replied i've got a dividend squire one of those we were talking about 
how's that asked the old man while joe commenced writing rapidly i'll show you said joe handing the squire the paper on which he had just put in writing his promise to sam joseph said the squire after reading the paper several times to assure himself that his eyes did not deceive him it beats the widow's mites she gave the lord all she had but you've given him more than you ever had in all your life until to-day joe handed sam the paper and it was to the teamster the strongest evidence of christianity he had ever seen in bungfield he had known of some hard cases turning from the saloon and joining the church but none of these things were so wonderful as this action of joe gatter's sam told the story in strict confidence to each of his friends and the good seed was thus sown in soil that it had never reached before it would be pleasant to relate that joe forthwith ceased shaving notes and selling antiquated grease for butter and that he devoted the rest of his days and money to good deeds but it wouldn't be true those of our readers who have always consistently acted according to their own light and knowledge are of course entitled to throw stones at joe gatter but most of us know to our sorrow why he didn't always act according to the good promptings he received our only remaining duty is to say that when thereafter joe's dividends came seldom he knew who to blame End of story thirty story thirty one of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirty one the temperance meeting at backley loud and long rang the single church bell at backley but its industry was entirely unnecessary for the single church at backley was already full from the altar to the doors and the window-sills and altar steps were crowded with children the backleyites had been before to the regular yearly temperance meetings and knew too well the relative merits of sitting and standing to wait until called by the bell of course no one could afford to be absent for entertainments were entirely infrequent at backley the populace was too small to support a course of lectures and too moral to give any encouragement to circuses and minstrel troops but a temperance meeting was both moral and cheap and the children might all be taken without extra cost for months all the young men and maidens at backley had been practising the choruses of the songs which the temperance glee club at a neighbouring town was to sing at the meeting for weeks had large posters printed in the reddest of ink announced to the surrounding country that the parent society would send to backley for this special occasion one of its most brilliant orators and although the pastor made the statement in the smallest possible type that at the close of the entertainment a collection would be taken to defray expenses of the lecturer the sorrowing ones took comfort in the fact that certain fractional currency represented but a small amount of money the bell ceased ringing and the crowd at the door attempted to squeeze into the aisles the backley cornet quartet played a stirring air squire breet called the meeting to order and was himself elected permanent chairman the rev mr genial prayed earnestly that intemperance might cease to reign the glee club sang several songs with rousing choruses a pretended drunkard and a cold-water advocate both pupils of the backley high school delivered a dialogue in which the pretended drunkard was handled severely a tableau of the drunkard's home was given and then the parent society's brilliant orator took the platform the orator was certainly very well informed logical and convincing besides being quite witty he proved to the satisfaction of all present that alcohol was not nutritious that it awakened a general and unhealthy physical excitement and that it hardened the tissues of the brain he proved by reports of analyses that adulteration and with harmful materials was largely practised he quoted from reports of police prison and almshouse authorities to prove his statement that alcohol made most of our criminals 
he unrolled a formidable array of statistics and showed how many loaves of bread could be bought with the money expended in the united states for intoxicating liquors how many comfortable houses the same money would build how many schools it would support and how soon it would pay the national debt then he drew a moving picture of the sorrow of the drunkard's family and the awfulness of the drunkard's death and sat down amid a perfect thunder of applause the faithful beamed upon each other with glowing and expressive countenances the cornet quartet played don't you go tommy the smallest young lady sang father dear father come home with me now and then squire breet the chairman announced that the meeting was open for remarks a derisive laugh from some of the half-grown boys and a titter from some of the misses attracted the attention of the audience and looking round they saw joe digg standing up in a pew near the door put him out it's a shame disgraceful were some of the cries which were heard in the room mr digg is a citizen of backley said the chairman rapping vigorously to call the audience to order and though not a member of the association he is entitled to a hearing thank you mr chairman said joe digg when quiet was restored your words are the first respectful ones i've ever heard in backley and i do assure you i appreciate em but i want the audience to understand i ain't drunk i haven't had a cent for two days and nobody's treated me by this time the audience was very quiet but in a delicious fever of excitement a drunkard speaking right out in a temperance meeting they had never heard of such a thing in their lives verily backley was going to add one to the roll of modest villages made famous by unusual occurrences i s'pose mr chairman continued joe digg that the pint of temperance meetings is to stop drunkenness and as i'm about the only fully developed drunkard in town i'm most likely to know what this meetin's mounted to squire breed inclined his head slightly as if to admit the correctness of joe diggs's position i believe every word the gentleman has said continued the drunkard and here he paused long enough to let an excitable member exclaim bless the lord and burst into tears and he could have put it all a good deal stronger without stretching the truth and the sorrer of a drunkard's home can be talked about till the dictionary runs dry and then you don't know nothing about it but ain't none of you ever laughed about locking the stable door after the hoss is stolen that's just what this temperance meeting and all the others comes to a general and rather indignant murmur of dissent ran through the audience you don't believe it continued joe digg but i've been a drunkard and i'm one yet and you all got sense enough to understand that i ought to know best about it will the gentleman have the kindness to explain asked the lecturer i'm a-comin to it sir if my head'll see me through replied the drunkard you folks all believe that it's lovin liquor that makes men drink it now tain't no such thing i never had a chance to taste fancy drinks but i know that every kind of liquor i ever got a hold of was more like medicine than anything nice then what do they drink for demanded the excitable member i'll tell you said joe if you'll have a little patience i have to do it in my own way for i ain't used to public speaking you all know who i am my father was a church member and so was mother father done day's work for a dollar and a quarter a day how much firewood and clothes and food do you suppose that money could pay for we had to eat what come cheapest and when some of the women here was a sittin comfortable o nights a knittin and a sewin and a readin mother was hangin round the butcher shop tryin to beat the butcher down on the scraps that wasn't good enough for you folks soon as we young uns was big enough to do anything we was put to work i've worked for men in this room twelve and fourteen hours a day i don't blame em they didn't mean nothin out of the way they worked just as long themselves as did their boys but they allers had somethin inside to keep em up and i didn't does anybody wonder that when i harvested with some men that kept liquor in the field and found how it helped me along that i took it and thought twas a regular god's blessin and when i found twas a hurtin me how was i to go to work and give it up when it stood me instead of the eatables i didn't have and never had neither you should have prayed cried old deacon towser springing to his feet prayed long and earnest 
deacon said joe digg i've heerd o' your dyspepsia for nigh on to twenty years did prayin ever comfort your stomach the whole audience indulged in a profane laugh and the good deacon was suddenly hauled down by his wife the drunkard continued there's a lot of jest such folks here in beckley and everywheres else people that don't get half fed and do get worked half to death nobody means to abuse em but they do have a hard time of it and whiskey's the best friend they've got i work my men from sunrise to sunset in summer myself said deacon towser jumping up again and i'm the first man in the field and the last man to quit but i don't drink no liquor and my boys don't neither but you don't start in the morning with hungry little faces a haunting you you don't take the dry crust to the field for your own dinner and leave the meat and butter at home for the wife and young uns and you go home without being afeard to see a half-fed wife dragging herself round among a lot of puny young uns that don't know what's the matter with em jesus christ hisself broke down when it come to the cross deacon and poor human beings sometimes reaches a pint where they can't stand no more and when it's wife and children that brings it on it gets a man awful the gentleman is right i have no doubt said the chairman so far as a limited class is concerned but of course no such line of argument applies to the majority of cases there are plenty of well-fed healthy and lazy young men hanging about the tavern in this very village i know it said joe digg and i want to talk about them too i don't want to take up all the time of this meetin but you'll all allow i know more about that tavern than anybody else does there's lots of young men a hangin around it and why cause it's made pleasant for em and it's the only place in town that is i've been a faithful attendant at that tavern for nigh on to twenty years and i never knowed a hanger on there that had a comfortable home of his own some of em that don't have to go to bed a-hungry have scoldin or squabblin parents and they can't go a-visitin and hear fine music and see nice things of every sort to take their minds off as some young men in this meetin house can but the tavern is allus comfortable and there's generally somebody to sing a song and tell a joke and they commence goin there more for a pleasant time than for a drink at first there's lots of likely boys goin there that i wish to god ud stay away and i've often felt like tellin em so but what's the use where are they to go to they ought to flee from even the appearance of evil said deacon towser but where be they to flee to deacon persisted joe digg would you like em to come a visit into your house they can come to the church meetins replied the deacon there's two in the week besides sundays and some of em's precious seasons all of em's an improvement on the wicked tavern ligion don't taste no better than whiskey till you get used to it said the drunkard horrifying all the orthodox people at backley and tain't made half so invitin tain't long ago i heerd you tellin another deacon that the church members ought to be ashamed of themselves cause scarcely any of em come to the week evenin meetins so you can't blame the boys at the tavern does the gentleman mean to convey the idea that all drunkards become so from justifying causes asked the lecturer no sir replied joe digg but i do mean to say that after you leave out them that takes liquor to help em do a full day's work and them that commence drinkin cause they're at the tavern and ain't got nowhere else to go you've made a mighty big hole in the crowd of drinkin men bigger and temperance meetings ever began to make it but how are they to be left out asked the lecturer by temperance folks doing something besides talkin replied the drunkard for twenty years i've been lectured and scolded and some good men's come to me with tears in their eyes and put their arms round my neck and beg me to stop drinkin and i've wanted to and tried to but when all the encouragement a man gets is in words and no matter how he commence drinkin now every bone and muscle in him is a beggin for drink as soon as he leaves off and his mind's dull and he ain't fit for much and needs taken care of as particular as a mighty sick man talks just as good as wasted there's been times when if i'd been ahead on flour and meat and such i could a stopped drinkin but when a man's hungry and ragged and weak and half crazy knowin how his family's fixed and he can't do nothin for em and then don't get nothin but words to reform on he'll go back to the tavern every time and he'll drink till he's comfortable and till he forgets 
i want the people here one and all to understand that though i'm past helpin now there's been fifty times in the past twenty years when i might had been stopped short if anybody had been sensible enough and good-hearted enough to give me a lift joe diggs sat down and there was a long pause the chairman whispered to the leader of the glee club and the club sang a song but somehow it failed to awaken the usual enthusiasm after the singing had ended the chairman himself took the floor and moved the appointment of a permanent committee to look after the intemperate and to collect funds when the use of money seemed necessary and the village doctor created a sensation by moving that mr joe digg should be a member of the committee deacon towser who was the richest man in the village and who dreaded subscription papers started an insidious opposition by eloquently vaunting the value of earnest prayer and of determined will in such cases but the new member of the committee though manifestly out of order outmanoeuvred the deacon by accepting both amendments and remarking that in a hard-fought fight folks would take all the help they could get somehow as soon as the new committee determining to open a place of entertainment in opposition to the tavern and furnish it pleasantly and make it an attractive gathering place for young men asked for contributions to enable them to do it the temperance excitement at backley abated marvellously but squire breet and the doctor and several other enterprising men took the entire burden on their own shoulders or pockets and joe digg was as useful as a reformed thief to a police department for the doctor whose professional education had left him a large portion of his natural common sense in working order took a practical interest in the old drunkard's case and others of the committee looked to the necessities of his family and it came to pass that joe was one of the earliest of the reformers men still go to the tavern at backley but as even when the twelve spake with inspired tongues some people remained impenitent the temperance men at backley feel that they have great cause for encouragement and that they have at least accomplished more within a few months than did all the temperance meetings ever held in their village End of story thirty one Story thirty two of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story thirty two Jude. Gopher Hill had determined that it could not endure Jude any longer. The inhabitants of Gopher Hill possessed an unusual amount of kindness and long suffering, as was proved by the fact that Chinamen were allowed to work all abandoned claims at the hill had further proof been necessary it would have been afforded by the existence of a church directly beside the saloon although the frequenters of the sacred edifice had often during week evening meetings annoyed convivial souls in the saloon by requesting them to be less noisy but jude was too much for gopher hill no one molested him when he first appeared but each citizen entered a mental protest within his own individual consciousness for jude had a bad reputation in most of the settlements along spanish creek it was not that he had killed his man and stolen several horses and mules and got himself into a state of most disorderly inebriation for in the opinion of many gopher hillites these actions might have been the visible results of certain virtuous conditions of mind but jude had after killing a man spent the victim's money he had stolen from men who had befriended him he had jumped claims he had denied his score at the storekeepers he had lied on all possible occasions and had gambled away money which had been confided to him in trust one mining camp after another had become too hot for him but he never adopted a new set of principles when he staked a new claim so his stay in new localities was never of sufficient length to establish the fact of legal residence his name seemed to be a respectable cognomen of scriptural extraction but it was really a contraction of a name which while equally scriptural and far more famous was decidedly unpopular the name of judas iscariot 
the whole name had been originally bestowed upon jude in recognition of his success in swindling a mining partner but with an acuteness of perception worthy of emulation the miners determined that the length of the appellation detracted from its force so they shortened it to jude as a few of the more enterprising citizens of gopher hill were one morning discussing the desirableness of getting rid of jude and wondering how best to effect such a result they received important foreign aid a man rode up to the saloon dismounted and tacked on the wall a poster offering one thousand dollars reward for the apprehension of a certain person who had committed an atrocious murder a month before at duck run the names and aliases of the guilty person were unfamiliar to those who gathered about the poster but the description of the murderer's appearance was so suggestive that squire bogern one of the bystanders found jude and requested him to read the poster well twasn't me done it sulkily growled the namesake of the apostolic treasurer there ain't nobody in gopher that'd take a feller up for a reward replied the squire studiously oblivious of jude's denial but it's a nice mornin for a walk you can't miss the trail and get lost you know and seein you haven't staked any claim and so hain't got any to dispose of maybe yer could get inside of five minutes jude was accustomed to notices to quit and was able to extract their import from any verbiage whatever so he drank by and to himself and immediately sauntered out of town with an air of bravado in his carriage and a very lonesome look on his face down the trail he tramped past claims whose occupants knew him well enough but who just as he passed found some excuse for looking the other way he passed through one camp after another and discovered for he stopped at each saloon that the man on horseback had preceded him and that there seemed a wonderful unanimity of opinion as to the identity of the man who was wanted finally after passing through several of the small camps which were dotted along the trail a mile or two apart jude flung himself on the ground under a clump of azaleas with the air of a man whose temper had been somewhat ruffled i wonder he remarked after a discursive fitful but very spicy preface of ten minutes duration why they couldn't find something i had done instead of tucking some other fellow's job on me i have had difficulties but this here one's just one more than i knows on like nuff some galoot'll be mean nuff to try to git that thousand i'd try it myself if i was only somebody else wonder why i can't be decent like other fellers twon't pay to waste time thinkin about that though for i'll have to make a livin somehow jude indulged in a long sigh perhaps a penitential one and drew from his pocket a well-filled flask which he had purchased at the last saloon he had passed as he extracted it there came also from his pocket a copy of the poster which he had abstracted from a tree en route thar tis again he exclaimed angrily can't be satisfied showing itself everywhere but must come out of my pocket without being axed let's see perhaps i don't mean me after all one eye gone broken nose scar on right cheek powder marks on left stumpy beard sallow complexion hang-dog look i'd give a thousand if i had it to get the feller that writ that and yet it means me and no dodgin lord lord what did the old woman say if she was to see me nowadays he looked intently at the flask for a moment or two as if expecting an answer therefrom then he extracted the cork and took a generous drink but even the liquor failed to help him to a more cheerful view of the situation for he continued nobody knows me nobody says hello nobody asks me to name my bidders nobody even cusses me they let me stake a claim but nobody offers to lend me a pick or a shovel and nobody ever comes to the shanty to spend the evenin less it's a greenhorn curse em all i'll make some of em bleed for it i'll get their dust and go back east there's plenty of folks thar that'll be glad to see me if i've got the dust and maybe twould comfort the old woman some after all the trouble i've made her 
offer rewards for me do they i'll give em some reason to do it i ain't afeard of the hull state of californy and good lord what's that the gentleman who was not afraid of the whole state of california sprang hastily to his feet turned very pale and felt for his revolver for he heard rapid footsteps approaching by a little path in the bushes but though the footsteps seemed to come nearer and very rapidly he slowly took his hand from his pistol and changed his scared look for a puzzled one cryin reckon i ain't in danger from anybody that's bellerin but it's the fust time i've heerd that kind of a noise in these spots must be a woman sounds like what i used to hear to home when i got on a tear tis a woman as he concluded there emerged from the path a woman who was neither very young nor very pretty but her face was full of pain and her eyes full of tears which signs of sorrow were augmented by a considerable scare as she suddenly found herself face to face with the unhandsome jude don't be afeard of me marm said jude as the woman retreated a step or two i'm durn sorry for you whatever's the matter i've got a wife to home and it makes me so sorry to hear her cry that i get blind drunk as quick as i can this tender statement seemed to reassure the woman for she looked inquiringly at jude and asked have you seen a man and woman go long with a young un nary replied jude young one lost yes exclaimed the woman commencing to cry again and a husband too i don't care much for him for he's a brute but johnny blessed little johnny oh oh and the poor woman sobbed pitifully jude looked uneasy and remembering his antidote for domestic tears extracted the bottle again he slowly put it back untasted however and exclaimed what does he look like marm the husband i mean i never wanted an excuse to put a hole through a feller as bad as i do this morning don't oh don't hurt him for god's sake cried the woman he ain't a good husband he's run off with another woman but but he's johnny's father yet if you could get johnny back he's the only comfort i ever had in the world the dear little fellow oh dear me and again she sobbed as if her heart was broken tell us about em where have they gone to what do they look like maybe i can get em for you said jude looking as if inclined to beat a retreat or do anything to get away from the sound of the woman's crying get him get johnny cried the woman falling on her knees and seizing jude's hand i can't give you anything for doing that but i'll pray for you as long as i've got breath that god may reward you i reckon said jude as he awkwardly disengaged his hand that prayin is what'll do me more good than anything else just now big feller is your husband and got any idee whar he is he is a big man replied the woman and he goes by the name of marksy in these parts and you'll find him at the widow beckles across the creek kill her if you like i hope somebody will but johnny johnny has got the loveliest brown eyes and the sweetest mouth that was ever made and oh reckon i'll judge for myself interrupted jude starting off toward the creek and followed by the woman i know whar widder beckles is and and i've got enough stealin i guess to be able to grab a little boy without gettin catched spanish crick's pretty deep along here and the current runs heavy but the remainder of jude's sentence was left unspoken for just then he stepped into the creek and the chill of the snow-fed stream caused him to hold his breath remember you ain't to hurt him screamed the woman nor her either god forgive me but bring johnny bring johnny and god be with you the woman stood with clasped hands watching jude until he reached the opposite bank shook himself and disappeared and then she leaned against a tree and trembled and cried until she was startled by hearing someone say i beg pardon ma'am but have you seen any one pass the woman raised her head and saw a respectable severe-looking man in clothing rather neater than was common along spanish creek only one she replied and he's the best man livin he's gone to get johnny he won't be gone long your husband ma'am oh no sir i never saw him before one eye gone broken nose scar on the right cheek powder marks on the oh yes sir that's the man said the wondering woman perhaps you may not have seen this said the man handing her one of the posters describing jude then he uttered a shrill whistle 
the woman read the paper through and cried it's somebody else it must be no murderer would be so kind to a poor friendless woman oh god have i betrayed him don't take him sir it must be somebody else i wish i had money i would pay you more than the reward just to go away and let him alone madam replied the man beckoning to two men who were approaching i could not accept it nor will i accept the reward it is the price of blood but i am a minister of the gospel ma'am and in this godless generation it is my duty to see that the outraged dignity of the law is vindicated my associates i regret to say are actuated by different motives you just bet high on that exclaimed one of the two men who had approached a low-browed bestial ruffian half a thousand's more than i could pan out in a fortnight no matter how good luck i had parson he is a fool but we ain't no right to grumble about it seeing we get his share eh parley vous you speak truly mike replied his companion a rather handsome-looking frenchman of middle age and yet jean glurier likes not the labour why not that he had lost his last ounce at monte and had the fever for play still in his blood not one sou would he earn in such ungentle a manner god's worst curses on all of you cried the woman with an energy which inspired her plain face and form with a terrible dignity and power if you lay a hand on a man who is the only friend a poor woman has ever found in the world glorieur shuddered and mike receded a step or two but the ex-minister maintained the most perfect composure and exclaimed poor fools it is written the curse causeless shall not fall and yet madam i assure you that i most tenderly sympathize with you in your misfortunes whatever they may be then let him alone cried the woman my only child has been stolen away from me dear little johnny and the man offered to go get him and you've made me betray him oh god curse you all madam replied the still imperturbable parson the crime of blood guiltiness cannot be imputed to you for you did not know what you were doing the woman leaned against a tree and waited until glorieux declared to the parson he would abandon the chase it is useless said he striking a dramatic attitude and pointing to the woman for her tears have quenched the fiery fever in the blood of glorieux then i'll get the whole thousand growled mike and i'll need it too if i've got to stand this sort of thing much longer a confused sound of voices on the other side of the creek attracted the attention of the men and caused the woman to raise her head a moment later jude appeared with a child in his arms and plunged into the water now we'll have him cried the parson and you madam will have your child be ready to chase him in if he attempts to run when he gets ashore go back go back screamed the woman they are after you these men try to the law-abiding parson placed his hand over the woman's mouth but found himself promptly flying backward through space while mike roared touch a woman will you no thousand dollars nor any other money'll hire me to travel with such a scoundrel catch him yourself if you want to but if you do said glorier politely as he drew his revolver it will be necessary for glorier to slay the lord's anointed follered by thunder said mike it was true during the few seconds which had been consumed in conversation jude got well into the creek he had not seemed to hear the woman's warning but now a greater danger threatened him for on the opposite bank of the creek there appeared a man who commenced firing at jude's head and the small portion of his shoulders that was visible the monster oh the wretch screamed the woman he may hit johnny his only son oh god have mercy on me and save my child a shot immediately behind her followed the woman's prayer and glorier exclaimed pointing to the opposite bank where marxy was staggering and falling glorier gathered from your words that a divorce would be acceptable madam uh, behold you have it pity nobody didn't think of it sooner observed mike shading his eyes as he stared intently at jude for there's a red streak in the water right behind him the woman was already standing at the water's edge with hands clasped in an agony of terror and anxiety the three men hastened to join her wish i could swim said mike for he's getting weak and needs help 
the parson sprang into the water and in spite of the chill and the swift current he was soon by jude's side take the young un gasped jude for i'm a goner put your hand on my shoulder said the parson i can get you both ashore tain't no use said jude feebly corpses don't count for much in california but your immortal part remonstrated the parson trying to seize jude by the hand which held little johnny god of mercy on it whispered the dying man it's the first time you ever had an excuse to do it strong man and expert swimmer as the ex-minister was he was compelled to relinquish his hold of the wounded man and jude after one or two fitful struggles against his fate drifted lifeless down the stream and into eternity while the widowed mother regained her child the man of god the chivalrous frenchman and the brutish mike slowly returned to their camp but no one who met them could imagine from their looks that they were either of them any better than fugitives from justice End of story thirty two story thirty three of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirty three a love of a cottage we had been married about six months and were boarding in the most comfortable style imaginable when one evening after dinner sophronia announced that her heart was set upon keeping house my heart sank within me but one of the lessons learned within my half-year of married life is that when sophronia's heart is set upon anything the protests i see fit to make must be uttered only within the secret recesses of my own consciousness then sophronia remarked that she had made up her mind to keep house in the country at which information my heart sank still lower not that i lack appreciation of natural surroundings i delight in localities where beautiful scenery exists and where tired men can rest under trees without even being suspected of inebriety but when any of my friends go house-hunting in the city in the two or three square miles which contain all the desirable houses their search generally occupies a month during which time the searchers grow thin nervous absent-minded and uncompanionable what then would it be my fate after searching the several hundred square miles of territory which were within twenty miles of new york but sophronia had decided that it was to be and i mine not to make reply mine not to reason why mine but to do or die by a merciful dispensation of providence however i was saved from the full measure of the fate i feared sophronia has a highly imaginative nature in her a fancy naturally ethereal has been made supersensitive by long companionship of tender-voiced poets and romancers so when i bought a railway guide and read over the names of stations within a reasonable distance of new york sophronia's interest was excited in exact proportion to the attractiveness of the names themselves communion pa she pronounced execrable ewanville reminded her of a dreadful psalm tune patterson recalled the vulgar question who struck billy patterson yonkers sounded dutch morristown had a plebeian air rutherford park well that sounded endurable it reminded her of the scene in mrs somebody's novel elizabeth was a dreadfully old-fashioned name villa valley stop exclaimed sophronia raising impressively the hand which bore her diamond engagement ring that is the place pierre i was christened peter but miss sophronia never looked encouragingly upon me until a friend nicknamed me pierre i have a presentiment that our home will be at villa valley how melodious how absolutely enchanting it sounds there is always a lake or a brook in a valley too don't you know i did not previously possess this exact knowledge of the peculiarity of valleys but i have an accurate knowledge of what my duty is regarding any statement which sophronia may make so i promptly assented by the rarest good fortune i found in the morning paper an advertisement of a real estate agent who made a specialty of villa valley property 
this agent when visited by me early in the morning abundantly confirmed sophronia's intuition regarding brooks and lakes by asserting that his charming town possessed both beside many other attractions which irresistibly drove us to villa valley the next day with a letter to the agent's resident partner it was a bright april morning when we started in the resident agent's carriage to visit a number of houses the rent of which did not exceed four hundred dollars drive first to the old stone cottage said sophronia the very name is enchanting the house itself did not support sophronia's impression it stood very near the road was a quarter of a mile from any tree or bush had three large and three small rooms only one of which could be reached without passing through two others for the house had no hall the woodwork would have apparently greeted paint as a lifelong stranger the doors in size and clumsiness reminded me of the gates of gaza as pictured in sunday school books the agent said it had once been washington's headquarters and i saw no reason to doubt his word though i timidly asked whether tradition asserted that the father of his country had not suffered a twinge of neuralgia while at villa valley a perfect snuggery did not belie its name but in size and ventilation forcibly suggested a chicken coop charming swiss cottage seemed to be a remodelled pigsty from which objectionable matter had not been removed the house in the woods was approachable only through water halfway up the carriage body so we regretfully abandoned pursuit of it silver lake exclaimed sophronia reading the memoranda she had penciled from the agent's descriptive list that i am sure will suit us don't you remember pierre my presentiment about a lake at villa valley i remembered by a little stretch of my imagination but alas for the uncertainty even of the presentiments of one of nature's most impressionable children the lake was a pond perhaps twenty feet in diameter an antiquated boot two or three abandoned milk cans and a dead cat reposed upon its placid beach and from a sheltered nook upon its southerly side an early aroused frog appeared inquiringly and uttered a cry of surprise or perhaps of warning take me away exclaimed sophronia it was a dream a fateful dream new cottage with all modern improvements seemed really to justify its title but sophronia declined to look farther than its outside i could never be happy in that house pierre said she with emphasis it looks to be entirely new tis madam declared the agent the last coat of paint hasn't been on a month so i divined replied sophronia and so it is simply a lifeless mass of boards and plaster no loving heart-throbs ever consecrated its walls no tender romances have been woven under its eaves no wistful yearnings no agonies of parting have made its chambers instinct with life no i declare exclaimed the agent excuse me for interrupting ma'am but i believe i've got the very house you're looking for how would you like a rambling old family homestead a hundred years old with quaint wide fireplaces high mantels overhanging eaves a heavy screen of evergreens vines clambering over everything a great wide hall exquisite charming enchanting paradisical divine murmured sophronia and the rent is only three hundred dollars continued the agent this latter bit of information aroused my strongest sentiment and i begged the agent to show us the house at once the approach was certainly delightful we dashed into the gloom of a mass of spruces pines and arbor vitaes and stopped suddenly in front of a little low cottage which consisted principally of additions no one of which was after any particular architectural order sophronia gazed an instant her face assumed an ecstatic expression which i had not seen since the day of our engagement she threw her arms about my neck her head drooped upon my bosom and she whispered my ideal then this matchless woman intuitively realizing that the moment for action had arrived reassumed her natural dignity and with the air of mrs scott siddons in elizabeth exclaimed enough we take it 
hadn't you better examine the interior first my love i suggested were the interior only that of a barn remarked my consistent mate my decision would not be affected thereby the eternal unities are never disunited nor are i don't believe i've got the key with me said the agent but perhaps we can get in through one of the windows the agent tied his horse and disappeared behind the house again sophronia's arm encircled me and she murmured oh pierre what bliss it's a good way from the station pet i ventured to remark sophronia's enthusiasm gave place to scorn she withdrew her affectionate demonstration and replied spoken like a real man the practical always the ideal never once i dreamed of the companionship of a congenial spirit but alas a good way from the station were i a man i would to reside in such a bower plod cheerfully over miles of prosaic clods and you'd get your shapely boots most shockingly muddy i thought as the agent opened one of the front windows and invited us to enter french windows too exclaimed sophronia oh pierre and see that exquisite old mantel it looks as if it had been carved from ebony upon the banks of one of the queen of the adriatic's noiseless byways and these tiny rooms how cosy how like fairyland again i declare we will take it let us return at once to the city how i loathe the thought of treading its noisy thoroughfares again and order our carpets and furniture are you sure you won't be lonesome here darling i asked it is quite a distance from any neighbours a true woman is never lonesome when she can commune with nature replied sophronia besides she continued in a less exalted strain i shall have laura stanley and stella sykes with me most of the time the agent drove us back to his office spending not more than ten minutes on the road yet the time sufficed sophronia to give me in detail her idea of the combination of carpets shades furniture pictures etc which would be in harmony with our coming domicile suddenly nature reasserted her claims and sophronia addressed the agent your partner told my husband that there were a lake and two brooks at villa valley i should like to see them certainly ma'am replied the agent promptly i'll drive you past them as you go to the train ten minutes later the lease was made out and signed i was moved to interrupt the agent with occasional questions such as uh, isn't the house damp any mosquitoes is the water good and plentiful does the cellar extend under the whole house but the coldly practical nature of these queries affected sophronia's spirits so unpleasantly that out of pure affection i forbore then the agent invited us into his carriage again and said he would drive us to the lower depot two stations i inquired yes said he and one's as near to your house as the other your house whispered sophronia turning her soulful eyes full upon me and inserting her delicate elbow with unnecessary force between my not heavily covered ribs your house oh pierre does not the dignity of having a house appear to you like a beautiful vision i strove for an instant to frame a reply in keeping with sophronia's mental condition when an unpleasant odour saluted my nose that sophronia was conscious of the same disgusting atmospheric feature i learned by the sound of a decided sniff looking about us i saw a large paper mill beside a stream whose contents looked sewer-like smell the paper mash boiling asked the agent peculiar isn't it very healthy though they say on the opposite side of the road trickled a small gutter full of a reddish-brown liquid its source seeming to be a dye-house behind us just then we drove upon a bridge which crossed a vile pool upon the shore of which was a rolling mill here's the lake said the agent delwood lake they call it and here's the brooks emptying into it one on each side of the road sophronia gasped and looked solemn her thoughtfulness lasted but a moment however then she applied her daintily perfumed handkerchief to her nose and whispered 
Damn well, but sharp big dev at the pier, don't you think so? During the fortnight which followed, Sophronia and I visited house furnishing stores, carpet dealers, furniture warehouses, picture stores, and bric-a-brac shops. The agent was very kind. He sent a boy to the house with the keys every time the express wished to deliver any of our goods finally the carpet dealer having reported the carpets laid sophronia i and our newly engaged servant started by rail to villa valley three double truck loads of furniture preceding us by way of the turnpike i had thoughtfully ordered quite a quantity of provisions put into the house in advance of our arrival hiring a carriage at the station and obtaining the keys of the agent we drove to our residence sophronia to use her own expression felt as she imagined juno did when first installed as mistress of the rosy summit of the divine mount while i though scarcely in a mood to compare myself with jove was conscious of a new and delightful sense of manliness the shades and curtains were in the windows the sun shone warmly upon them and a bright welcome seemed to extend itself from the whole face of the cottage i unlocked the door and tenderly kissed my darling under the lintel then we stepped into the parlour sophronia immediately exclaimed gracious the word that escaped my lips i shrink from placing upon the printed page a barrel of flour one of sugar another of corned beef and a half barrel of molasses a box of candles a can of kerosene oil some cases of canned fruits a box of laundry soap three wash-tubs and a firkin of butter all these and many other packages covered the parlour floor and sent up a smell suggestive of an unventilated grocery the flour had sifted between the staves of the barrel the molasses had dripped somewhat the box of soap had broken open and a single bar had been fastened to the carpet by the seal of a boot-heel of heroic size sophronia stepped into little pools of molasses and the effect seemed to be that the carpet rose to bestow sweet clinging kisses upon the dainty feet of the loveliest of her sex horrible ejaculated sophronia and here come the trucks said i looking out of the window and the one with the parlour furniture is in front fortunately the truckmen were good-tempered and amenable to reason expressed by means of currency so we soon had the provisions moved into the kitchen then the senior truckman kindly consented to dispose of an old tarpaulin at about twice the price of a piece of velvet carpet of similar size and this we spread upon the parlour floor while the furniture should be brought in sophronia assumed the direction of proceedings but it soon became evident that she was troubled the room evidently was not arranged for this furniture said she and she spoke truthfully we had purchased a lounge a large centre table an etagere a turkish chair two reception chairs four chairs to match the lounge a rocker or two an elegant fire screen and several other articles of furniture and there was considerable difficulty experienced not only in arranging them but in getting them into the parlour at all finally the senior truckman spoke the only way to get everything in is to fix em the way we do at store set em close together he spoke truly and sophronia with a sigh assented to such an arrangement suggesting that we could rearrange the furniture afterward and stipulating only that the lounge should be placed in the front of the room this done there were three and a half feet of space between the front of the lounge and the inside of the window casings we can at least sit upon it and lose our souls in the dying glories of the sun upon the eternal hills and a oh, gracious pierre where's the piano to go sure enough and the piano was already at the door the senior truckman cast his professional eye at the vacant space and spoke oh, you can put it right there said he there won't be no room for the stool to go behind it but if you put the keyboard to the front and open the window you can stand outdoors and play sophronia eyed the senior truckman suspiciously for a moment but not one of his honest facial muscles moved so sophronia exclaimed true and uh, how romantic 
while the piano was being placed i became conscious of some shocking language being used on the stairway looking out i saw two truckmen and the headboard of our new bedstead inextricably mixed on the stairs why don't you go on i asked the look which one of the truckmen gave me i shall not forget until my dying day the man's companion remarked that when uh, qualified fools bought furniture for such doubly qualified houses they ought to have brains enough to get things small enough to get up the trebly qualified stairs i could not deny the logic of this statement impious as were the qualifying adjectives which were used thereupon but something had to be done we could not put the bedstead together upon the stairway and sleep upon it there even were there not other articles of furniture imperatively demanding a right of way try to get it down again said i they tried and after one mighty effort succeeded they also brought down several square yards of ceiling plaster and the entire handrail of the stair think the ceilings of these rooms is high enough to let that bed stand up asked the senior truckman i hastily measured the height of the ceilings and then of the bedstead and found the latter nearly eighteen inches too high then i called sophronia the bedstead was of her selection and was an elegant sample of fine woods and excessive ornamentation it was a precious bit of furniture but time was precious too the senior truckman suggested that the height of the bedstead might be reduced about two feet by the removal of the most lofty ornament and that a healthy man could knock it off with his fist well, let it be done said sophronia what matter a king discrowned is still a king at heart the senior truckman aimed a deadly blow with a cart rung and the bedstead filled its appointed place the remaining furniture followed as fast as could be expected we soon gave up the idea of getting it all into the house but the wood house was spacious and easy of access so we stowed there important portions of three chamber sets a gem of a sideboard the turkish chair which had been ordered for the parlour and the hat-rack which the hall was too small to hold we also deposited in the wood-house all the pictures in their original packages at length the trucks were emptied the senior truckman smiled sweetly as i passed a small fee into his hand then he looked thoughtfully at the roof of the cottage and remarked it's none of my business i know but i hate to see nice things spiled i'd watch that roof if i was you the first time it rained i thanked him he drove off i turned and accepted the invitation which was presented by sophronia's outstretched arms oh pierre she exclaimed at last we are in our own home no uncongenial spirits about us no one to molest or annoy no unsympathetic souls to stifle our ardent passion for nature and the work of her free divine hands a frowsy head suddenly appeared at the dining-room door and a voice which accompanied it remarked didn't they bring any stove ma'am sophronia looked inquiringly at me and i answered no looking very blank at the same time then how am i to make a fire to cook with asked the girl in the range of course said sophronia our domestic's next remark had at least the effect of teaching what was her nationality and do you think i'd ask for a stove i hear was a range in the house divil a bit never mind dear said i soothingly i'm an old soldier i'll make a fire out of doors and give you as nice a cup of tea and a plate of hot biscuit as you ever tasted and i'll order a stove the first thing in the morning sophronia consented and our domestic was appeased then i asked the domestic to get some water while i should make the fire the honest daughter of toil was absent for many moments and when she returned it was to report with some excitement that there was neither well nor cistern on the premises then i grew angry and remarked in sophronia's hearing that we were a couple of fools to take a house without first proving whether the agent had told the truth but sophronia who is a consistent optimist rebuked me for my want of faith in the agent 
pierre said she it is unmanly to charge a fellow-man with falsehood upon the word of a menial i know that agent tells the truth for he has such liquid blue eyes besides his house is right next to the presbyterian church either one of these powerful arguments was sufficient to silence me of course so i took the pail and sought well and cistern myself but if either was on the place it was so skilfully secreted that i could not find the slightest outward evidence of it finally to be thorough i paced the garden from front to rear over lines not more than ten feet apart and then scrutinized the fence corners while at this work i was approached by a gentleman who seemed to come from a house two or three hundred yards off moved into the cottage it seems says he yes i replied do you know the place the agent said there was excellent water here but i can't find it he meant there was good water in my well where all occupants of the cottage have drawn water for several years the well belonging to your place was covered up when the road was cut through a few years ago and neighbor hubbell well i don't say anything against him neighbors must be neighborly but folks do say he's too stingy to dig a new well that's the reason the cottage hasn't been occupied much for the last few years but everybody is welcome to draw from my well come along i followed the kind-hearted man but i wished that the liquid depth of the agent's blue eyes had a proper parallel upon the estate which he had imposed upon me i returned as full of wrath as my pail was of water when across the fence i saw sophronia's face so suffused with tender exultation that admiration speedily banished ill-nature but it was for a brief moment only for sophronia's finely cut lips parted and their owner exclaimed oh pierre what a charming pastoral picture you and the pail and the lawn as a background i wish we might always have to get water from our neighbor's well we retired early and in the delightful quiet of our rural retreat with the moon streaming through our chamber window sophronia became poetic and i grew too peaceful and happy even to harbour malice against the agent the eastern sun found its way through the hemlocks to wake us in the morning and the effect was so delightfully different from the rising bell of the boarding-house that when sophronia indulged in some freedom with certain of whittier's lines and exclaimed sad is the man who never sees the sun shine through his hemlock trees i appreciated her sentiment and expressed my regard in a loving kiss again i made a fire out of doors boiled coffee fried ham and eggs made some biscuit begged some milk of our neighbour and then we had a delightful little breakfast then i started for the station don't forget the stove dear said sophronia as she gave me a parting kiss and be sure to send a butcher and baker and grocer and just then our domestic appeared and remarked Ere you may as well got another girl the like o' me ain't going to bring water from half a mile away sophronia grew pale but she lost not an atom of her saintly calmness she only said half to herself poor thing she hasn't a bit of poetry in her soul when i returned in the evening i found sophronia in tears the stove-men had not quite completed their work so sophronia and her assistant had eaten nothing but dry bread since breakfast the girl interrupted us to say that the stove was ready but that she couldn't get either coal or wood and would i just come and see why i descended five of the cellar stairs but the others were covered with water and upon the watery expanse about me floated the wagon-load of wood i had purchased the coal heap under a window fifteen feet away loomed up like a rugged crag of basaltic rock i took soundings with a stick and found the water was rather more than two feet deep fortunately there were among my war relics a pair of boots as long as the legs of their owner so i drew these on and descended the stairs with shovel and coal scuttle the boots had not been oiled in ten years so they found accommodation for several quarts of water as i strode angrily into the kitchen and set the scuttle down with a suddenness which shook the floor sophronia clapped her hands in ecstasy 
pierre she exclaimed you look like the picture of the sturdy retainers of the old english barons oh i do hope that water won't go away very soon the rattling of the water in your boots makes your steps so impressive i found that in spite of the hunger from which she had suffered sophronia had not been idle during the day she had coaxed the baker's man to open the cases of pictures and she and the domestic had carried each picture to the room in which it was to hang the highest ceiling in the house was six and a half feet from the floor whereas our smallest picture measured three feet and a half in height but sophronia's art-loving soul was not to be daunted the pictures being too large to hang she had leaned them against the walls it's such an original idea said she and then too it gives each picture such an unusual effect don't you think so i certainly did we spent the evening in trying to make our rooms look less like furniture warehouses but succeeded only partly we agreed too that we could find something for painters and calciminers to do for the ceilings and walls were blotched and streaked so much that our pretty furniture and carpets only made the plastering look more dingy but when again we retired and our lights were put and only soft moonbeams relieved the darkness our satisfaction with our new house filled us with pleasant dreams which we exchanged before sleeping after falling asleep i dreamed of hearing a wonderful symphony performed by an unseen orchestra it seemed as if liszt might have composed it and as if the score were particularly strong in trombones and drums then the scene changed and i was on a ship in a storm at sea the gale was blowing my hair about and huge raindrops occasionally struck my face sophronia was by my side but instead of glorying with me in meeting the storm king in his home she complained bitterly of the rain the unaccountable absence of her constitutional romanticism provoked me and i remonstrated so earnestly that the effort aroused me to wakefulness but sophronia's complaining continued i had scarcely realized that i was in a cottage chamber instead of on a ship's deck when sophronia exclaimed pierre i wonder if a shower bath hasn't been arranged just where our bed stands because drops of water are falling in my face once in a while they are lovely and cool but they trickle off on the pillow and that don't feel nice i lit a candle and examined the ceiling directly over sophronia's head there was a heavy blotch from the centre of which the water was dropping another result of taking that liquid blue-eyed agent's word i growled hastily moving the bed and its occupant and setting the basin on the floor to catch the water and save the carpet why pierre exclaimed sophronia as i blew out the light how unjust you are who could expect an agent to go over the roof like a cat and examine each shingle gracious it's dropping here too again i lighted the candle and moved the bed but before i had time to retire sophronia complained that a stream was trickling down upon her feet the third time the bed was moved water dropped down upon my pillow and the room was too small to relocate the bed so that none of these unauthorized hydrants should moisten us then we tried our spare chamber but that was equally damp suddenly i bethought myself of another war relic and hurrying to an old trunk extracted an india-rubber blanket this if we kept very close together kept the water out but almost smothered us we changed our positions by sitting up back to back and dropping the rubber blanket over our heads by this arrangement the air was allowed to circulate freely and we had some possibilities of conversation left us but the effect of the weight of the blanket resting largely upon our respective noses was somewhat depressing suddenly sophronia remarked oh pierre this reminds me of those stories you used to tell me of how you and all your earthly treasures used to hide under this blanket from the rain the remark afforded an opportunity for a very graceful reply but four hours elapsed before i saw it sophronia did not seem hurt by my negligence but almost instantly continued 
it would be just like war if there was only some shooting going on can't you fire your revolver out of the window pierre i could i replied if that blue-eyed agent was anywhere within range why pierre i think you're dreadfully unjust to that poor man he can't go sleeping around in all the rooms of each of his cottages every time there's a rainstorm to see if they leak besides oh pierre i've a brilliant idea it can't be wet downstairs true i was so engrossed by different plans of revenge that i had not thought of going into the parlour or dining-room to sleep we moved to the parlour sophronia took the lounge while i found the floor a little harder than i supposed an ex-soldier could ever find any plain surface it did not take me long however to learn that the parlour floor was not a plain surface it contained a great many small elevations which kept me awake for the remainder of the night wondering what they could be at early dawn i was as far from a satisfactory theory as ever and i hastily loosened one end of the carpet and looked under the protuberances were knots in the flooring boards in the days when the sturdy patriots of new jersey despised such monarchical luxuries as carpets the soft portions of these boards had been slowly worn away but the knots every one has heard the expression as tough as a pine knot fortunately we had indulged in a frightfully expensive rug and upon this i sought and found a brief period of repose and forgetfulness while we were at the breakfast-table our girl appeared with red eyes and a hoarse voice and remarked that now she must leave she had learned to like us and she loved the country but she had an aged parent whose sole support she was and could not afford to risk her life in such a house let her go said sophronia if variety is a spice of life why shouldn't the rule apply to servants perhaps it does my dear i replied but if we have to pay each girl a month's wages for two or three days of work the spice will be more costly than enjoyable huh immediately after breakfast i sought the agent i supposed he would meet me with downcast eyes and averted head but he did nothing of the kind he extended his hand cordially and said he was delighted to see me that roof said i getting promptly to business leaks well it's simply a sieve and you told me the house was dry so the owner told me sir of course you can't expect us to inspect the hundreds of houses we handle in a year well however that may be the owner is mistaken and he must repair the roof at once the agent looked thoughtful if you had wished the landlord to make necessary repairs you should have so stipulated in the lease the lease you have signed provides that all repairs shall be made at your own expense did the landlord draw up the lease i asked fixing my eyes severely upon the agent's liquid orbs but the agent met my gaze with defiance and an expression of injured dignity i asked you whether you would have the usual form of lease said the agent and you replied certainly i abruptly left the agent's presence went to a lumber yard near by and asked where i could find the best carpenter in town he happened to be on the ground purchasing some lumber and to him i made known my troubles and begged him to hasten to my relief the carpenter was a man of great decision of character and he replied promptly ciphering on a card in the meantime no you don't every carpenter in town has tried his hand on that roof and made it worse than before the only way to make it tight is to reshingle it all over that'll cost you sixty seven dollars and fifty cents unless the scantling is too rotten to hold the nails in which case the job will cost you eighteen dollars and seventy five cents more i guess the rafters are strong enough to hold together a year or two longer i made some excuse to escape the carpenter and his dreadful figures and he graciously accepted it doubtless the perfect method in which he did it was the result of frequent interviews with other wretched beings who had leased the miserable house which i had taken into my confidence i determined to plead with the landlord whose name i knew and i asked a chance acquaintance on the train if he knew where i could find the proprietor of my house oh certainly said he there he is in the opposite seat but one reading a religious weekly i looked 
and my heart sank within me and my body sank into a seat a cold-eyed hatchet-faced man from whom not even the most eloquent beggar could hope to coax a penny of what use would it be to try to persuade him to spend sixty-seven dollars and fifty cents on something which i had agreed to take care of something had to be done however so i wasted most of the day in consulting new york roofers the conclusion of the whole matter was that i spent about thirty dollars for condemned flies from hospital tents and had these drawn tightly over the roof when this was done the appearance of the house was such that i longed for an incendiary who would compel me to seek a new residence but when sophronia gazed upon the roof she clapped her hands joyfully and exclaimed pierre it will be almost as nice as living in a tent to have one on the roof it looks just the same you know until your eyes get down to the edge of it there was at least one comfort in living at villa valley the people were very intelligent and sociable and we soon made many pleasant acquaintances but they all had something dreadful to suggest about our house a doctor who was a remarkably fine fellow said he would be glad of my patronage and didn't doubt that he would soon have it unless i had the cellar pumped out at once then mrs blath the leader of society in the village told my wife how a couple who once lived in our cottage always had chills though no one else at villa valley had the remotest idea of what a chill was the several coal dealers in the village competed in the most lively manner for our custom and when i mentioned the matter in some surprise to my grocer he remarked that they knew what houses needed most coal to keep them warm the year through and worked for custom accordingly a deacon who was sociable but solemn remarked that some of his most sweetly mournful associations clustered about our cottage he had followed several of its occupants to their long homes and yet as the season advanced and the air was too dry to admit of dampness anywhere and the summer breezes blew in the windows and doors whole clouds of perfume from the rank thickets of old-fashioned roses which stood about the garden we became sincerely attached to the little cottage then heavy masses of honeysuckles and vines which were trained against the house grew dense and picturesque with foliage and sophronia would enjoy hours of perfect ecstasy sitting in an easy chair under the evergreens and gazing at the graceful outlines of the house and its verdant ornaments but the cellar was obdurate it was pumped dry several times but no pump could reach the inequalities in its floor and in august there came a crowd of mosquitoes from the water in these small holes they covered the ceilings and walls they sat in every chair they sang accompaniments to all of sophronia's songs they breakfast dined and supped with us and upon us sophronia began to resemble a person in the first stages of varioloid yet that incomparable woman would sit between sunset and dusk looking through nearly closed eyes at the walls and ceiling and would remark pierre when you look at the walls in this way the mosquitoes give them the effect of being papered with some of that exquisite new japanese wallpaper with its quaint spots don't you think so finally september came and with it the equinoctial storm we lay in bed one night the wind blowing about us and sophronia rhapsodizing through the medium of longfellow's lines about the storm wind of the equinox when we heard a terrific crash and then the sound of a falling body which shook the whole house sophronia clasped me wildly and began to pray but i speedily disengaged myself lighted a candle and sought the cause of our disturbance i found it upon the hall floor it was the front door and its entire casing both of which with considerable plaster lathing and rotten wood had been torn from its place by the fury of the storm in the morning i sought a printer with a small but strong manuscript which i had spent the small hours of the night in preparing it bore this title the house i live in 
the printer gave me the proof the same day and i showed it to the owner of the house the same evening remarking that i should mail a copy to every resident of villa valley and have one deposited in every post office box in new york city the owner offered to cancel my lease if i would give up my unkind intention and i consented then we hired a new cottage not from the agent with the liquid blue eyes and before accepting it i examined it as if it were to be my residence to all eternity and yet when all our household goods were removed and sophronia and i took our final departure the gentle mistress of my home turned regretfully burst into tears and sobbed oh pierre in spite of everything it is a love of a cottage end of story thirty three Story thirty four of Romance of California Life by John Haberton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story thirty four The Blayton Rivals. The village of Blayton contained as many affectionate young people as any other place of its size, and was not without young ladies, for the possession of whose hearts two or more young men strove against each other when however allusion was ever made to the rivals no one doubted to whom the reference applied it was always understood that the young men mentioned were those two of miss florence elserly's admirers for whom miss elserly herself seemed to have more regard than she manifested toward any one else there has always been some disagreement among the young ladies of blayton as to miss elserly's exact rank among beauties but there was no possibility of doubt that miss elserly attracted more attention than any other lady in the town and that among her admirers had been every young man among whom other blayton ladies of taste would have chosen their life partners had the power of choosing pertained to their own sex the good young men of the village the successful business men who were bachelors and the stylish young fellows who came from the neighbouring city in the summer bowed before miss elserly as naturally as if fate embodied in the person of the lady herself commanded them how many proposals miss elserly had received no one knew for two or three years no one was able to substantiate an opinion from the young lady's walk and conversation that she specially preferred any one of her personal acquaintances but at length it became evident that she evinced more than the interest of mere acquaintanceship in hubert brown the best of the native-born young men of the village mr brown was a theological student but the march of civilization had been such at blayton that a prospective shepherd of souls might listen to one of beethoven's symphonies in a city opera house without having any sin imputed unto him such music-loving inhabitants of blayton as listened to one of these symphonies which was also heard by mr brown and miss elserly noticed that when the young couple exchanged words and glances miss elserly's well-trained features were not so carefully guarded as they usually were in society such ladies as had nothing to do and even a few who were not without pressing demands upon their time canvassed the probabilities of the match quite exhaustively and made some prophecies but were soon confused by the undoubted fact that miss elserly drove out a great deal with major mailing the dashing ex-soldier and successful broker from the city the charm of uncertainty being thus added to the ordinary features of interest which pertain to all persons suspected of being in love made miss elserly's affairs of unusual importance to every one who knew the young lady even by sight and for three whole months the rivals were a subject of conversation next in order to the weather at length there came a day when the case seemed decided for three days hubert brown's face was very seldom seen on the street and when seen it was longer and more solemn than was required even by that order of sanctity in which theological students desire to live then it was noticed that while miss elserly's beauty grew no less in degree it changed in kind that she was more than ever seen in the society of the handsome broker and that the broker's attentions were assiduous 
then it was suspected that mr brown had proposed and been rejected ladies who owed calls to mr brown's mother made haste to pay them and as rewards of merit brought away confirmation of the report then before the gossips had reported the probable engagement of miss elserly to major mailing the lady and major made the announcement themselves to their intimate friends and the news quickly reached every one who cared to hear it a few weeks later however there circulated very rapidly a story whose foreshadowing could not have been justly expected of the village gossips the major absented himself for a day or two from his boarding-house and at a time too when numerous gentlemen from the city came to call upon him some of these callers returned hurriedly to the city evincing by words and looks the liveliest disappointment while two of them after considerable private conversation with the proprietress of the house and after displaying some papers in the presence of a local justice of the peace to whom the good old lady sent in her perplexity took possession of the major's room and made quite free with the ex-warriors cigars liquors and private papers then the city newspapers told how mr mailing a broker of excellent ability and reputation as well as one of the most gallant of his country's defenders in her hour of need had been unable to meet his engagements and had also failed to restore on demand fifteen thousand dollars in united states bonds which had been entrusted to him for safe keeping a warrant had been issued for mr mailing's arrest but at last accounts the officers had been unable to find him miss elserly immediately went into the closest retirement and even girls whom she had robbed of prospective beaux felt sorry for her people began to suggest that there might have been a chance for brown after all if he had stayed at home instead of rushing off to the west to play missionary he owned more property in his own right than the major had misplaced for other people and though some doubts were expressed as to miss elserly's fitness for the position of a minister's wife the matter was no less interesting as a subject for conversation the excellence of the chance which both brown and miss elserly had lost seemed even greater when it became noised abroad that brown had written to some real estate agents in the village that as he might want to go into business in the west to sell for him for cash a valuable farm which his father had left him as for the business which mr brown proposed entering the reader may form his own opinions from a little conversation here and after recorded as hubert brown trying to drown thought and do good was wandering through a colorado town one evening he found himself face to face with major mailing the major looked seedy and some years older than he did a month before but his pluck was unchanged seeing that an interview could not be avoided he assumed an independent air and exclaimed why brown what did you do that you had to come west nothing said the student flushing a little except be useless i thought said the major quickly with a desperate but sickly attempt at pleasantry that you had gone in for florence again she's worth all your lost sheep of the house of israel i don't make love to women who love other men replied brown don't please brown said the major turning manly in a moment i feel worse about her than about all my creditors or those infernal bonds i got into the snarl before i knew her that's the only way i can quiet my conscience of course the matter is all up now i wrote her as good an apology as i could and a release she'd have taken the latter without my giving it but no she wouldn't interrupted the student how do you know demanded the major with a suspicious glance which did not escape brown did you torment her by proposing again upon the top of her other troubles no said brown don't be insulting but i know that she keeps herself secluded and that her looks and spirits are dreadfully changed if she cared nothing for you she knows society would cheerfully forgive her if she were to show it i wish to satan that i hadn't met you then said the major i've taken solid comfort in the thought that most likely she was again the adored of all adorers 
and was forgetting me as she has so good a right to do major said brown bringing his hand down on the major's shoulder in a manner suggestive of a deputy sheriff you ought to go back to that girl and fail suggested the major thank you and allow me to say you're a devilish queer fellow for suggesting it is it part of your religion to forgive a successful rival it's part of my religion when i love to love the woman more than i love myself said brown with a face in which pain and earnestness strove for the mastery she loves you i loved her and want to see her happy the defaulter grasped the student's hand brown said he you're one of god's noblemen she told me so once but i didn't imagine then that i'd ever own up to it myself it can't be done though she can't marry a man in disgrace i can't ask a woman to marry me on nothing and besides there's the matter of those infernal bonds i can't clear that up and keep out of the sheriff's fingers i can said brown how asked the ex-broker with staring eyes i'll lend the money the major dropped brown's hand you heavenly lunatic said he i always did think religion made fools of men when they got too much of it then i could go back on the street again the boys would be glad to see me clear myself not meeting my engagements wouldn't be remembered against me but say borrow money from an old rival to make myself right with the girl he loved no excuse me i've got some sense of honour left you mean you love yourself more than you do her suggested brown i'll telegraph about the money and you write her in the meantime don't ruin her happiness for life by delay or trifling the major became a business man again brown said he i'll take your offer and whatever comes of it you'll have one friend you can swear to as long as i live you haven't the money with you no said brown but you shall have it in a fortnight i'll telegraph about it and go east and settle the business for you so you can come back without fear you're a trump but don't think hard of me money's never certain till you have it in hand i'll write and send my letter east by you when the matter's absolutely settled you can telegraph me and mail her my letter i'd expect to be shot if i made such a proposal to any other rival but you're not a man you're a saint confound you all the sermons i ever heard hadn't as much real goodness in them as i've heard the last ten minutes but twould be awful for me to write and then have the thing slip up brown admitted the justice of the major's plan and took the major to his own hotel to keep him from bad company during the whole evening the major talked about business but when after a night of sound sleep the student awoke he found the major pacing his room with a very pale face and heard him declare that he had not slept a wink brown pitied the major in his nervous condition and did what he could to alleviate it he talked to him of florence elserly of whom he seemed never to tire of talking he spoke to him of his own work and hopes he tried to picture to the major the happy future which was awaiting him but still the major was unquiet and absent-minded brown called in a physician to whom he said his friend was suffering from severe mental depression brought on by causes now removed but the doctor's prescriptions failed to have any effect finally when brown was to start for the east the major paler and thinner than ever handed him a letter addressed to miss elserly brown said the major i believe you won't lose any money by your goodness i can make money when i am not reckless and i'll make it my duty to be careful until you are paid the rest i can't pay but i'm going to try to be as good a man as you are that's the sort of compensation that'll please such an unearthly fellow best i guess when hubert brown reached blayton he closed with the best offer that had been made for his farm though the offer itself was one which made the natives declare that hubert brown had taken leave of his senses then he settled with the loser of the bonds saw one or two of the major's business acquaintances and prepared the way for the major's return then he telegraphed the major himself lastly he dressed himself with care and called upon miss elserly before sending up his card he pencilled upon it 
avec nouvelle allure which words the servant scanned with burning curiosity but of which she could remember but one when she tried to repeat them to the grocer's young man and this one she pronounced a rick as was natural enough in a lady of her nationality this much of the message was speedily circulated through the town and caused at least one curious person to journey to a great library in the city in quest of a celtic dictionary as for the recipient of the card she met her old lover with a face made more than beautiful by the conflicting emotions which manifested themselves in it the interview was short mr brown said he had accidentally met the major and had successfully acted as his agent in relieving him from his embarrassments he had the pleasure of delivering a letter from the major and hoped it might make miss elserly as happy to receive it as it made him to present it miss elserly expressed her thanks and then mr brown said pardon a bit of egotism and reference to an unpleasant subject miss elserly once i told you that i loved you in this matter of the major's i have been prompted solely by a sincere desire for your happiness and by acting in this spirit i have entirely taken the pain out of my old wound mayn't i therefore as the major's most sincere well-wisher enjoy once more your friendship miss elserly smiled sweetly and extended her hand and hubert brown went home a very happy man yet when he called again several evenings later he was not as happy as he had hoped to be in miss elserly's society for the lady herself though courteous and cordial seemed somewhat embarrassed and distrait and interrupted the young man on several occasions when he spoke in commendation of some good quality of the major's again he called and again the same strange embarrassment though less in degree manifested itself finally it disappeared altogether and miss elserly began to recover her health and spirits even then she did not exhibit as tender an interest in the major as the student had hoped she would do but as the major's truest friend he continued to sound his praises and to pay miss elserly in the major's stead every kind of attention he could devise finally he learned that the major was in the city and he hastened to inform miss elserly lest perhaps she had not heard so soon the lady received the announcement with an exquisite blush and downcast eyes though she admitted that the major had himself apprised her of his safe arrival on this particular evening the lady seemed to mr brown to be personally more charming than ever yet on the other hand the old embarrassment was so painfully evident that mr brown made an early departure arrived at home he found a letter from the major which read as follows my dear old fellow from the day on which i met you in colorado i've been trying to live after your pattern how i succeeded on the third day you may guess from enclosed which is a copy of a letter i sent to florence by you i've only just got her permission to send it to you though i've teased her once a week on the subject god bless you old fellow don't worry on my account for i'm really happy yours truly mailing with wondering eyes hubert brown read the enclosure which read as follows miss elserly three days ago while a fugitive from justice yet honestly loving you more than i ever loved any other being i met hubert brown he has cared for me as if i was his dearest friend he is going to make good my financial deficiencies and restore me to respectability he cannot have done this out of love for me for he knows nothing of me but that which should make him hate me on both personal and moral grounds he says he did it because he loved you and because he wants to see you happy miss elserly such love cannot be a thing of the past only and it is so great that in comparison with it the best love that i have ever given you seems beneath your notice he is begging me to go back for your sake he is constantly talking to me about you in a tone and with a look that shows how strong is the feeling he is sacrificing out of sincere regard for you 
miss elserly i never imagined the angels loving as purely and strongly as he does he tells me you still retain some regard for me the mere thought is so great a comfort that i cannot bear to reason seriously about it yet if any such feelings exist i must earnestly beg of you out of the sincere and faithful affection i have had for you to give up all thought of me for ever and give yourself entirely to that most incomparable lover hubert brown forgive my intrusion and advice i give it because the remembrance of our late relations will assure you of the honesty and earnestness of my meaning i excuse myself by the thought that to try to put into such noble keeping the dearest treasure that i ever possessed is a duty which justifies my departure from any conventional rule i am miss elserly as ever your worshipper more than this i cannot dare to think of being after my own fall and the overpowering sense i have of the superior worth of another god bless you andrew mailing mr brown hastily laid the letter aside and again called upon miss elserly again she met him with many signs of the embarrassment whose cause he now understood so well yet as he was about to deliver an awkward apology a single look from under miss elserly's eyebrows only a glance but as searching and eloquent as it was swift stopped his tongue he took miss elserly's hand in his own and stammered i came to plead for the major and i shan't listen to you said she raising her eyes with so tender a light in them that hubert brown immediately hid the eyes themselves in his heart lest the light should be lost end of story thirty four story thirty five of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirty five budge and toddy at aunt alice's part one the following is quoted by permission from mr haberton's popular book other people's children published by g p putnam sons new york mrs burton's birthday dawned brightly and it is not surprising that as it was her first natal anniversary since her marriage to a man who had no intention or ability to cease being a lover it is not surprising that her ante-breakfast moments were too fully and happily occupied to allow her to even think of two little boys who had already impressed upon her their willingness and general ability to think for themselves as for the young men themselves they awoke with the lark and with a heavy sense of responsibility also the room of mrs burton's chambermaid joined their own and the occupant of that room having been charged by her mistress with the general care of the boys between dark and daylight she had gradually lost that faculty for profound slumber which so notably distinguishes the domestic servant from all other human beings she had grown accustomed to wake at the first sound in the boys room and on the morning of her mistress's birthday the first sound she heard was tod no response could be heard but a moment later the chambermaid heard tod ow drawled a voice not so sleepily but it could sound aggrieved wake up dear old toddy butter it's aunt alice's birthday now needn't wake my ears open if tis whined toddy i only hollered in one ear tod remonstrated budge and you ought to love dear aunt alice enough to have that hurt a little rather than not wake up a series of groans snarls whines grunts snorts and remonstrances semi-articulate were heard and at length some complicated wriggles and convulsive kicks were made manifest to the listening ear and then budge said that's right now let's get up and get ready say do you know that we didn't think anything about having some music don't you remember how papa played the piano last mamma's birthday when she came downstairs and how happy it made her and we danced around all right said toddy let's tell you what said budge let's both bang the piano like mamma and aunt alice does together sometimes 
oh yes exclaimed toddy we can make some awful big bangs before she can get down to tell us to don't then there was heard a scurrying of light feet as the boys picked up their various articles of clothing from the corners chairs bureau table etc where they had been tossed the night before the chambermaid hurried to their assistance and both boys were soon dressed a plate containing bananas and another with the hard-earned grapes were on the bureau and the boys took them and tiptoed down the stair and into the drawing-room gracious said toddy as he placed his plate on the sideboard maybe the grapes and that nose has got sour i guess we'd better try em like mamma does the milk on hot mornings when the baddy milkman don't come time enough and toddy suited the action to the word by plucking from a cluster the handsomest grape in sight i think said he smacking his lips with the suspicious air of a professional wine taster i think they is getting sour let's see said budge no said toddy plucking another grape with one hand while with the other he endeavoured to cover his gift i's bid enough to do it myself unless he added as a happy inspiration struck him you let me help see if your buttonos are sour then you can only have one bite said budge you must let me taste about six grapes because twould take that many to make one of your bites on a banana all right said toddy and the boys proceeded to exchange duties budge taking the precaution to hold the banana himself so that his brother should not abstractedly sample a second time and toddy doling out the grapes with careful count they are a little sour said budge with a wry face perhaps some other bunch is better i think we'd better try each one don't you and each one of the buttonos too suggested toddy that one was pretty good but maybe some of the others isn't the proposition was accepted and soon each banana had its length reduced by a fourth and the grape clusters displayed a fine development of wood then budge seemed to realize that his present was not as sightly as it might be for he carefully closed the skins at the ends and turned the unbroken ends to the front as deftly as if he were a born retailer of fruit this done he exclaimed oh we want our cards on em else how will she know who they came from we'll be here to tell her said toddy ah said budge that wouldn't make her half so happy don't you know how when cousin florence gets presents of flowers she's always happiest when she's looking at the card that comes with em all right said toddy hurrying into the parlor and returning with the cards of a lady and gentleman taken haphazard from his aunt's card receiver now we must write happy birthday on the backs of em said budge exploring his pockets and extracting a stump of a lead pencil now continued budge leaning over the card and displaying all the facial contortions of the unpractised writer as he laboriously printed in large letters speaking as he worked a letter at a time h a p p e b u r f d a happy birthday now you must hold the pencil for yours or else it won't be so sweet that's what mamma says toddy took the pencil in his pudgy hand and budge guided the hand and the two juvenile heads touched each other and swayed and twisted and bobbed in unison until the work was completed now i think she ought to come said budge breakfast time was still more than an hour distant why the rising bell hasn't rung yet let's ring it the boys fought for possession of the bell but superior might conquered and budge marched up and down the hall ringing with the enthusiasm and duration peculiar to the amateur bless me exclaimed mrs burton hastening to complete her toilette how time does fly sometimes mr burton saw something in his wife's face that seemed to call for lover-like treatment but it was not without a sense of injury that he exclaimed immediately after as he drew forth his watch i declare i would make a half a david that we hadn't been awake half an hour i forgot to wind up my watch last night the boys hurried into the parlor i hear em trampin around exclaimed budge in great excitement there the piano shut isn't that too mean oh i'll tell you here's uncle harry's violin 
then what's i going to play on asked toddie dancing frantically about wait a minute said budge dropping the violin and hurrying to the floor above from which he speedily returned with a comb a bound volume of the portfolio lay upon the table and opening this budge tore the tissue paper from one of the etchings and wrapped the comb in it there said he you fiddle and i'll blow the comb goodness why don't they come down oh we forgot to put pennies under the plate and we won't know how many years old to put em for and we ain't got no pennies said toddie i know said budge hurrying to a cabinet in a drawer of which his uncle kept the nucleus of a collection of american coinage this kind of pennies budge continued isn't so pretty as our kind but they're bigger and they'll look better on a tablecloth now how old do you think she is i dunno said toddie going into a reverie of hopeless conjectures she's about as big as you and me put together well said budge you're four and i'm six and four and six is ten i guess ten'll be about the thing mrs burton's plate was removed and the pennies were deposited in a circle there was some painful counting and recounting and many disagreements additions and subtractions finally the pennies were arranged in four rows two of three each and two of two each and budge counted the threes and toddie verified the twos and budge was adding the four sums together when footsteps were heard descending the stairs budge hastily dropped the surplus coppers upon the four rows placed the plate and seized the comb as toddie placed the violin against his knee as he had seen small itinerant italians do a second or two later as the host and hostess entered the dining-room there arose a sound which caused mrs burton to clap her fingers to her ears while her husband exclaimed scat then both boys dropped their instruments toddie finding the ways of his own feet seriously compromised by the strings of the violin while both children turned happy faces toward their aunt and shouted happy birthday mr burton hurried to the rescue of his darling instrument while his wife gave each boy an appreciative kiss and showed them a couple of grateful tears then her eye was caught by the fruit on the sideboard and she read the cards aloud mrs frank romery this is like her effusiveness i've never met her but once but i suppose her bananas must atone for her lack of manners why charlie croon dear me what memories some men have a cloud came upon mr burton's brow charlie croon had been one of his rivals for miss mayton's hand and mrs burton was looking a trifle thoughtful and her husband was as unreasonable as newly made husbands are sure to be when mrs burton exclaimed some one has been picking the grapes off in the most shameful manner boys ain't from no romeries and croons said toddie they's from me and budge and we does tasted em to see if got sour in the night where did the cards come from asked mrs burton out of the basket in the parlor said budge but the back is the nice part of em mrs burton's thoughtful expression and her husband's frown disappeared together as they seated themselves at the table both boys wriggled rigorously until their aunt raised her plate and then budge exclaimed a penny for each year you know thirty-one exclaimed mrs burton after counting the heap how complimentary what does you do for little boys on your birthday asked toddie after breakfast was served mamma does lots of things yes said budge she says she thinks people ought to get their own happy by making other people happy and mamma knows better than you you know cause she's been married longest although mrs burton admitted the facts the inference seemed scarcely natural and she said so well anyhow said toddie mamma always has parties on her birthday and we has all the cake we want you shall be happy to-day then said mrs burton for a few friends will be in to see me this afternoon and i am going to have a nice little lunch for them and you shall lunch with us if you will be very good until then and keep yourselves clean and neat all right said toddie isn't it most time now tod's all stomach said budge with some contempt say aunt alice i hope you won't forget to have some fruit cake that's the kind we like best 
you'll come home very early harry asked mrs burton ignoring her nephew's question by noon at furthest said the gentleman i only want to see my morning letters and fill any orders that may be in them what are you coming so early for uncle harry asked budge to take aunt alice riding old boy said mr burton oh just listen todd won't that be jolly uncle harry's going to take us riding i said i was going to take your aunt alice budge said mr burton i heard you said budge but that won't trouble us any she always likes to talk to you better than she does to us when are we going mr burton asked his wife in german whether the lawrence burton assurance was not charmingly natural and mrs burton answered in the same tongue that it was but was none the less deserving of rebuke and that she felt it to be her duty to tone it down in her nephews mr burton wished her joy of the attempt and asked a number of searching questions about success already attained until mrs burton was glad to see toddy come out of a brown study and hear him say i think that place where the river is broke off is the nicest place what does the child mean asked his aunt don't you know where we went last year and you stopped us from seeing how far we could hang over uncle harry said the budge oh passaic falls exclaimed mr burton yes that's it said budge old rivers broke right in two there said toddy and a piece of us way up in the air and another piece is way down in big hole in the stones that's where i want to go waden listen toddy said mrs burton we like to take you riding with us at most times but to-day we prefer to be alone you and budge will stay at home we shan't be gone more than two hours wants to go a widen exclaimed toddy i know you do dear but you must wait until some other day said the lady but i want to go toddy explained and i don't want you to so you can't said mrs burton in a tone which would reduce any reasonable person to hopelessness but toddy in spite of manifest astonishment remarked want to go a widen now the fight is on murmured mr burton to himself then he rose hastily from the table and said i think i'll try to catch the earlier train my dear as i am coming back so soon mrs burton arose to bid her husband good-bye and was kissed with more than usual tenderness and then held at arm's length while manly eyes looked into her own with an expression which she found untranslatable for two hours at least mrs burton saw her husband fairly on his way and then she returned to the dining-room led toddy into the parlour took him upon her lap wound her arms tenderly about him and said now toddy dear listen carefully to what aunt alice tells you there are some reasons why you boys should not go with us to-day and aunt alice means just what she says when she tells you you can't go with us if you were to ask a hundred times it would not make the slightest bit of difference you cannot go and you must stop thinking about it toddy listened intelligently from beginning to end and replied but i want to go and you can't that ends the matter no i don't said toddy not a single biddle i want to go badder never but you are not going i want to go so baddy said toddy beginning to cry i suppose you do and auntie is very sorry for you said mr burton kindly but that does not alter the case when grown people say no little boys must understand that they mean it but what i want is to go a widen with you said toddy and what i want is that you shall stay at home so you must said mrs burton let us have no more talk about it now shouldn't you like to go into the garden and pick some strawberries all for yourself no i like to go widen toddy said mrs burton don't let me hear one more word about riding well i want to go toddy i will certainly have to punish you if you say any more on this subject and that will make me very unhappy you don't want to make auntie unhappy on her birthday do you no but i do want to go a widen listen toddy said mrs burton with an imperious stamp of her foot and a sudden loss of her entire stock of patience if you say one more word about that trip i will lock you up in the attic chamber where you were day before yesterday and budge shall not be with you toddy gave vent to a perfect torrent of tears and screamed 
i don't want to be locked up and i do want to go a widen toddy suddenly found himself clasped tightly in his aunt's arms in which position he kicked pushed screamed and roared during the passage of two flights of stairs the moment of his final incarceration was marked by a piercing shriek which escaped from the attic window causing the dog jerry to retire precipitately from a pleasing lounging place on the well curb and making a passing farmer to rein up his horses and maintain a listening position for the space of five minutes meanwhile mrs burton descended to the parlor more flushed untidy and angry than one had ever before seen her she soon encountered the gaze of her nephew budge and it was so full of solemnity that mrs burton's anger departed in an instant how would you like to be carried upstairs screaming and put in a lonely room just cause you wanted to go riding asked budge mrs burton was unable to imagine herself in any such position but replied i should never be so foolish as to keep on wanting what i knew i could not have why exclaimed budge are grown folks as smart as all that mrs burton's conscience smoked her not over lightly and she hastened to change the subject and to devote herself assiduously to budge as if to atone for some injury which she might have done to his brother an occasional howl which fell from the attic window increased her zeal for budge's comfort under each one however her resolution grew weaker and finally with a hypocritical excuse to budge mrs burton hurried up to the door of toddy's prison and said through the keyhole toddy what said toddy will you be a good boy now yes if you take me a widen mrs burton turned abruptly away and simply flew down the stairs budge who waited her at the foot instinctively stood aside and exclaimed my i thought you was going to tumble why didn't you bring him down bring who asked mrs burton indignantly oh i know what you went upstairs for said budge your eyes told me all about it you are certainly a rather inconvenient companion said mrs burton averting her face and i want you to run home and ask how your mamma and baby sister are don't stay long remember that lunch will be earlier than usual to-day away went budge and mrs burton devoted herself to thought and self-questioning unquestioning obedience had been her own duty since she could remember yet she was certain that her will was as strong as toddy's if she had been always able to obey certainly the unhappy little boy in the attic was equally capable why should he not do it perhaps she admitted to herself she had inherited a faculty in this direction and perhaps oh, yes certainly toddy had done nothing of the sort how was she to overcome the defect in his disposition or was she to do it at all was it not something with which no one temporarily having a child in charge should interfere as she pondered an occasional scream from toddy helped to unbend the severity of her principles but suddenly her eye rested upon the picture of her husband and she seemed to see in one of the eyes a quizzical expression all her determination came back in an instant with heavy reinforcements and budge came back a few minutes later his bulletins from home and his stores of experience en route consumed but a few moments and then mrs burton proceeded to dress for her ride to exclude toddy's screams she closed her door tightly but toddy's voice was one with which all timber seemed in sympathy and it pierced door and window apparently without effort gradually however it seemed to cease and with the growing infrequency of his howls and the increasing feebleness of their utterance mrs burton's spirits revived dressing leisurely she ascended toddy's prison to receive his declaration of penitence and to accord a gracious pardon she knocked softly at the door and said toddy there was no response so mrs burton knocked and called with more energy than before but without reply a terrible fear occurred to her she had heard of children who screamed themselves to death when angry hastily she opened the door and saw toddy tear-stained and dirty lying on the floor fast asleep 
she stooped over him to be sure that he still breathed and then the expression on his sweetly parted lips was such that she could not help kissing them then she raised the pathetic desolate little figure softly in her arms and the little head dropped upon her shoulder and nestled close to her neck and one little arm was clasped tightly around her throat and a soft voice murmured i wants to go a widen and just then mr burton entered and with a most exasperating affection of ingenuousness and uncertainty asked did you conquer his will my dear his wife annihilated him with a look and led the way to the dining-room meanwhile toddy awoke straightened himself rubbed his eyes recognized his uncle and exclaimed uncle harry does you know where we're going this afternoon we're going a widen and mr burton hid in his napkin all of his face that was below his eyes and his wife wished that his eyes might have been hidden too for never in her life had she been so averse to having her own eyes looked into the extreme saintliness of both boys during the afternoon's ride took the sting out of mrs burton's defeat they gabbled to each other about flowers and leaves and birds and they assumed ownership of the few summer clouds that were visible and made sundry exchanges of them with each when the dog jerry who had surreptitiously followed the carriage and grown weary was taken in by his master they even allowed him to lie at their feet without kicking pinching his ears or pulling his tail as for mrs burton no right-minded husband could wilfully torment his wife upon her birthday so she soon forgot the humiliation of the morning and came home with superb spirits and matchless complexion for the little party her guests soon began to arrive and after the company was assembled mrs burton's chambermaid ushered in budge and toddy each in spotless attire and the dog jerry ushered himself in and toddy saw him and made haste to interview him and the two got inextricably mixed about the legs of a light jardinier and it came down with a crash and then the two were sent into disgrace which suited them exactly although there was a difference between them as to whether the dog jerry should seek and enjoy the seclusion upon which his heart was evidently intent then budge retired with a face full of fatherly solicitude and mrs burton was enabled to devote herself to the friends to whom she had not previously been able to address a single consecutive sentence mrs burton occasionally suggested to her husband that it might be well to see where the boys were and what they were doing but that gentleman had seldom before found himself the only man among a dozen comely and intelligent ladies and he was too conscious of the variety of such experience to trouble himself about a couple of people who had unlimited ability to keep themselves out of trouble so the boys were undisturbed for the space of two hours a sudden summer shower came up in the meantime and a sentimental young lady requested the song rain upon the roof and mrs burton and her husband began to render it as a duet but in the middle of the second stanza mrs burton began to cough mr burton sniffed the air apprehensively while several of the ladies started to their feet while others turned pale the air of the room was evidently filled with smoke there can't be any danger ladies said mrs burton you all know what the american domestic servant is i suppose our cook with her delicate sense of the appropriate is relighting her fire and has the kitchen doors wide open so that all the smoke may escape through the house instead of the chimney i'll go and stop it the mere mention of servants had its usual effect the ladies began at once that animated conversation which this subject has always inspired and which it will probably continue to inspire until all housekeepers gather in that happy land one of whose charms it is that the american kitchen is undiscernible within its borders and the purified domestic may stand before her mistress without needing a scolding but one nervous young lady whose agitation was being manifested by her feet alone happened to touch with the toe of her boot the turn-screw of the hot air register instantly she sprang back and uttered a piercing scream while from the register there arose a thick column of smoke 
fire screamed one lady water shrieked another oh shouted several in chorus some ran upstairs others into the rainy street the nervous young lady fainted a business-like young matron who had for years been maturing plans of operation in case of fire hastily swept into a table cover a dozen books in special morocco bindings and hurried through the rain with them to a house several hundred feet away while the faithful dog jerry scenting the trouble afar off hurried home and did his duty to the best of his ability by barking and snapping furiously at every one and galloping frantically through the house leaving his mark upon almost every square yard of the carpet meanwhile mr burton hurried upstairs coatless with disarranged hair dirty hands smirched face and assured the ladies that there was no danger while budge and toddy the former deadly pale and the latter almost apoplectic in colour sneaked up to their own chamber the company dispersed ladies who had expected carriages did not wait for them but struggled to the extreme verge of politeness for the use of such umbrellas and waterproof cloaks as mrs burton could supply fifteen minutes later the only occupant of the parlour was the dog jerry who lay with alert head in the centre of a large turkish chair mrs burton tenderly supported by her husband descended the stair and contemplated with tightly compressed lips and blazing eyes the disorder of her desolated parlour when however she reached the dining-room and beheld the exquisitely set lunch-table to the arrangement of which she had devoted hours of thought in preceding days and weeks she burst into a flood of tears i'll tell you how it was remarked budge who appeared suddenly and without invitation and whose consciousness of good intention made him as adamant before the indignant frowns of his uncle and aunt i always think bonfires is the nicest thing about celebrations and todd and me have been carrying sticks for two days to make a big bonfire in the back yard to-day but then it rained and rainy sticks won't burn i guess we found that out last thanksgiving day so we thought we'd make one in the cellar cause the top is all tin and the bottom's all dirt and it can't rain in there at all and we got lots of newspapers and kindling wood and put some kerosene on it and it blazed up beautiful and we was just coming up to ask you all down to look at it when in came uncle harry and banged me against the wall and todd into the coal heap and threw a mean old dirty carpet on top of it and wetted it all over little boys never can do anything nice without being made so don't said toddy do see what a awful big splinter i got in my hand when i was frawin wood on a fire i didn't cry a bit about it then cause i thought i was making other folks happy like the lord wants little boys to do but they didn't get happy so now i'm goin to cry about the splinter and toddy raised a howl which was as much superior to his usual cry as things made to order generally are over the ordinary supply we had a torch-like procession too said budge we had to have it in the attic but it wasn't very nice there wasn't any trees up there for the light to dance around on like it does on lection day nights so we just stopped and would have felt real doleful if we hadn't thought of the bonfire where did you leave the torches asked mr burton springing from his chair and lifting his wife to her feet at the same time i i dunno said budge after a moment of thought froed em in a closet where the rags is so's not to dirty the nice floor with em said toddy mr burton hurried upstairs and extinguished a smouldering heap of rags while his wife truer to herself than she imagined she was drew budgie to her and said kindly wanting to make people happy and doing it are two very different things budge yes i should think they was said budge with an emphasis which explained much that was left unsaid little boys is goosies for trying to make big folks happy at all said toddy beginning again to cry oh no they're not dear said mrs burton taking the sorrowful child into her lap but they don't always understand how best to do it so they ought to ask big folks before they begin then there wouldn't be no surprises complained toddy 
tay is we going to eat all this supper i suppose so if we can sighed mrs burton i guess we can budgie and me said toddie and won't we be glad all them women's went it away that evening after the boys had retired mrs burton seemed a little uneasy of mind and at length she said to her husband i feel guilty at never having directed the boys devotions since they have been here and i know no better time than the present in which to begin mr burton's eyes followed his wife reverently as she left the room the service she proposed to render the children she had sometimes performed for himself with results for which he could not be grateful enough and yet it was not with unalloyed anticipation that he softly followed her up the stair mrs burton went into the chamber and found the boys playing battering ram each with a pillow in front of him children said she have you said your prayers no said budge somebody's got to be knocked down first then we will a sudden tumble by toddy was the signal for devotional exercises and both boys knelt beside the bed now darlings said mrs burton you have made some sad mistakes to-day and they should teach you that even when you want most to do right you need to be helped by somebody better don't you think so i do said budge lots i don't said toddy more help i gets to worse things is guess i'll do things all alone after this i know what to say to the lord to-night aunt alice said budge dear little boy said mrs burton go on dear lord said budge we do have the awfulest times when we try to make other folks happy do please lord please teach big folks how hard little folks have to think before they do things for em and make em understand little folks every way better than they do so that they don't make little folks unhappy when they try to make big folks feel jolly make big folks have to think as hard as little folks do for christ's sake amen oh yes and bless dear mamma and the sweet little sister baby how's that aunt alice mrs burton did not reply and budge on turning saw only her departing figure while toddy remarked now it's my time turn dear lord when i guess to be a little boy anzel up in heaven don't let growed up angels come along whenever i'm doin anything nice for em and say don't or tumble me down in heaps of nasty old black coal there amen it was with a sneaking sense of relief that mrs burton awoke on the following morning and realized that the day was sunday even school teachers have two days of rest in every seven thought mrs burton to herself and no one doubts that they deserve them how much more deserving of rest and relief then must be the volunteer teacher who not for a few hours only but from dawn to twilight has charge of two children whose capacity for both learning and mischief surely equals any school full of boys the realization that she was attempting for a few days only that which mothers everywhere were doing without hope of rest excepting in heaven made mrs burton feel more humble and worthless than she ever had done in her life before but it did not banish her wish to turn the children over to the care of their uncle for the day if mrs burton had been honest with herself she would have admitted that the principal cause of her anxiety for relief was her unwillingness to have her husband witness the failures which she had come to believe were to be her daily lot while trying to train her nephews thoughts of a sunday excursion from participation in which she should in some way excuse herself of volunteering to relieve her sister-in-law's nurse during the day and thus leaving her husband in charge of the house and the children of making that visit to her mother which is always in order with the newly made wife all these and other devices not so practicable came before mrs burton's mind's eye for comparison but they all and together took sudden wing when mr burton awoke and complained of a raging toothache truly pitiful and sympathetic as mrs burton was she exhibited remarkable resignation in the face of the thought that her husband would probably need to remain in his room all day and that it would be absolutely necessary to keep the children out of his sight and hearing 
then he could find nothing to criticize she might fail as frequently as she probably would but he would know only of her successes end of story thirty five part one story thirty five of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirty five budge and toddy at aunt alice's part two a light knock was heard at mrs burton's door and then without waiting for invitation there came in two fresh rosy faces two heads of disarranged hair and two long white nightgowns and the occupant of the longer gown exclaimed say uncle harry do you know it's sunday what are you going to do about it we always have lots done for us on sundays because it's the only day papa's home yes i i think i've heard uh, something of the kind uh, before mumbled mr burton with difficulty between fingers which covered his aching incisor oh exclaimed toddy i believe he's going to play bear come on budge we've got to be dogs and toddy buried his face in the bed coverings and succeeded in fastening his teeth in his uncle's calf a howl from the sufferer did not frighten off the amateur dog and he was finally dislodged only by being clutched by the throat by his victim that isn't the way to play bear complained toddy you ought to keep on a howlin let me keep on a bitin and then you give me pennies to stop that's the way papa does can you see how tom lawrence can be so idiotic asked mrs burton i suppose i could replied the gentleman if i hadn't such a toothache you poor old fellow said mrs burton tenderly then she turned to her nephews and exclaimed now boys listen to me uncle harry is very sick to-day he has a dreadful toothache and every particle of bother and noise will make it worse you must both keep away from his room and be as quiet as possible wherever you may be in the house even the sound of people talking is very annoying to a person with a toothache then you're a baddy woman to stay in here and keep a talkin all the whole time said toddy when it makes poor old uncle harry supper so go away mrs burton's lord and master was not in too much pain to shake considerably with silent laughter over this unexpected rebuke and the lady herself was too thoroughly startled to devise an appropriate retort so the boys amused themselves by a general exploration of the chamber not omitting even the pockets of their uncle's clothing this work completed to the full extent of their ability the boys demanded breakfast breakfast won't be ready until eight o'clock said mrs burton and it is now only six if you little boys don't want to feel dreadfully hungry you had better go back to bed and lie as quiet as possible is that the way not to be hungry asked toddy with wide open eyes which always accompany the receptive mind certainly said mrs burton if you run about you agitate your stomachs and that makes them restless and so you feel hungry gracious said toddy what lots of things little boys has got to learn hasn't they come on budgie let's go put our tummocks to bed and keep em from getting agiterated all right said budge but say aunt alice don't you suppose our stomachs would be sleepier and not so restless if there was some crackers or bread and butter in em there's no one downstairs to get you any said mrs burton oh said budge we can find them we know where everything is in the pantries and storeroom i wish i were so smart sighed mrs burton go ahead get what you want but don't come back to this room again and don't let me find anything in disorder downstairs or i shall never trust you in my kitchen again away flew the children but their disappearance only made room for a new torment for mr burton stopped in the middle of the operation of shaving himself and remarked i've been longing for sunday to come for your sake my dear the boys as you have frequently observed have very strange notions about holy things but they are also by nature quite religious and spiritually minded 
you are not only this latter but you are free from strange doctrines and the traditions of men the mystical influence of the day will make themselves felt upon those innocent little hearts and you will have the opportunity to correct wrong teachings and instil new sentiments and truths mr burton's voice had grown a little shaky as he reached the close of this neat and reverential speech so that his wife scrutinized his face closely to see if there might not be a laugh somewhere about it a friendly coating of lather protected one cheek however and the troublesome tooth had distorted the shape of the other so mrs burton was compelled to accept the mingled ascription of praise and responsibility which she did with a sinking heart i'll take care of em while you're at church my dear said mr burton they're always saintly with sick people mrs burton breathed a sigh of relief she determined that she would extemporize a special children's service immediately after breakfast and impress her nephew as fully as possible with the spirit of the day then if her husband would but continue the good work thus begun it would be impossible for the boys to fall from grace in the few hours which remained between dinner-time and darkness full of her project and forgetting that she had allowed her chambermaid to go to early mass and promised herself to see that the children were dressed for breakfast mrs burton at the breakfast-table noticed that her nephews did not respond with their usual alacrity to the call of the bell recalling her forgotten duty she hurried to the boy's chamber and found them already enjoying a repast which was remarkable at least for variety on a small table drawn to the side of the bed was a pie a bowl of pickles a dish of honey in the comb and a small paper package of cinnamon bark and with spoons knives and forks and fingers the boys were helping themselves alternately to these delicacies seeing his aunt toddy looked rather guilty but budge displayed the smile of the fully justified and remarked now you know what kind of meals little boys like aunt alice i hope you won't forget it while we're here what do you mean exclaimed mrs burton sternly by bringing such things upstairs why said budge you told us to get what we wanted and we supposed you told the truth i ain't as hungry as i was remarked toddy but my tummock feels as if it growed big and got little again every minute or two and it hurts i wishes we could put tummocks away when we get done usin em like we do hats and overshoes to sweep the remains of the unique morning lunch into a heap and away from her nephews was a work which occupied but a second or two of mrs burton's time this done two little boys found themselves robed more rapidly than they had ever before been arrived at the breakfast-table they eyed with withering contempt an irreproachable cutlet some crisp brown potatoes of wafer-like thinness and a heap of rolls almost as light as snowflakes we don't want none of this kind of breakfast said budge of course we don't said toddy when we're so awful full of other things i don't know where i's going to put my dinner when it comes time to eat it don't fret about that todd said budge don't you know papa says that the bible says something that means don't worry till you have to mrs burton raised her eyebrows with horror not unmixed with inquiry and her husband hastened to give budge's sentiment its proper biblical wording sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof mrs burton's wonder was allayed by the explanation although her horror was not and she made haste to say boys we will have a little sunday school all by ourselves in the parlor immediately after breakfast hooray shouted budge and will you give us a ticket and pass around a box of pennies just like they do in big sunday schools i suppose so said mrs burton who had not previously thought of the special attractions of the successful sunday school let's go right in todd said budge cos the dog's in there i saw him as i came down and i shut all the doors so he couldn't get out we can have some fun with him for sunday school begins both boys started for the parlor door and guided by that marvellous instinct with which providence arms the few against the many and the weak against the strong the dog jerry also approached the door from the inside 
as the door opened there was heard a convulsive howl and a general tumbling of small boys while at almost the same instant the dog jerry flew into the dining-room and hid himself in the folds of his mistress's morning robe two or three minutes later budge entered the dining-room with a very rueful countenance and remarked i guess we need that sunday school pretty quick aunt alice the dog don't want to play with us and we ought to be comforted some way they're grown people all over again remarked mr burton with a laugh what do you mean demanded mrs burton only this that when their own devices fail they're in a hurry for the consolation of religion said mr burton may i visit the sunday school i suppose i can't keep you away sighed mrs burton leading the way to the parlour boys said she greeting her nephews first we'll sing a little hymn what shall it be old uncle ned said toddy promptly oh that's not a sunday song said mrs burton i think tis said toddy cos it says three or four times he's gone where de good niggers go and that's heaven you know so it's a sunday song i think glory glory hallelujah is nicer said budge and i know that's a sunday song cos i've heard it in church all right said toddy and he immediately started the old air himself with the words there lies the whisky bottle empty on the shelf but was suddenly brought to order by a shake from his aunt while his uncle danced about the front parlour in an ecstasy not directly traceable to toothache that's not a sunday song either toddy said mrs burton the words are real rowdyish where did you learn them round the corner from our house said toddy and you can shing your old songs yourself if you don't like mine mrs burton went to the piano rambled among the chords for a few seconds and finally recalled a sunday school air in which toddy joined as angelically as if his own musical taste had never been impugned now i guess we'd better take up the collection before any little boys lose their pennies said budge hurrying to the dining-room and returning with a strawberry box which seemed to have been specially provided for the occasion this he passed gravely before toddy and toddy held his hand over it as carefully as if he were depositing hundreds and then toddy took the box and passed it before budge who made the same dumb show after which budge retook the box shook it listened and remarked it don't rattle i guess it's all paper money to-day placed it upon the mantel reseated himself and remarked now bring on your lesson mrs burton opened her bible with a sense of utter helplessness with the natural instinct of a person given to thoroughness she opened at the beginning of the book but she speedily closed it again the first chapter of genesis had suggested many a puzzling question even to her orthodox mind turning the leaves rapidly passing for conscience sake the record of many a battle the details of which would have delighted the boys and hurrying by the prophecies as records not for the minds of children she at last reached the new testament and the ever new story of the only boy who ever was all that his parents and relatives could wish him to be the lesson will be about jesus said mrs burton little boy jesus or big man jesus asked toddy uh both replied the teacher in some confusion all oh, white right, said toddy go on there was once a time when all the world was in trouble without knowing exactly why said mrs burton but the lord understood it for he understands everything does he know how it feels to be a little boy asked toddy and be sent to bed when he don't want to go and he determined to comfort the world as he always does when the world finds out it can't comfort itself continued mrs burton entirely ignoring her nephew's question but wasn't there lots of little boys then asked toddy and didn't they used to be comforted as well as big folks i suppose so said mrs burton but he knew if he comforted grown people they would make the children happy i wish he'd comfort you and uncle harry every morning then said toddy go on so he sent his own son his only son down to the world to be a dear little baby i should think he'd have made him a sister baby said judge if he'd wanted to make everybody happy 
he knew best said mrs burton and while smart people everywhere were wondering what would or could happen to quiet the restless heart of people is restless hearts like restless stomachs interrupted toddy kind of limpy and wabbly i suppose so said mrs burton poor folks said toddy clasping his hands over his waistband i sorry for em while smart folks were trying to think out what should be done continued mrs burton some simple shepherds who used to sit around at night under the moon and stars and wonder about things which they could not understand saw a wonderfully bright star up in the sky was it one of the twinkle twinkle kind or one of the standstill kind asked toddy i don't know said mrs burton after a moment's reflection why do you ask cause said toddy i know what twas there for and it ought to a twinkled cause twinkly star bobs open and shut that way cause they're laughin and can't keep still and i know i'd have laughed if i'd been a star and was goin to make a lot of folks so awful happy go on then said mrs burton looking alternately and frequently at the two accounts of the advent they suddenly saw an angel and the shepherds were afraid should think they would be said toddy everybody gets afraid when they see good people round i spect they thought the angel would say don't in about a minute but the angel told them not to be afraid said mrs burton for he had come to bring good news there was to be a dear little baby born at bethlehem and he would make everybody happy wouldn't it be nice if that angel would come and do it all over again said budge only he ought to pick out little boys instead of sheep fellows i wouldn't be afraid of an angel neither would i said toddy but i'd just go round behind him and see how his wings was fastened on then a great many other angels came said mrs burton and they all sang and sang together the poor shepherds didn't know what to make of it but after the singing was over they all started for bethlehem to see that wonderful baby just like the other day we went to see the sister baby yes said mrs burton but instead of finding him in a pleasant home in a nice room with careful friends and nurses around him he was in a manger out in a stable that was cause he was so smart that he could do just what he wanted to and be just what he liked said budge and he was a little boy and little boys always like stables better than houses i wish i could live in a stable always and forever so do i said toddy and sleep in mangers cause then the horses would kick anybody that made me put on clean clothes when i didn't want to they gave us him presents didn't they yes said mrs burton gold frankincense and myrrh why didn't they give him rattles and squeaky balls like folks did butter filly when he was a baby asked toddy because toddy said mrs burton glad of an opportunity to get the sentiment of the story into her own hands from which it had departed very early in the course of the lesson because he was no common baby like other children he was the lord what the lord wants a dear little baby exclaimed toddy yes replied mrs burton shuddering to realize that toddy had not before been taught of the nature of the holy trinity and played around with other little boys continued toddy i i suppose so said mrs burton fearing lest in trying to instill reverence into her nephews she herself might prove irreverent did somebody say don't at him every time he did anything continued toddy no i imagine not said mrs burton because he was always good that don't make any difference said toddy the better a little boy tries to be the more folks say don't to him so i guess nobody had any time to say anything else at all to jesus what did he do next asked budge as deeply interested as if he had not heard the same story many times before oh he grew strong in body and spirit said mrs burton and everybody loved him but before he had time to do all that an angel came and frightened his papa in a dream and told him that the king of that country would kill little jesus if he could find him so joseph the papa of jesus and mary his mamma got up in the middle of the night and started off to egypt 
seems to me that egypt was bout as bad in those days as europe is now remarked budge whenever papa tells about anybody that nobody can find he says gone to europe i s'pose what did they find when they got there oh, i don't know said mrs burton musing i suppose the papa worked hard for money to buy good food and comfortable resting places for his wife and baby and i suppose the mamma walked about the fields and picked pretty flowers for her baby to play with and i suppose the baby cooed when his mamma gave them to him and laughed and danced and played and then got tired and came and hid his little face in his mamma's lap and was taken into her arms and held ever so tight and fell asleep and that his mother looked into his face as if she would look through it while she tried to find out what her baby would be and do when he grew up and whether he would be taken away from her while it seemed as if she couldn't live at all without having him very closely pressed to her breast and mrs burton's voice grew a little shaky and finally failed her entirely budge came in front of her scrutinized her intently but with great sympathy also and finally leaned his elbows on her knees dropped his face into his own hands looked up into her face and remarked why aunt alice she was just like my mamma wasn't she and i think you are just like both of em mrs burton took budge hastily into her arms covered his face with kisses and totally destroyed another chance of explaining the difference between the earthly and the heavenly to her pupils while toddy eyed the couple with evident disfavour and remarked i think twould be nicer if you'd see if dinner was being got ready instead of stoppin tellin stories and huggin budge my tummock's all got it little again mrs burton came back to the world of to-day from that of history though not without a sigh while the dog jerry who had divined the peaceful nature of the occasion so far as to feel justified in reclining beneath his mistress's chair now contracted himself into the smallest possible space slunk out of the doorway and took a lively quick step in the direction of the shrubbery toddy had seen him however and told the news to budge and both boys were soon in pursuit noticing which the dog jerry speedily betook himself to that distant retirement which the dog who has experience in small boys knows so well how to discover and maintain as the morning wore on the boys grew restless fought drummed on the piano snarled when that instrument was closed meddled with everything that was within reach and finally grew so troublesome that their aunt soon felt that to lose was cheaper than to save so she left the house to the children and sought the side of the lounge upon which her afflicted husband reclined the divining sense of childhood soon found her out however and budge remarked ah alice if you're going to church seems to me it's time you was getting ready i can't go to church budge sighed mrs burton if i do you boys will only turn the whole house upside down and drive your poor uncle nearly crazy no we won't said budge you don't know what nice nurses we can be to sick people papa says nobody can even imagine how well we can take care of anybody until they see us do it if you don't believe it just leave us with uncle harry and stay home from church and peek through the keyhole go on ally said mr burton if you want to go to church don't be afraid to leave me i think you should go after your experience of this morning i shouldn't think your mind could be at peace until you had joined your voice with that of the great congregation and acknowledged yourself to be a miserable sinner mrs burton winced but nevertheless retired and soon appeared dressed for church kissed her husband and her nephews gave many last instructions and departed budge followed her with his eye until she had stepped from the piazza and then remarked with a sigh of relief now i guess we'll have what papa calls a good old-fashioned time we've got rid of her budge exclaimed mr burton sternly and springing to his feet do you know who you are talking about don't you know that your aunt alice is my wife and that she has saved you from many a scolding done you many a favour and been your best friend oh 
yes said budge with at least a dozen inflections on each word but everyday friends and sunday friends are kind of different don't you think so she can't make whistles or catch bullfrogs or carry both of us up the mountain on her shoulders or sing roll jordan and do you expect me to do all these things to-day asked mr burton no said budge unless you should get well and feel just like it but we'd like to be with somebody who could do em if he wanted to we like ladies that's all ladies but then we like men that's all men too aunt alice is a good deal like an angel i think and you you ain't and we don't want to be with angels all the time until we're angels ourselves mr burton turned over suddenly and contemplated the back of the lounge at this honest avowal of one of humanity's prominent weaknesses while budge continued we don't want you to get to be an angel so what i want to know is how to make you well don't you think if i borrowed papa's horse and carriage and took you riding you'd feel better i know he'd lend them to me if i told him you were going to drive and if you said you were going with me to take care of me suggested mr burton yes said budge as hesitatingly as if such an idea had never occurred to him and don't you think that up to the top of the hawk's nest rock and out to passaic falls would be the nicest places for a sick man to go when you got tired of ridin you could stop the carriage and cut us a cane or make us whistles or find us finkster apples the seed balls of the wild azalea or even send us in swimming in a brook somewhere if you got tired of us hm grunted mr burton and you might take things to eat with you suggested toddy and when you got real tired and felt bad you might stop and have a little picnic i think that would be durst a thing for a man with the toothache and we could help you lotch i'll see how i feel after dinner said mr burton but what are you going to do for me between now and then to make me feel better we tell you stories said toddy them's what sick folks always likes very well said mr burton begin right away all right said toddy do you want a sad story or a jolly story anything said mr burton men with a toothache can stand nearly anything don't draw on your imagination too hard don't never draw on imaginations said toddy i only draws on slates never mind give us the story well said toddy seating himself in a rocking chair and fixing his eyes on the ceiling guess i'll tell about abraham and isaac once the lord told a man named abraham to go up the mountain and chop his little boy's throat open and burn him up on an altar so abraham started to go to do it and he made his little boy isaac that he was going to chop and burn up carry the kindling wood he was going to set him afire with and i want to know if you think that was a very nice of him well no said mr burton tell you what said budge you don't ever catch me carrying sticks up the mountain even if my papa wants me to when they got up there said toddy abraham made an altar and put little ikey on it and took a knife and was going to chop his throat open when an angel came out of heaven and said stop a doin that so abraham stopped and ikey scooted and abraham saw a sheep caught in the bushes and he caught him and killed him he wasn't going to climb way up a mountain to kill somebody and not have his knife bluggy a bit and he burned the sheep up and then he went home again i'll bet you isaac's mamma never knew what his papa wanted to do with him said budge or she'd never let her little boy go away in the morning do you want to bet no not on sunday i guess said mr burton now suppose you little boys go out of doors and play for a while while uncle tries to get a nap the boys accepted the suggestion and disappeared half an hour later as mrs burton was walking home from church under escort of old general porcupine and enduring with saintly fortitude the general's compliments about her management of the children there came screams of fear and anguish from the general's own grounds which the couple were passing who can that be exclaimed the general his short hairs bristling like the quills of his titular godfather we have no children 
i think i know the voices gasped mrs burton turning pale bless my soul exclaimed the general with an accent which showed that he was wishing the reverse of blessings upon souls less needy than his own you don't mean oh i do said mrs burton wringing her hands do hurry the general puffed and snorted up his gravel walk and toward the shrubbery behind which was a fish pond from which direction the sound came mrs burton followed in time to see her nephew budge help his brother out of the pond while the general tugged at a large crawfish which had fastened its claw upon toddy's finger the fish was game but with a mighty pull from the general and a superhuman shriek from toddy the fish's claw and body parted company and the general still holding the ladder tightly staggered backward and himself fell into the pond ow 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 howled toddy clasping the skirt of his aunt's mauve silk in a ruinous embrace while the general floundered and snorted like a whale in dying agonies and budge laughed as merrily as if the whole scene had been provided especially for his entertainment mrs burton hurried her nephews away forgetting in her mortification to thank the general for his service and placing a hand over toddy's mouth it hurts mumbled toddy what did you touch the fish at all for asked mrs burton it was a little baby lobster sobbed toddy and i loves little baby all kinds of them and i want to pet him and then i wanted to grope him why didn't you do it then demanded the lady cause he wouldn't grop said toddy he isn't all gropped yet true enough the claw of the fish still hung at toddy's finger and mrs burton spoiled a pair of four-button kids in detaching it while budge continued to laugh at length however mirth gave place to brotherly love and budge tenderly remarked toddy dear don't you love brother budge yes sobbed toddy then you ought to be happy said budge for you've made him awful happy if the fish hadn't caught you the general couldn't have pulled him off and then he wouldn't have tumbled into the pond and oh my didn't he splash bully then you's got to be bited with a fish said toddy and make him tumble in again for me to laugh about you're two naughty boys said mrs burton is this the way you take care of your sick uncle did take care of him exclaimed toddy told him a lovely bible story and you didn't and he wouldn't have had no sunday at all if i hadn't done it and we're going to take him widen this afternoon mrs burton hurried home but it seemed to her that she had never met so many inquiring acquaintances during so short a walk arrived at last she ordered her nephews to their room and flung herself in tears beside her husband murmuring henry and mr burton having viewed the ruined dress with the eye of experience uttered the single word boys what am i to do with them asked the unhappy woman mr burton was an affectionate husband he adored womankind and sincerely bemoaned its special grievances but he did not resist the temptation to recall his wife's announcement of five days before so he whispered train them mrs burton's humiliation by her own lips was postponed by a heavy footfall which by turning her face she discovered was that of her brother-in-law tom lawrence who remarked tender confidences eh well i'm sorry i intruded there's nothing like em if you want to be happy but helen's pretty well to-day and don to have her boys with her and i'm even worse with a similar longing you can't spare them i suppose the peculiar way in which tom lawrence's eyes danced as he awaited a reply would at any other time have roused all the defiance in alice burton's nature but now looking at the front of her beautiful dress she only said why i suppose we might spare them for an hour or two you poor dear spartan said tom with genuine sympathy you shall be at peace until their bedtime anyhow and mrs burton found occasion to rearrange the bandage on her husband's face so as to whisper in his ear thank heaven End of story thirty five part two
story thirty six of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirty six sailing upstream the following is quoted by permission from mr haberton's popular book the barton experience published by g p putnam son new york the superintendency of the mississippi valley woolen mills was a position which exactly suited fred macdonald and it gave him occasion for the expenditure of whatever superfluous energy he found himself possessed of yet it did not engross his entire attention the faculty which the busiest of young men have for finding time in which to present themselves well clothed and unbusinesslike to at least one young woman is as remarkable and admirable as it is inexplicable the evenings which did not find fred in parson wedgwell's parlour were few indeed and if when he was with esther he did not talk quite as sentimentally as he had done in the earlier days of his engagement and if he talked business very frequently the change did not seem distasteful to the lady herself for the business of which he talked was in the main a sort which loving women have for ages recognized as the inevitable and to which they have subjected themselves with a unanimity which deserves the gratitude of all humanity fred talked of a cottage which he might enter without first knocking at the door and of a partnership which should be unlimited if he learned in the course of successive conversations that even in partnerships of the most extreme order many compromises are absolutely necessary the lesson was one which improved his character in the ratio in which it abased his pride the cottage grew as rapidly as the mill and on his returns from various trips for machinery there came with fred's freight certain packages which prevented their owner from appearing so completely the absorbed business man which he flattered himself that he seemed then the partnership was formed one evening in parson wedgwell's own church in the presence of a host of witnesses fred appearing as self-satisfied and radiant as the gainer in such transactions always does while esther's noble face and drooping eyes showed beyond doubt who it was that was the giver as the weeks succeeded each other after the wedding however no acquaintance of the couple could wonder whether the gainer or the giver was the happier fred improved rapidly as the schoolboy improves but esther's graces were already of mature growth and rejoiced in their opportunity for development though she could not have explained how it happened she could not but notice that maidens regarded her wonderingly wives contemplated her wistfully frowns departed and smiles appeared when she approached people who were usually considered prosaic yet shadows sometimes stole over her face when she looked at certain of her old acquaintances and the cause thereof soon took a development which was anything but pleasing to her husband fred said esther one evening it makes me real unhappy sometimes to think of the good wives there are who are not as happy as i am i think of mrs mosier and mrs crame and the only reason that i can see is their husbands drink i guess you're right eddie said fred they didn't begin their domestic tyranny in advance as you did bless you for it but why don't their husbands stop asked esther too deeply interested in her subject to notice her husband's compliment they must see what they're doing and how cruel it all is they're too far gone to stop i suppose that's the reason said fred it hasn't been easy work for me to keep my promise eddie and i'm a young man mosier and crame are middle-aged men and liquor is simply necessary to them that dreadful old bunley wasn't too old to reform it seems said esther fred i believe one reason is that no one has asked them to stop see how good harry wainwright has been since he found that so many people were interested in him that day yes drawled fred evidently with a suspicion of what was coming and trying to change the subject by suddenly burying himself in his memorandum book but this ruse did not succeed for esther crossed the room to where fred sat placed her hands on his shoulders 
and a kiss on his forehead and exclaimed fred you're the proper person to reform those two men oh eddie groaned fred you're entirely mistaken why they laugh right in my face if they didn't get angry and knock me down reformers want to be older men better men men like your father for instance if people are to listen to them father says they need to be men who understand the nature of those they are talking to replied esther and you once told me that you understood mosier and crane perfectly but just think of what they are eddie pleaded fred mosier is a contractor and crane's a steamboat captain such men never reform though they always are good fellows why if i were to speak to either of them on the subject they'd laugh in my face or curse me the only way i was able to make peace with them for stopping drinking myself was to say that i did it to please my wife did they accept that as sufficient excuse asked esther yes said fred reluctantly and biting his lips over this slip of tongue then you've set them a good example and i can't believe its effect will be lost said esther i sincerely hope it won't said fred very willing to seem a reformer at heart nobody would be gladder than i to see those fellows with wives as happy as mine seems to be then why don't you follow it up fred dear and make sure of your hopes being realized you can't imagine how much happier i would be if i could meet those dear women without feeling that i had to hide the joy that's so hard to keep to myself the conversation continued with considerable strain to fred's amiability but his sophistry was no match for his wife's earnestness and he was finally compelled to promise that he would make an appeal to crame with whom he had a business engagement on the arrival of crame's boat the excellence before the whistles of the steamer were next heard however esther learned something of the sufferings of would-be reformers and found cause to wonder who was to endure most that mrs crame should have a sober husband for fred was alternately cross moody abstracted and inattentive and even sullenly remarked at his breakfast-table one morning that he shouldn't be sorry if the excellence were to blow up and leave mrs crame to find her happiness in widowhood but no such luck befell the lady the whistle signals of the excellence were again heard on the river and the nature of fred's business with the captain made it unadvisable for fred to make an excuse for leaving the boat unvisited it did seem to fred macdonald as if everything conspired to make his task as hard as it could possibly be crame was already under the influence of more liquor than was necessary to his well-being and the boat carried as passengers a couple of men who though professional gamblers crame found very jolly company when they were not engaged in their business calling besides captain crame was running against time with an opposition boat which had just been put upon the river and he appreciated the necessity of having the boat's bar well stocked and freely opened to whoever along the river was influential in making or marring the reputation of steamboats fred finally got the captain into his own room however and made a freight contract so absent-mindedly that the sagacious captain gained an immense advantage over him then he acted so awkwardly and looked so pale that the captain suggested chills and prescribed brandy fred smiled feebly and replied no thank you sam brandy's at the bottom of the trouble i uh here fred made a tremendous attempt to rally himself i want you to swear off sam the astonishment of captain crame was marked enough to be alarming at first then the ludicrous feature of fred's request struck him so forcibly that he burst into a laugh before whose greatness fred trembled and shrank well by thunder exclaimed the captain when he recovered his breath if that isn't the best thing i ever heard yet the idea of a steamboat captain swearing off his whiskey say fred don't you want me to join the church i forgot that you'd married a preacher's daughter or i wouldn't have been so puzzled over your white face to-day sam crane brought down to cold water wouldn't the boys along the river get up a sweet lot of names for me the cold water captain 
psalm singing sammy and then when an editor or any other visitor came aboard wouldn't i look the thing hauling out glasses and a pitcher of water say fred does your wife let you drink tea and coffee sam exclaimed fred springing to his feet if you don't stop slanting at my wife i'll knock you down good said the captain without exhibiting any signs of trepidation now you talk like yourself again i beg your pardon old fellow you know i was only joking but it is too funny you'll have to take a trip or two with me again though and be reformed not any said fred resuming his chair take your wife along and reform yourself look here now young man said the captain you're cracking on too much steam honestly fred i've kept a sharp eye on you for two or three months and i am right glad you can let whisky alone i've seen times when i wished i were in your boots but steamboats can't be run without liquor however it may be with woolen mills that's all nonsense said fred you get trade because you run your boat on time charge fair prices and deliver your freight in good order who gives you business because you drink and treat the captain being unable to recall any shipper of the class alluded to by fred changed his course tisn't so much that said he it's a question of reputation how would i feel to go ashore at pittsburgh or louisville or cincinnati and refuse to drink with anybody why twould ruin me it's different with you who don't have to meet anybody but religious old farmers besides you've just been married and you've been married for five years said fred with a sudden sense of help at hand how do you suppose your wife feels captain crame's jollity subsided a little but with only a little hesitation he replied oh she's used to it she doesn't mind you're the only person in town that thinks so sam said fred captain crame got up and paced his little stateroom two or three times with a face full of uncertainty at last he replied well between old friends fred i don't think so very strongly myself hang it i wish i'd been brought up a preacher or something of the kind so i wouldn't have had business ruining my chances of being the right sort of a family man emily don't like my drinking and i promised to look up some other business but tisn't easy to get out of steamboating when you've got a good boat and a first-rate trade once she felt so awfully about it that i did swear off don't tell anybody for god's sake but i did i had to look out for my character along the river though so i swore off on the sly and played sick i'd give my orders to the mates and clerks from my bed in here and then i'd lock myself in and read novels and the bible to keep from thinking twas awful dry work all around but whole hog or none is my style you know there was fun in it though to think o doing something that no other captain on the river ever did but thunder by the time night came i was so tired of loafing that i wrapped a blanket around my head and shoulders like a hoosier sneaked out the outer door here and walked the guards between towns but i was so frightened for fear some one would know me that the walk did me more harm than good and blue why a whole cargo of indigo would have looked like a snowstorm alongside of my feelings the second day pon my word fred i caught myself crying in the afternoon just before dark and i couldn't find out what for either i tell you i was scared and things got worse as time spun along the dreams i had that night made me howl and i felt worse yet when daylight came along again toward the next night i was just afraid to go to sleep so i made up my mind to get well go on duty and dodge everybody that it seemed i ought to drink with why the lord bless your soul the first time we shoved off from a town i walked up to the bar just as i always did after leaving towns the barkeeper set out my particular bottle naturally enough knowing nothing about my little game i poured my couple of fingers and dropped it down as innocent as a lamb before i knew what i was doing by george my boy twas like opening the lock gates i was just heavenly gay before morning there was one good thing about it though i never told emily i was going to swear off i was going to surprise her so i had the disappointment all to myself maybe she isn't as happy as your wife but whatever else i've done or not done i've never lied to her it's a pity you hadn't promised her then before you tried your experiment said fred the captain shook his head gravely and replied 
i guess not why i'd have either killed somebody or killed myself if i'd gone on a day or two longer i suppose i'd have got along better if i'd had anybody to keep me company or reason with me like a schoolmaster but i hadn't i didn't know anybody that i dared trust with a secret like that i hadn't reformed then eh huh? queried fred you why you're one of the very fellows i dodged just as i got aboard the boat i came down late on purpose i saw you out aft i tell you i was under my blankets with a towel wrapped around my jaw in about one minute and was just a praying that you hadn't seen me come aboard fred laughed but his laughter soon made place for a look of tender solicitude the unexpected turn that had been reached in the conversation he had so dreaded and the sympathy which had been awakened in him by crame's confidence and openness temporarily made of fred macdonald a man with whom fred himself had never before been acquainted a sudden idea struck him sam said he try it over again and i'll stay by you i'll nurse you crack jokes fight off the blues for you keep your friends away i'll even break your neck for you if you like seeing as you if it'll keep you straight will you though said the captain with a look of admiration undisguised except by wonder you're the first friend i ever had then by thunder how marrying eddie wedgewell did improve you fred but and the captain's face lengthened again there's a fellow's reputation to be considered and where'll mine be after it gets around that i've sworn off reputation be hanged exclaimed fred lose it for your wife's sake besides you'll make reputation instead of lose it you'll be as famous as the red river raft or the mammoth cave the only thing of the kind west of the alleghanies as for the boys tell them i've bet you a hundred that you can't stay off your liquor for a year and that you're not the man to take a dare that sounds like business exclaimed the captain springing to his feet let me drop a pledge said fred eagerly drawing pen and ink toward him no you don't my boy said the captain gently and pushing fred out of the room and upon the guards emily shall do that below there perkins i've got to go uptown for an hour see if you can't pick up freight to pay laying up expenses somehow fred go home and get your traps now's the accepted time as your father-in-law has dinged at me many a sunday from the pulpit as sam crane strode toward the body of the town his business instincts took strong hold of his sentiments in the manner natural alike to saints and sinners and he laid a plan of operations against whisky which was characterized by the apparent recklessness but actual prudence which makes for glory in steamboat captains as it does in army commanders as was his custom in business he first drove at full speed upon the greatest obstacles so it came to pass he burst into his own house threw his arms around his wife with more than ordinary tenderness and then looking into her eyes with a daring born of utter desperation said emily i came back to sign the strongest temperance pledge that you can possibly draw up fred macdonald wanted to write out one but i told him that nobody but you should do it you've earned the right to poor girl no such duty and surprise having ever before come hand in hand to mrs crane she acted as every true woman will imagine that she herself would have done under similar circumstances and this action made it not so easy as it might otherwise have been to see just where the pen and ink were or to prevent the precious document when completed from being disfigured by peculiar blots which were neither finger marks nor ink spots yet which in shape and size suggested both of these indications of unneatness mrs crame was not an adept at literary composition and being conscious of her own deficiency she begged that a verbal pledge might be substituted but her husband was firm a contract won't steer worth a cent unless it's in writing emily said he looking over his wife's shoulder as she wrote gracious girl you're making it too thin any greenhorn could sail right through that and all around it here let me have it and crame wrote dictating aloud to himself as he did so and the party of the first part 
hereby agrees to do everything else that the spirit of this agreement seems to the party of the second part to indicate or imply this he read over to his wife saying that's the way we fix contracts that aren't shipshape emily a steamboat couldn't be run in any other way then crame wrote at the foot of the paper sam crame captain steamer excellence surveyed the document with evident pride and handed it to his wife saying now you see you've got me so i can't ever get out of it by trying to make out that twas some other sam crame that you reformed oh husband said mrs crame throwing her arms about the captain's neck don't talk in that dreadful business way i'm too happy to bear it i want to go with you on this trip the captain shrank away from his wife's arms and a cold perspiration started all over him as he exclaimed oh don't little girl wait till next trip there's an unpleasant set of passengers aboard the barometer points to rainy weather so you'd have to stay in the cabin all the time our cook is sick and his cubs serve up the most infernal messes we're light of freight and have got to stop at every warehouse on the river and the old boat'll be either shrieking or bumping or blowing off steam the whole continual time mrs crane's happiness had been frightening some of her years away and her smile carried sam himself back to his premarital period as she said never mind the rest i see you don't want me to go and then she became mrs crame again as she said pressing her face closely to her husband's breast but i hope you won't get any freight anywhere so you can get home all the sooner then the captain called on dr white and announced such a collection of symptoms that the doctor grew alarmed insisted on absolute quiet and conveyed crame in his own carriage to the boat saw him into his berth and gave to fred macdonald a multitude of directions and cautions the sober recording of which upon paper was of great service in saving fred from suffering over the quixotic aspect which the whole project had begun in his mind to take on he felt ashamed even to look squarely into crane's eye and his mind was greatly relieved when the captain turned his face to the wall and exclaimed fred for goodness sake get out of here i feel enough like a baby now without having a nurse alongside i'll do well enough for a few hours just look in once in a while during the first day of the trip crane made no trouble for himself or fred under the friendly shelter of night the two men had a two-hour chat which was alternately humorous business-like and retrospective and then crane fell asleep the next day was reasonably pleasant out of doors so the captain wrapped himself in a blanket and sat in an extension chair on the guards where with solemn face he received some condolences which went far to keep him in good humour after the sympathizers had departed on the second night the captain was restless and the two men played cards on the third day the captain's physique reached the bottom of its stock of patience and protested indignantly at the withdrawal of its customary stimulus and it acted with more consistency though no less ugliness than the human mind does when under excitement and destitute of control the captain grew terribly despondent and fred found ample use for all the good stories he knew some of these amused the captain greatly but after one of them he sighed poor old billy hawkus told me that the only time i ever heard it before and didn't we have a glorious time that night he'd just put all his money into the yenisi that blew up and took him with it only a year afterward and he gave us a new kind of punch he'd got the hang of when he went east for the boat's carpets twas made of two bottles of brandy one whiskey two rum one gin two sherry and four claret with guava jelly and lemon peel that had been soaking in curacao and honey for a month it looks kind of weak when you think about it but there were only six of us in the party and it went to the spot by the time we got through golly but didn't we make rome howl that night fred shuddered and experimented upon his friend with song he was rewarded by hearing the captain hum an occasional accompaniment 
but as fred got fairly into a merry irish song about one terry o'ran and uttered the lines in which the poet states that the hero took whisky punch every night for his lunch the captain put such a world of expression into a long-drawn sigh that fred began to feel depressed himself besides songs were not numerous in fred's repertoire and those in which there was no allusion to drinking could be counted on half his fingers then he borrowed the barkeeper's violin and played the airs which had been his favorites in the days of his courtship until crame exclaimed say fred we're not playing church give us something that don't bring all of a fellow's dead friends along with it fred reddened swung his bow viciously and dashed into natchez under the hill an old air which would have delighted offenbach but which will never appear in a collection of classical music ah now that's something like music exclaimed captain crame as fred paused suddenly to repair a broken string i never hear that but i think of wesley treepoke that used to run the quitman went afterward to the rising planet when the quitman's owners put her on a new line as an opposition boat wes and i used to work things so as to make louisville at the same time he going up and i going down and then turn about and we'd always had a glorious night of it with one or two other lively boys that we'd pick up and wes had a fireman that could fiddle off old natchez in a way that would just make a corpse dance until his teeth rattled and that fireman would always be called in just as we got to the place where you can't tell what sort of whiskey tis you're drinkin and i tell you twas so heavenly that a fellow could forgive the last boat that beat him on the river or stole a landing from him and such whiskey as wes kept used to go cruisin round the back country samplin little lots run out of private stills he'd always find nectar you'd better believe poor old boy the tremens took him off at last he hove his pilot overboard just before he died and put a bullet into pete langston his second clerk they were both trying to hold him you see but they never laid it up against him i wish i knew what became of the whiskey he had on hand when he walked off oh no i don't either what am i thinking about but i do though hanged if i don't fred grew pale he had heard of drunkards growing delirious upon ceasing to drink he had heard of men who in periods of aberration were impelled by the motive of the last act or recollection which strongly impressed them what if the captain should suddenly become delirious and try to throw him overboard or shoot him fred determined to get the captain at once upon the guards no into the cabin where there would be no sight of water to suggest anything dreadful and search his room for pistols but the captain objected to being moved into the cabin the boys said the captain alluding to the gamblers are mighty sharp in the eye and like as not they'd see through my little game and then where'd my reputation be speaking of the boys reminds me of harry ganning that cleaned out that rich kentucky planter at bluff one night and then swore off gambling for life and gave a good-bye supper aboard the boat twas just at the time when prince imperial champagne came out and the whole supper was made of that splendid stuff i guess i must have put away four bottles and if i'd known how much he'd ordered i could have carried away a couple more i've always been sorry i didn't fred wondered if there was any subject of conversation which would not suggest liquor to the captain he even brought himself to ask if crame had seen the new methodist church at barton since it had been finished oh yes said the captain i started to walk mosier home one night after we'd punished a couple of bottles of old crow whiskey at our house and he caved in all of a sudden and i laved him out on the steps of that very church till i could get a carriage those were my last two bottles of crow too it's too bad the way the good things of this life paddle off the captain raised himself in his berth sat on the edge thereof stood up stared out of the window and began to pace his room with his head down and his hands behind his back little by little he raised his head drooped his hands flung himself into a chair beat the devil's tattoo on the table sprang up excitedly and exclaimed i'm going back on all the good times i ever had you're only getting ready to try a new kind sam said fred 
well i'm going back on my friends not on all of them the dead ones would pat you on the back if they got a chance a world without whiskey looks infernally dismal to a fella that isn't half done living it looks first-rate to a fella that hasn't got any back down in him curse you i wish i made you back down when you first talked temperance to me go ahead then curse your wife don't be afraid you've been doing it ever since you married her crame flew at macdonald's throat the younger man grappled the captain and threw him into his bunk the captain struggled and glared like a tiger fred gasped between the special efforts dictated by self-preservation sam i promise to see you through and i'm going to do it if i have to break your neck the captain made one tremendous effort fred braced one foot against the table put a knee on the captain's breast held both the captain's wrists tightly looked full into the captain's eyes and breathed a small prayer for his own safety for a moment or two perhaps longer the captain strained violently and then relaxed all effort and cried fred you've whipped me nonsense whip yourself exclaimed fred if you're going to stop drinking the captain turned his face to the wall and said nothing but he seemed to be so persistently swallowing something that fred suspected a secreted bottle and moved an investigation so suddenly that the captain had not time in which to wipe his eyes hang it fred said he rather brokenly how can what's babyish in men whip a full-grown steamboat captain the same way that it whipped a full-grown woolen mill manager once i suppose old boy said macdonald is that so exclaimed the captain astonishment getting so sudden an advantage over shame that he turned over and looked his companion in the face why how are you fred i feel as if i was just being introduced didn't anybody else help yes said fred a woman but you got a wife too crane fell back on his pillow and sighed if i could only think about her fred but i can't whiskey's the only thing that comes into my mind can't think about her exclaimed fred why are you acquainted with her yet i wonder i'll never forget the evening you were married that was jolly wasn't it said crane i'll bet such sherry was never opened west of the alleghanies before or hang your sherry roared fred it's your wife that i remember you couldn't see her of course for you were standing alongside of her but the rest of us well i wished myself in your place that's all did you though said crame with a smile which seemed rather proud well i guess old major pike did too for he drank to her about twenty times that evening let's see she wore a white moire antique i think they called it and it cost twenty-one dollars a dozen and there was at least one broken bottle in every and i made up my mind she was throwing herself away and marrying a fellow that would be sure to care more for whiskey than he did for her interrupted fred ease off fred ease off now there wasn't any whiskey there i tried to get some of the old twin tulip brand for punch but but the devil happened to be asleep and you got a chance to behave yourself said fred crame looked appealingly fred he said tell me about her yourself i'll take it as a favor why she looked like a lot of lilies and roses said fred except that you couldn't tell where one left off and the other began as she came into the room i felt like getting down on my knees old bailey was telling me a vile story just then but the minute she came in he stopped as if he was shot he wouldn't drink a drop that evening said crane and i puzzled my wits over that for five years she looks so proud of you interrupted fred with some impatience did she asked crane well i guess i was a good-looking fellow in those days i know pike came up to me once with a glass in his hand and said that he ought to drink to me for i was the finest looking groom he'd ever seen he was so tight though that he couldn't hold his glass steady and though you know i never had a drop of stingy blood in me it did go to my heart to see him spill that gorgeous sherry she looked very proud of you fred repeated but i can't see why for i've never seen her do it since you will though hang you exclaimed the captain get out of here i can think about her now and i don't want anybody else around 
no rudeness meant you know fred fred macdonald retired quietly taking with him the keys of both doors and feeling more exhausted than he had been on any saturday night since the building of the mill End of story thirty six